Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie B, and I am your host for today's program. This is day two, session three. And Matt, that's looking good, brother. I I feel you. <laughs> so uh, this is going to be a presentation with Matt N from Standing for Truth Ministries. And uh, Matt will be doing a highly comprehensive presentation titled Genesis Genetics. I am pumped for this. I've had some sneak previews over the uh, last couple months into this presentation. And I can say you are all in for a treat today. We are going to be having some novel arguments, some novel testable predictions. And it is safe to say that evolution will be dismantled tonight. But not only will evolution be dismantled, the biblical creation model will be emphasized strongly. So not only do we uh, refute evolution here on Stand for Truth Ministries, Matt, as you know, we also uh, put forth the stronger, the superior model. And, uh, you know, we're starting off the day with, with Matt N., focusing on Genesis Genetics. Then we'll be back to session four with CJ Cox, and he will be uh, countering compromise. Uh, okay, man. Well, I'm pumped. The audience is pumped. So let's uh, let's kind of get right into it. Let's get right into the fun, Matt. I am going to give you the floor, brother, and have some fun, but not too much fun. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. Here we go. We're going to be talking on the genetic evidence of Genesis and evolution as well. I'm trying to enlarge this as much as possible. There we go. So before I jump into the technical stuff, let's talk about some things that I want to cover for Christians that are watching. Like what is going on with the young earth creation? Why does it have any relevance to this? And I'd like to ask them a question back in return. When we look at this genealogies going back, where do these people stop becoming real people that's what you need to ask yourself if this is a lineage and you trust that jesus is real and that abraham is real where do you give up on that where do you give up on noah do you give up on david do you give up on adam because really we can't do that right jesus said he died for the sins of adam so what's going on why do so many people today say oh it's not really a true story we don't have to take it um literal it could be allegorical well even historians that are against the Bible literally admit that Old Testament has always taught that it's been a literal version. The global flood worldwide, literal, six days of creation, literal. And then um, we have people arguing all the time that, well, it was just James Usher that really was the first one to ever do this. And nobody believed him, believed like him before that period. And that people today only use his arguments and it's more of a modern day thing but actually if we look into history we find that people have been doing that with uh the book of genesis for a really long time matter of fact it starts in 240 a.d that's not far after jesus himself that people were using the genealogical chronologies to determine the age of the earth and the age of humanity based on adam and if you go back to adam and there's six literal days well that takes us back to creation and a lot of people go well you know what about the jewish people well they also believed in young earth creation and they only changed their mind because of the theory of evolution recently. We can even look at their calendars to prove this. Guess what? Their calendars still reflect a young earth. This is the year that they believe that it is uh, one year behind. Actually, I need to update that. But nonetheless, the theologians came along and they said, well, I guess we're just going to have to accept what the modern day science is saying because we can't refute this. So we're going to obviously have to change scripture we're not going to have to like learn the science you know god forbid we're actually just going to change our beliefs around because that's what we have to do but there's a problem when you do that because in order to like you know say well uh well it's you know we can we can be creationists but we can believe in evolution we really can't do that because nothing makes sense it's still contradictory you have the big bang nothing about the book of genesis goes along with it. It doesn't match anywhere. So if it doesn't match, what did the church do? Well, you know, the Catholic church was the first one to actually come up with the Big Bang idea. So they just said, well, we'll just abandon the literal view and we'll just say it's all allegorical, the entire thing. Why not, right? I mean, 
why 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 not just accept evolution well here's why because if we look in the history we actually find that it comes from pagan ideas first these ideas aren't new really they're scientifically new ideas but they're pagan in origin and they go really far back matter of fact it wasn't that people thought the uh, earth was old all the time matter of fact it was only just a little while ago in the 1700s that somebody actually questioned it and said it's more than a few thousand years old and it was james hudson who brought in uniformitarianism but besides radiometric dating what was there to there was nothing that said that the age of the earth was old nothing so they have they have to have deep time you see they need it because it makes the impossible possible therefore they can just say well, you know you know, we can just say that the days were really, really old. Uh, we can invoke that there's some evolution. Just add time. And time becomes everything. It, it makes everything possible because you don't need evidence. You can just say, well, add enough time. That's that's what did it. And for the critics out there, we already know that they don't question anything. We've, we've already experienced that. Okay? So for the Christian, it comes down to not whether or not you have to be a young earth creationist to believe, to to you know, be saved. It's just the foundation of what scripture is actually saying. And is it really true? Is it, is God's word true? Is it, is it a literal thing that we can trust? And we're going to go over the evidence of that today. But before we do, we have to talk about what is science? What is falsifiable? What is making testable predictions? How did Darwin come up with this idea? Um, is it really scientific? So we're going to jump into those things right now. This brings us to the next part. And that is that scientific theories must make testable predictions. And what strengthens a theory is whether or not these testable predictions come true or not. If they do not, the theory is now falsified. The real battle is over the exact same evidence. We view it one way, they view it another. But why do they view it this way? Their interpretation is that everything goes back in time for millions of years. This is the debate. Which one is true? evolution or creation. You see, in Darwin's day, there were three camps of creationists. There were the young earth creationists, known as biblical literists, who are us and still exist today. There were the old earth creationists, or day-agers, gap theorists, intelligent design, and theistic evolutionists, as we call them today. Then there were the non-literalists, or allegorical or symbolic genesis interpretationists, very similar to how Catholics are today. Many of them were theistic naturalists, so in Darwin's day, the majority of people believed in the non-literal version of Genesis, where the flood of Noah never happened, and God created species as they were, where they were. This is what Darwin focused his attention on, by refuting and attacking the non-literal biblical view, such as the Catholics hold today. Which, of course, he ended up proving wrong, thus winning the war of mainstream biblical creation versus his new theory of evolution, which states that animals can adapt and change in new environments. People just didn't know. He only refuted a very strange version of the non-literal Genesis way of thinking. This idea all began long before him, but by Darwin's day, it was established and very popular. And this is where the story leads to him going to the Galapagos Islands which were colonized in the late 1800s. The tortoises once thrived in the archipelago, where there were originally 15 species on the islands. However, since the arrival of people and the introduction of numerous feral animals, four species have become extinct. Darwin wrote about the harvesting of the species of tortoise only found on one of the islands, which was exterminated within 15 years of his visit to the Galapagos in 1835. Darwin predicted that within the next few decades, each species would go extinct and be gone forever. Since evolution is so slow, there is no way it could save them. He believed this because he trusted that deep time evolution was true and that speciation was a slow process. Because of this, he believed that the different tortoises on different islands could not mate with one another, as they have been separated over just too much time. Darwin believed that the Galapagos Islands broke off from South America millions of years before and isolated the tortoises, each to their own island. What do we know today? Well, recent genetic research has shown us that the tortoises are related to one another and can still breed with one another. And what he thought was extinct was not extinct. And that the species he thought were completely extinct actually were still living on today 
and their genetics were mixed in with the other ancestry. Today, there are 13 tortoise species in the Galapagos, with more hybrids being discovered all the time. Darwin's predictions based on deep time evolution being true failed yet again. Darwin was right about the role of natural selection in producing varieties of tortoises, however, but he claimed that it disproved the mainstream biblical view of creation. As he personally believed in this non-literal theistic concept of Genesis, which held to a creation event known as fixity of species. Meaning he believed that God created the earth kind of how it is, and that since there was no global flood where animals got off the ark, diversified, and rapidly filled the earth, that never happened. And since many Christians in his generation also had abandoned the idea of a literal global flood, they were easily convinced and fell away from the faith. People like Darwin never considered the what if it was a literal story. A pair of related species got off the ark and adapted to new environments. That's literally what it says happened in scripture, and what creationists would have believed if they took Genesis as literal. To those who believed the Bible is real history, including all creatures having to repopulate the earth from one location, it would have been a completely consistent finding. The church's allegorical view of Genesis gave Darwin an easy straw man argument to knock down. So did Darwin really debunk a literal creation model of Genesis? Not even close. You can learn more about these sea tortoises on different islands from Creation Ministries International's stunning Darwinian documentary called The Voyage That Shook the World. We view things very differently than the evolutionist. We talk about rapid adaptation to environments. There's recombination, gene conversion, chromosome fusions, and epigenetic adaptation. These and possible mutations which can inhibit genes influence the tortoises and why they look different from island to island, but are yet all recently related to one another. And if deep time was true, the evolutionists would be right and they would not be able to mate with one another and their genetics would show massive amounts of genetic dissimilarity. And yet, what do we find within related species worldwide? Genetic similarity, the exact opposite of what was expected to be found, which led evolutionists to make another retrodiction that a global bottleneck must have happened in the past, completely contradictory to what they had said earlier. And here's an image of one of the oldest tortoise fossils on Earth, hardly any difference from those alive today. But a lot of people ask, Darwin was a pioneer. And yes, he was wrong on things, but he got the most important thing of all right, which is natural selection. And that's true, isn't it? Well, I have bad news for you on that front as well, because he plagiarized that from other people. That's right. Darwin plagiarized it mostly from Edward Blythe, which was a biblical creationist. And we know Darwin stole his ideas because they had communications with one another. And Darwin not only took use of his ideas and work, but even special words that had never been used before, that were invented by Blythe to describe things, now made it into Darwin's book. But he did not just plagiarize him. Oh no, he took the idea as well from other people and mixed it in. This study, which was done at Trent University, discovered that without Patrick Matthew, the origin of species would have never been written. For Darwin took his ideas and also retrofitted them in, expanding on Edward Blythe. Darwin was nothing but a plagiarizer. So his most famous voyage, and looking at tortoises, is great proof of biblical creation and a complete falsification of evolution. So yes, Darwin got his ideas of deep time from those before him. One of his biggest influencers, besides his grandfather Erasmus, was a trained lawyer by the name of Charles Lyell. He popularized uniformitarianism, the idea that all things have continued as they are now over time. Does that remind you of anything? It should. It's actually a biblical prophecy about the last days, which states almost exactly what people would believe in these days, stating, all things will continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So by Lyell's single phrase, the present is the key to the past, he just disqualified any catastrophic event in Earth's history, including a global flood. Because he argued that we can only interpret the past through the lens of what we see happening now, today. This is why the education system does not talk about catastrophism, and why it's also still frowned upon all these years later. This is precisely what Lyell did. With his one short phrase, the present is the key to the past, 
he automatically ruled out a historic global flood from the picture without ever mentioning it. He replaced history with his made-up version of it, adding eons of time to the past without any biblical history at all. And this is an excellent legal tactic, as you know he was a lawyer. But is this really scientific? Not at all. It's the opposite of science. It's actually pseudoscience made up of lies, then backed by an agenda and disguised as science. But I digress. His comment about the present is the key to the past is purely anti-science. It rules out any possible alternatives for the reason why things are the way they are, because you are not allowed to consider anything other than what we see happening today. That is literally the definition of a dogmatic cult thinking. It's literally putting blinders on scientists and telling them anyone who disagrees or thinks about anything else other than this that they are wrong, no matter what evidence is presented. This is the modern-day basis for the belief of deep time and slow, gradual geologic processes. He is the reason the masses believe in the fossil record and millions of years today. It's not because the science proved anything like it, and certainly not because it's true. Lyell stated in one of his letters in his journals that was found after he died that his goal was to free the sciences of Moses. That was his agenda. It was all based on a lie. And Charles Darwin, at age 22, fresh out of school, brought only a few books with him. One of them was Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology. And one of the things that Lyell said was that if he were to push this as far as it could go, that he could prove that men came from the orangutan. And right after that, what was pushed so heavily in 1924? That's right, there were three fundamental human types, the white, the yellow, and the black, all related to their own primate species. The Asian, the orangutan, the black, the gorilla, and the Caucasians related to the chimpanzee. Charles Lyell with his lies influencing the science yet again, all these years later. So before the 1800s, we have Hudson's book, The Theory of the Earth, published in 1795 that made people doubt the Earth was young. And then we have Lyell's book, The Principles of Geology, which made people doubt Noah's flood. And then we have Darwin's book, the Origin of Species, which attacked a straw man argument of the fixity of species that was believed by people that did not even believe the biblical creation story was true. And he made people doubt the Creator. These three people influenced all of science that we believe today. And Charles Darwin is related to the Rockefellers. And today, they fund the public school education system. And they are notorious for saying that they do not want a nation of thinkers. They want a nation of workers. And they know that the people will believe whatever the media tells them to believe. And evolution is pumped out to kids and adults on a constant rate. And they admit that even if all of the data pointed to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. So when you're not looking for something, you will never find it. And then they'll claim that there's no evidence for it. Let that sink in. Another problem that we have is atheistic evolutionists today have incentive for doing what they're doing. They also don't want to feel as though they've wasted their life. Not only have they gone through the entire school believing something, that would look really foolish of them to actually now admit that they were duped and fell for a lie, but then they actually paid to learn more of it in college. So that's money down the drain. So not only do they have time and money invested into this, but then they start teaching others. Then they have to admit to those others what they taught them was a foolish lie as well. That puts them in the sunk cost fallacy. It's the phenomenon whereby a person is reluctant to abandon their strategy or course of action because they have already invested heavily into it. Even when it's clear that they should abandon it because it would be more beneficial to them, they just cannot do it. All right. As you guys can tell, I had prepared that earlier because I didn't know how much time I would have. I didn't know if everything would work good. And I at least wanted to get some of my presentation going. So I will be sharing screen constantly, and I'm going to be putting up visuals. I might not completely talk about everything that's in the visual, but I just want everyone to at least have a screenshot of what I'm talking about in case they want to use it for themselves later. So these are the subjects that we're going to at least try to cover today. These are This is my intent anyway. And we're going to go down the list, and we're going to show why creation is so superior to evolution compared to predictions that were made versus predictions that were falsified. And 
this is a screenshot that's really good. And I'm also going to have to thank Brandon from our team who made these images with and for me. So this is going to be great. And uh, you guys can thank him as well for that. And the first one we're going to get into is genetic similarity. Now, a lot of people know that today evolution uses genetic similarity as their best evidence for evolution. But the reality is, is this is the exact opposite of what they predicted. You see, in 1963, Ernest Mayer, an evolutionist, said that if deep time is actually true, that genetic dissimilarity would be what we see. Um, because what will happen is over time, genetics will be too scrambled up and things will be so diverse that there will be no genetic relation when we look at things. And a young earth creationist in 1975 said the exact opposite, said, no, a common designer, a common creator would create everything that would have similar everything inside of them. And we should see those similarities. So because of that, when we look in the genome, we're going to expect to find genetic similarity, the exact opposite predictions. And so now we have, before any of the genetics was actually ever tested, we have testable predictions made by each side. Which one ended up being true? Well, it was inescapable and stunning, as they put it on evolution aside, that genetic similarity is actually extremely high. And this is not what they expected. This is why they had to invent a genetic global bottleneck with all of life, because to them, they were correct. Evolution, that is right. The mutation rate is so high that if deep time was true, it would have separated everything genetically by so much, nothing would be even remotely close to looking related. What did we find? We found exactly what Young Earth Creation predicted. And our model, as you guys know on this channel, if you're new here, you're going to learn that our model predicts that we share genetic similarity based on function. What do we know today? Well, guess what? Genes are now being predicted based on their function when we look at sequences. So when we read a sequence inside the DNA, we can go, oh, look, that's a telomere. Oh, look, there's another sequence. What one's that? Oh, that looks more like it's satellite DNA. Oh, look at this one. That one's unique. What does that go to? Oh, it's a different part of the genome altogether. It's an orphan gene. So we're being able to identify different sequences, different sentences, and those sentences tell us what functions they have inside the body. So now why do we share genetic similarity with, with something that a young earth creation would say we're not related to? Because when we look at these things, we see a high number, right? It's like, whoa, 98%. That's pretty odd. So what would happen if we looked at the uh, phylogenetic inheritance showing genetic relation? Okay, we got humans related. We get Neanderthals. And then all of a sudden, we jump down into chimpanzees and then gorillas and then a pig for some reason. And then an orangutan, right? It's like, what in the world? A pig before that one? That's interesting. So what's going on? Like, why, why do we have this? It's like, why would a pig be in there? And how come they have so much genetic similarity? Are we related to pigs more than we are the orangutan or the pongo? Because when we look at that, we see the, and that is true, the orangutan is about the same as the pig. So therefore, they try to strengthen this argument by going, well, mm, that's true. You know, we, we do share genetic similarity, but uh, we got to look at homology as well. So therefore, this is what they say. You know what? I never noticed this, but my pet bat has the same number of fingers as my pet alligator. Isn't that a quinky dink? One of the main arguments Darwin used for his theory was that of homology, these odd similarities between very different animals. Why would they be so similar unless they were related? So it makes sense, right? It's like, wow, they, we have a hands and then we look over at a chimpanzee, they got hands. It's like, uh, well, you know, then we look at a lizard, they have hands with frogs, have little hands, all five fingers. Oh, you must share a common ancestor, right? But, you know, we we started, look, the genetic evidence started conflicting with what the evolutionists were looking at when they started comparing the molecular analysis with the physiological evidence. Right? They noticed that there was a flaw when they looked at the orangutans. They go, why? It's like, why? They were noticing that the homology structure was different than the molecular data. And they got upset about this. They said, there is no theory holding that molecular similarity necessarily implies an evolutionary relationship. It's like, wait, what? That's all you guys are saying is the most is the best evidence for it. So they're here they're implying that homology is actually better. 
So the molecular data that contradicts the idea of genetic similarity denotes relation is often dismissed. So they're saying like, okay, well, homology seems to line up better, but we're going to get rid of that because genetic similarity is better evidence for us. And Nathaniel Jensen, as you know, who wrote Replacing Darwin said, we will be able to know better relation if we had judged this not on just molecular data, but functional data, right? So evolutionists came along and they were like, well, you know, what, how do we know what's related and what isn't? Okay, so we as young earth creationists, we use the mitochondrial DNA, the autosomal DNA, and the Y chromosome DNA. Why? Because they are traced in a linear pattern directly to what is related, right? And we can, we can follow this back in time to a single person. Evolutionists don't do that. Did you know that? When they build their phylogenetic charts, they don't look at the observable evidence. They infer it. They actually base it on something entirely different. And, and these are protein coding genes, which I'm going to get into. These aren't paternity tests, which show relation. They're entirely something else. So that's why I said we like to follow the direct line of evidence that can follow something. So when uh, Jensen, as you know, is saying that these functional differences are what we see, we can come along and say, now, why is there genetic similarity even in, in these protein coding genes? Well, because we view function as something different. If we line up cytochrome C, which is something that they like doing, which is a protein coding gene, and they go, look, we can now build a home, uh, the phylogenetic charts using this area of the genome, this protein coding gene. This is really good. So now they build their chart. Well, they can't actually compare it to other parts of the genome by comparing something like cytochrome C because it builds entirely different charts. So they have to narrow down and cherry pick and look at particular types of data sets and ignore everything else as where we can just take the data that comes from what we know to be true following the direct lineages and we know that there is no phylogenetic chart at all. And we base this on function. That's why we share some protein coding sequences with other things. Take um, why we would share more genetic um, protein coding genes with a chimpanzee like uh, rather than a frog. It's because of how we also uh, grow our hands, right? A human is, hand looks like a web. And as we mature in the womb, that web disappears between the, between the fingers. So this is a functional role of that protein coding gene determining how we are built. So it's a function based on the, not only what the structure looks like, but how that structure forms. It's a functional difference. As we're a frog, they grow their fingers out from the base, out from the root. So therefore, now we have reason on why these functional differences exist and why they make any type of pattern at all, and also why they refute one another and why they stick to that. And here's another short clip. I'll give you another example to break up with the monotony of just listening to me. If you look at different creatures' DNA, the rule of thumb is the more similar, the more closely related, and vice versa. Biologists expected to see a gradual branching path of DNA mutations from species to species, and they did find some success. Take, for instance, this little guy. He's a gene called cytochrome C. You can find a version of him in such places as your handsome or beautiful self, chimpanzees, dogs, moths, even yeast. He's one of the most commonly sequenced portions of DNA, so it's a great test case to see if the similarities hold up and point toward common ancestry. So, if we compare your cute little cytochrome C to this ugly, hairy chimpanzee cytochrome C, they look exactly alike. Weird. With dogs, there's about 90% similarity. Moths, about two thirds similar. And yeast, only about half similarity. Wow, just what we'd expect. These results must be really strong evidence of common ancestry. Whoa, no, who let you in here? Show, get out of here. Meet cytochrome B. He's a lot like C, except he likes to throw monkey wrenches into Darwin's expectations. He's just one example of many. If Darwinism is true, we should be able to construct a reasonably consistent family tree, pretty much no matter what genes we compare. But that's far from the case. In reality, using genes like cytochrome C as evidence for common ancestry is just a good example of molecular cherry picking. Depending on what genes are used, biologists will come up with wildly different ancestry and contradictory trees of life. Comparing different animals' cytochrome B genes, scientists found cats and whales cavorting in the primate club kicking poor little cute little tarsiers out into the cold, frogs and birds and fish carrying on together in their own strange little group, and even sea urchins masquerading as chordates. It's madness! <laughs> so, as you can see, they, they can only build 
their phylogenetic trees and their charts if they choose to only look at one particular region. They can't compare other things with it because it destroys the rest of the trees. They can't make any phylogenetic uh, tree of evolution because they all contradict one another. That's because it is not true. So when we look at, for example, superoxide dismutase, uh, another metabolic enzyme, and we compare it to another uh, protein inside the human body, another dissimilarity shows. They don't they don't uh, coalesce. They don't. They don't link together. That's why a lot of these college books, like Tree Thinking and Evolution 101, which are college books, don't even attempt to try to show any common ancestor to anything. They said our knowledge of molecular processes is not good enough to definitively rule out independent origins as a creationist. That's exactly what we would expect, right? But they admit that in their books because they know that they can't prove anything because every time they try to look at a particular region it shuts the other prediction down. It disassociates it. It's not true. That's why they can't build it. So what do we do? We take the observable data, the Y chromosome, the autosomal and the mtDNA, and we track this back directly in a line of what we know and what we can see. They infer it. They take a protein coding gene, they take one section out of it, and then they build a chart based on that as much as they can on their perception of what they believe the evolutionary tree should look like. Of course, there's even discrepancies looking at cytochrome C, but it's the best they can get. That's why they ignore the other data. So like I said, I'm gonna be putting pictures up. You guys can tap screenshots of whatever you like. I might not cover all of them, but I made them anyway. And I made a book to go along with this so anybody can later follow along or get the book just to pass out, things like that. So. A uh, quote from somebody says, genetics has no proof of evolution. It is trouble explaining it. The closer one looks at the evidence for evolution, the less one finds of any substance. In fact, the theory keeps on post, uh, postulating evidence and failing to find it. It moves on to other postulations like uh, missing links, natural selection, positive mutations. It's just not science, right? It's just a, it's just uh, throwing out. It's inference saying, oh, just look over here, right? But what do we know? We know that when it comes to predictions, that's what makes a theory strong and that's what falsifies another theory. This shows the strength that the best evidence for evolution is literally what we predicted and they, you turned it, they wheeled it, they changed it and made it evidence for them when it's not. So never let anybody ever tell you that the best evidence for evolution is genetic similarity because it's cherry picked nonsense, lies and the genetic evidence that does show any type of relation, like why do we have even uh, some type of resemblance to it at all, just shows that a common designer, because it's based on function. So it's, it is the reason that we would see something and it was not predicted at all by evolution. Why? Because a programmer doesn't start from scratch each time he develops a new program. Instead, he uses the same general command that he uses for other projects. It shows the creator's eff effective efficiency and integrity, right? So if we as creationists, we could have easily been falsified. We could have looked in the genome of animals and we could have seen multiple strange like uh, sequences. We could have found like an alphabet in English in one and then find a binary mathematical um, sequence in something else and then something else over here. And we would have been in big trouble because that would make it look more like there were if we wanted to still hold to intelligent design, we would have to say that, well, maybe there's multiple designers. Maybe there isn't one God. Maybe there's multiple designers that created life. See, we would be in big trouble. But the fact that we do see so much similarity and it all shows the exact pattern, um, it, it, it shows that there is only one designer in all life because he used the same program, the same code. Why would a programmer use a different source code for every piece of software rather than use the same framework and language for each application? It only makes sense. And look at God's creation. Look at um, the... Look at how the regulatory network for E. coli is compared to the Linux operating system. God's design is superior than everything we can even make today. And design is everywhere. I know there's people like Godless Engineer out there and other atheists that deny this, but literally the biologists, the, the atheist communities, uh, geneticists themselves admit that this is true. Here's an example of that. Is the genetic code really a code? It is a code, it's definitely a code. But nevertheless, there is no problem in saying that DNA would be a code in just the same kind of way as a computer code. It certainly is a code. Uh, you can read it as a code. You could you could even transcribe. I think I put this in River Art of Eden. You could even 
transcribe a book oh, into yeah. DNA letters, and you could read it out again. You could, you could preserve it in DNA. That's that's how code-like it is. It really is completely code-like code. A digital code is merely quaternary rather than binary. <laughs> We've shown that DNA is actually the software of life. It's totally interchangeable between the digital world and the biological world. The DNA code itself is so digital, is so almost exactly like uh, a computer tape. Scientists have come to the amazing conclusion that our bodies contain digital code. In fact, Bill Gates, you know, the founder of Microsoft, tweeted, DNA is more advanced than any software ever created. ever created. Think about it. A program or code is written by someone very smart. The more complex the code, the more intelligent the author has to be. So here's the question. If our DNA code is more complex than any man-made software, where did it come from? Is it possible it was authored without an author, without programmed without a program, programmed without a program? Materialists think so through neo-Darwinism, the modern version of Darwinian evolution. So yeah, when we look at the language of life that's that we see inside the human body, we see a language, a hierarchical pattern that describes a literal code, and it's everywhere. Um, you know, when we look at, they even use actually linguistic rules when they, when they, we talk about genes, we talk about transcription, there's editase when we edit a gene there. <laughs> I mean, it's everywhere around us. So, you know, the evolutionists, they have a lot of problems because they want to ignore this type of, a, of data and just say, oh, it's all by chance. Well, you can believe that all you want, but this is why scripture made it very clear and very simple that God gave us creation so that we would know that there, there is a creator so that no one is without excuse. So it's very, very simple. And when we go into the molecular data and we look at different forms of life and we're trying to build this hypothetical imaginary tree of life, there, there's inconsistencies because they're trying to use different forms of uh, evidence to build and construct their phylogenetic trees. And one of those things is homology. But when we look at molecular data, it would show that rhinos are actually closer to hedgehogs than they are to elephants, which are... Um, obviously much look much more similar. So they have to invent things like convergent evolution. And convergent evolution is when things cross pattern, then they, they gather the same type of physical appearance and look, even though they're not related, they came to the conclusion that they got this way through convergent evolution over time. That's why a shark and a dolphin would have the same fins, for example. So how did eyes evolve? Well, for them, these evolve because of um, convergent evolution, but they have to admit like, well, they're so different. They're so highly complex. They rise out of nowhere. Maybe there is an independent origin because when we look into the, uh, what they used to say, well, look at that. The cat, the eye must have evolved 50 to 100 different times. When has everybody, anybody at any time ever seen any experiment produce the formation of any eye, even, uh, at any point. I mean, it would have to evolve the gene, the Hox gene to begin with. It would have to now create mutations that aren't harmful at all because anytime you throw a mutation in the Hox gene, or I'm sorry, the Pax6 gene, which constructs eyes, it causes horrible problems, usually blindness. So how can random mutations that are more often than not harmful create eyes? Well, convergent evolution. Therefore, it only has to do it once and then pass it on, right? Um, how about bats and dolphins? Did you know that they say they're related? <laughs> that's right conversion evolution because they have similarities because they have lived similar lives what are they talking about how do bats and dolphins have similar lives they don't have any similar life at all they live in like literally the exact opposite conditions one lives only in the water the only other one lives only in land how in the world can they say that they have they share similarities because of their environment they don't share the same environment how about milk? Like they know that mammals like cats and dogs, they produce milk, right? But did you know there's also ants that produce milk? That doesn't make any sense, right? No big deal for the evolution, right? Just throw in con convergent evolution, right? It's no big deal. 
<laughs> makes no sense, right? It's just a rescue device. It, it's there to throw in uh, things that don't make any sense. How about the baculum bone that's in um, all primates? All primates. But they say, wait a minute, humans are apes too. Oh, yeah, well, we're missing that bone. Where is that in the fossil record? Just showing like, oh, man, we just lost this vital reproductive Org, uh, bone and then grew an entirely new organ where's the evidence for that There's, there is none none how about flight that's right flight evolved over seven different times in evolutionary history in literally every different field that there is like uh i'm, I'm sorry grouping of animal right we have mammals we have aquatic species like in fish we have uh birds bats we have insects flights everywhere but what do we actually see we see loss of flight we don't see anything's gaining the ability to fly. Look at how many times loss of flight has actually occurred. What's that about, right? We're seeing loss of flight all over the place. We don't see things learning to fly. We don't see like, wait a minute, this thing has a, a little tiny wing. And then we investigate and we go, oh yeah, it lost its ability to fly. We don't see anything going to flight. So it's just this imaginary scenario that they invent to help them through the fact that they don't have evidence because what we see is the exact opposite. That brings us into the next one. Creation would predict that we would only see one genetic line going back to single people of the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. But evolution predicted that there were multiple people every single time you go back to a bottleneck in history. There were at least, they say, 10,000 women and 10,000 men over 200,000 years ago. Right. But like what's going on? They say, ah, you know, these are the first pioneers of people. They didn't look much like us. They kind of did, but they were more primitive in features. We say, no, 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 no. We go back to Noah and the, with the Y chromosome, but you can trace everybody back to Adam and Eve. Right. That's one of the things that we should be able to do. You know, we are able to find a genetic sequence that we can trace back to single people, not groups of people. Because if you assume that there were 10,000 women or 10,000 men, then we should see multiple lines of that evidence inside of the of people today, but we just don't see it. We don't see the scenario of a bottleneck 200,000 years ago, or even the other one of 74,000 years ago in the genetics. We don't, that's not there. What we do see is the biblical ancestry where we find people going back very recently in time to a Tower of Babel event where there was dispersion and massive population growth. And genetic similarity between all humans is really, really, really low. And that can't really be based on how fast the mutation rate is and based on how everybody is related to one another, you know, uh, but what is the, if you type in, you go, look at this, there is only one descendant uh, that we all came from in both male and female. That wasn't what they expected, but it's exactly what the biblical model would have said. And they admit that we can safely say that the scientific, with fair scientific certainty, that every man alive today descended from one man and every human alive today descended from one woman. And it is exactly what our model predicted. And that is not an evolutionary idea that would have ever been predicted, especially with in regards to, as a matter of fact, that's why they mocked the idea of biblical creation to begin with because they uh when they when they named mitochondrial adam and mitochondrial eve it was kind of a a laughing at the creation is saying ha ha you guys thought that everyone came from adam and eve six thousand years ago or so and now look now now there's populations of people that lived ten thousand years ago and uh and they lived two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand years ago right so they kind of mocked everybody by saying that and now it turned around to be a slap in their face which brings us to one of our first predictions which is the haplotype block predictions versus the evolutionary haploblock type right uh dr nathaniel jensen would say that you know we came along and we would say that the first haplo uh type people uh adam and eve would have had uh, blocks the size of the entire chromosomes right evolution would have never said that so what do we see when we look inside of people today? Those balloons are going to represent haplogroups, okay? Now we see different haplogroups, but a lot of people don't know why or when or how they got there or how they formed. So what we're going to do is we're going to look over at Adam's perfect genome, which was mutation free. And the very next um, generation that came, uh, came over with one mutation, got handed down, right? And then over time, another mutation, another mutation, and another mutation occurred. So when this happens to a population, if we don't see very many mutations between people 
they, they go back in ancestry not very far. But if we see more mutations in people, we can trace them further back in time. That means when we look at the populations of the world today, we can actually see that we can trace lineages back all the way to a single group of people. So that's how we determine what a haplogroup is. We look for markers and we go, oh, this group of people have one type of mutation that other groups don't have. So we can name them or letter them, whatever you want to call it. And now we have haplogroups and those haplogroups form. And now we can say, interesting. So if we assume then that Adam and Eve had complete haplogroups, that entire size, how fast would the recombination rate be to break down these blocks into smaller and smaller ones? That was one of the test uh, group uh, predictions that was done by Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, who said, let's test this theory. Let's break this down and look at gene conversion rates and recombination rates and not make any assumptions about the past except for uh, a hypothesis that they were entire blocks that got broken down. How far in the past could we go? So his prediction showed us that we could easily explain the haplo-block groups that we have today could have formed in the biblical timeline, and they don't line up with evolution whatsoever. So then, how is that possible? Well, gene conversion uh, breaks up linkage blocks, and we know that when we're looking at populations and groups of people, this is a genetic drift um, indicator right here showing a population size and how many generations look at this if you have a smaller group of generation of people fixation is reached really really fast some are lost and others reach fixation quickly and what would we say happened well after the flood there wasn't a very many group of people right there was not many and they were in small groups and they migrated together and they stayed in smaller populations and they grew in a population together and then all of a sudden they went to the Tower of Babel where God confused the languages. Then they dispersed and broke up into smaller groups of people. And then once they were in these smaller groups, it started again. Gene conversion, recombination rate, breaking up all these blocks into different groups of people. And when we look at the human history, we go, wow, something happened around 5,000 years ago where our human diversity rapidly exploded. And this is looking at exomes, by the way. And then uh, Jensen ran it on uh, uh, single nucleotide variances and got the same results yet again. And they admit that mutations are relatively new. They only go back about 200 to 400 generations. And then something happened, creating massive amounts of harmful mutations. Well, that's the biblical timeline. That's literally what we say happened. You know, mutations are arising in people. And we can literally go, well, if they're new mutations, we can trace them backwards in time. We get to a, a person that has less mutations. That can only be a good thing for them. Evolution says, ah, it's okay. No, they, they, they don't make much of a difference. You know, it's just mutations. <laughs> so we'll get into that soon. But we're saying that this Tower of Babel, which has actually been found in historical things, this is what a carving and engraving showing that our ancestors actually believed in it as well. And they actually, it's uh, uh, one of the rocks we found. We see that if we go, if we trust the story and we go, where did this happen? Was this the Middle East? Or was this in Africa? Because if people lived in Africa for uh, hundreds of thousands of years, you would expect that massive people would also be migrating around in Africa and diversifying in smaller groups, getting mutations, and haplogroups would be forming left and right. But what do we see? We see the most haplogroups actually forming and exploding out of the Middle East, exactly where we would expect it to be, not in Africa. So think about that for a second. So we would say the exact opposite it happened we say that this happened that all of these haplogroups started forming and grouping and people began migrating around the world and getting isolated in different regions but not this one see you're looking at uh, shim and japheth's line right they branched off and they didn't have a border ham did and let me explain it to you like this the tower of babel is where all of the people work together at once. The languages got confused and each son got um, handed down a gener um, uh, inherited land. Ham's line got Africa. So they went into Africa from the Tower of Babel and something unique happened. The Sahara Desert started to form and it grew rapidly. And so as it grew rapidly, it pushed Ham's generations or Ham's genealogies deeper into Africa and they became isolated and trapped. What would this do to genetic inheritance? Well, it now makes them so they can't mix with other people. So now they have smaller groups of people living in Africa. And these smaller groups of people are now stuck there with less genetic diversity than they would have had. 
And now all of a sudden, these groups of people have smaller population tribes. They're mutating faster because they have, they're living in the tropical regions. They're living in smaller populations. They have faster rates of recombination. And all of a sudden, they're generating mutations at a faster rate. So it makes them look different than the other groups that are now able to intermingle with one another and diversify and go across the entire world and populate everything. That couldn't happen for Ham's line. They were stuck. They were trapped. And when we look back in history, what do we notice? Evolution tells us, well, if you go back into the past, you know, humans came out of that bottleneck 200 to 300,000 years ago. It's like, okay, well, that would mean that humans lived for 100, let's give them the benefit of the doubt here and just say it was 200,000 years ago. That means they lived for 195,000 years worldwide after, you know, because out of Africa happened after this, you know, um, everywhere they lived and they waited 195,000 years before they all started doing exactly the same thing everywhere. Human history starts being recorded about 5,000 years ago. All of history. What do we see? Civilizations rise 5,000 years ago. Writing systems between every group 5,000 years ago. How about mathematics? They say, oh, around the same time. Mathematics, you know, we can trace it right back to one group of people. Boom. How about uh, magnetic decay? Oh, same thing. Not very young. How about uh, the oldest trees on earth? Trees don't die. We have trees that are just, they, they think they're organisms that, that never perish. But yet the oldest trees in the world go right back to the flood. How come there isn't one 10,000 years old? That would easily refute us. The only time they can ever get those dates is because they they might use something other than dendrochronology where they're testing the, uh, the, the actual rings of the tree. They have to infer it based on something else because the obvious answer is, it's not old. We have helium diffusion rates. Goes right back to the same, same timeline. How about the oldest desert in the world? The Sahara, what we just talked about. Well, guess what? That formed very, very quickly. They didn't expect that. And it formed fast, not very long ago. Oh, it, it went from green to a desert in a flash, exactly like we would assume it did. It went from lush to, to desert. How about genealogies? We can trace genealogies, and some of them um, are ancient. This is one in the British Museum. It, it, this one traces British kings that have an unbroken line of chain of evidence going all the way back to Noah himself. You know, then we look at flood, flood legends around the world. Uh, that's like that's amazing how much they even still have in common. Has anybody ever played the game of telephone when they were in school? That original story hardly makes it around the classroom without being totally distorted. So by the mere fact that they have flood traditions that even hold any resemblance at all is still amazing after this amount of time. But here comes another logical question then. If all people started out in the same place at this end and knew the same type of a thing, uh, the same type of thing. They had the same building construction. Would that mean that they would take this knowledge with them? Because obviously they wouldn't take the same language. They lost that language. They, they, but one thing they wouldn't lose is the ability to how to construct something. And when we go to different places in the world, on the entire opposite continents even, we find that there are pyramids. There are construction zones that are all based on one particular thing, mathematics. And that mathematics is always the same, meaning it matches. And I'll show you exactly what I mean in this short clip that I got for you. The diameter of the drop of water on a waterproof surface, like granite or alabaster, is constant. It measures one centimeter. They named this small unit the royal finger. Ten drops of water or ten royal fingers equals one royal hand. 100 drops of water, so 100 royal fingers or 10 royal hands, equals one royal leg. Centuries later, these discoveries were taken out of secret coffers and renamed. The royal finger was called the centimeter, the royal hand the decimeter, and the royal leg the meter. They were presented as recent discoveries, and the French appropriated them made in France. The diameter of the drop of fresh water measures what is now called one centimeter. Water is a universal constant. The size of the drop of fresh water will never change for thousands and millions of years. Yes, the universal unit, the meter, was not invented in 1780. So quite interesting, right? How we in the world could we have... Um, a mathematical situation where all people around the world know the exact same type of measurement. 
Well, it's because you can trace them back to a single group, a single group of people that were building and constructing the same tower. It's why they knew what to build and what worked and how to measure something. They might have lost the language, but they never lost the math. Or what makes more sense, the Egyptians decided to travel around the entire world themselves, creating the exact same structures everywhere. I mean, that makes no logical sense. But when we look at the construction of all pyramids that we've ever measured, they all use the meter. Now, what is the logical probability of that happening? I wouldn't want to defend that argument if I were you. So anytime there's a discrepancy and we find modern man outside of Africa, they just go, "Uh oh, we just need to chalk it up to a primitive man. Right. They found um, handprints that were discovered in Tibet. And, oh, that's not in Africa. They're 300,000 years old, according to geology. Right. Um, that, that that breaks up the uh, the tree of life. Right. Wait a minute. Man's supposed to be evolving in Africa and they're stuck there. They can't even get out for another 150,000 years. So what's a, an identical human handprints and artwork doing somewhere else? Well, they just blame primitive primitive man. They just say, well, it's some other species that was literally identical. <laughs> So humans evolved twice then is what they're saying in totally different regions. So good times there. Then we have human population growth. This one doesn't look good for them at all because when we're looking at the human population growth, that that literally lines up with the biblical model of ancestry. You can't have groups of people living even based on the decay curve of how many people have kids every generation, when we look at population growth arguments, that they line up with young earth creation numbers every time down the line. That doesn't make any sense if if they're telling us that human beings have existed for even hundreds of thousands of years. You have to account for them not being able to produce what we can today. If you say, well, you know, they were uh, they were just in Africa. They did. They, they, they didn't migrate out. They were just trapped in this one region. Wait, wait a minute. You just said that they were in other regions of the world. You said they were, they were Neanderthals doing this. They were Den Denisovans doing this. There were other populations of humans growing. Why couldn't they do it? It's like none of the story makes any sense. It's like they all just waited to the last 5,000 years before they all decided, yeah, we're going to grow. We're just now we're going to populate the entire world and we're going to explode in population growth. That doesn't make any sense. So the testable predictions come from what we know and uh, what we can see. And we can go interesting. Let's test. Let's make predictions now based on what we observe. Let's uh, based on mutation rates, based on population growth rates. And let's take these back. And when you do that with evolution, you get the problem of Occam's razor where you know, the simplest explanation is usually the right one. Well, when we use young earth creation, all of the evidence is simple. It all lines up. They have to invent these ridiculous rescue devices. And that's why we have no problem. We have no problem saying that um, these haplogroups formed exactly where we think they formed. They formed rapidly all at once. Dispersion happened. We have evidence that we can only trace back to a single person in the recent history, not deep time. And there were, uh, there is no um, march of progress. Here's a video I made specifically on that one. If you like the subject and you want to uh, learn even more, then I recommend getting a book on that one. It's called Why Human Evolution is False. And uh, we will move on to the next one right now, which is the Y chromosome. Now, this one is unique because this one really um, destroys all of them because uh, mutations build up in the Y chromosome and we can literally say, well, if deep time evolution is true, we should be able to trace these backwards to a common ancestor split, right? Where the Y chromosome would be saturated in mutations because mutations happen there so quickly. But if young earth creation is true, we'd be able to trace backwards in time to a recent common ancestor of Noah with only few mutations and not even close to mutational saturation. So what happens is when we look in there, we go, hmm, we can build a phylogenetic chart on the ancestry and we see the Y chromosome mutation rates higher again in Africans. So therefore the evolution goes, hmm, that must mean that Africans are the oldest again because they have the most mutations. Well, that comes down to predictive power yet again, because that takes an assumption. And that assumption is that mutations are always the same between every single people group on, in the world. And that also assumes that mutations are slow and always constant between all people groups and that Africans always existed first and that only people came later after them. But that is where it gets destroyed again by Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. And he wrote this information in a book that you can find called Traced. And in this book, it's that's highly technical, I'm going to break down for you. We see that in it, he breaks down four different study groups. 
And when we look at the two blue ones on the left, we see that these are pedigree studies. The, and these pedigree studies only looked at a very small section of the Y chromosome. And they didn't look at the entire thing because sequencing the entire thing is very hard. And the reason why is because it's about 58,000 to 600,000 base pairs with 200 genes. So it's very, very complicated. And what happened is when they were looking at the two on the left, by just looking at a small section, they only found a few mutations. And they said, oh, good. Just a few mutations is really good for us because the mutation rate's very slow if you just count those mutations up. And therefore, we can get very old dates. And therefore, they plastered everywhere that humans must go back hundreds of thousands of years because the mutation rate is slow there. But then... Somebody decided to sequence the entire thing. And this is really good because once they sequenced the entire Y chromosome, the exact opposite evidence came in with a mutation rate more than double of what they had expected it to be because they didn't expect other mutations to be in the other regions of the Y chromosome. And the reason they didn't expect it to be there is because in mitochondria and in other parts of the genome, the mutations occur in what are called hot spots. And so they gather there, for example, in the D loop of the mitochondria. So therefore, when they found mutations in the Y chromosome in one little region, they said, oh, they must not be occurring in another region. So it makes kind of logical sense, but it wasn't for sure. Nobody had ever tested the entire thing. So then what happened is Dr. Jensen ran that and said, oh, look at that. There is tons of mutations in that, in that region. And when the study discovered this, they went, uh-oh. So they actually hid this information in the supplemental area and didn't let the public know. And they said that this information prompted us to explore additional filters, meaning they went, oh, that contradicts what we need to be true. That's way too fast for deep time evolution. We're just going to say that we have to look at other filters now that give us a slower rate. We're going to ignore that area. And then another study in 2017 came out, making the mutation rate even faster. And so what happened is uh, Moretti came across and said, we're going to do pedigree studies on 17 father pair sons. We're going to uh, look at the entire thing and we're going to break down the entire raw data and see how many mutations are there. And lo and behold, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen predicting that the Y chromosome should go back just a few thousand years was absolutely spot on. And we got another prediction made by creation that was true, that the mutation rate was going to be fast, and it pointed to a recent common ancestor of Noah going into the past. And then we jump back into his book, which is the Rosetta Stone of Human History, and it shows us the true answer to this Y chromosome data, where he decided, I wonder how many total mutations are in people's Y chromosome alive today. And he did just that. And he said that there are about 440 mutations. Well... If there's three mutations per person per generation, how many generations back does that go? It's only about 150. That's not far. So if you use a generation time of just 30 years, that takes us back about 4,380 years. Exactly what we would predict if, uh, if the global flood was true based on mutation rate accumulation through the Y chromosome. And see, the mitochondria is very hard to test. The reason why it's hard to test for mutations is because every generation doesn't even get one mutation. It gets like less than half of one. So it's very hard to actually count. Uh, but this is very easy to count because we, it, it's more than one. So you literally, we don't have to guess. We don't have to go, oh man, this person got less than one, less than half of one. This person got half of one. This one's just much, much better, much more clear. The data is easily read, but it gets better. Now, what would happen if we went back to Noah and we started counting from Noah? Because we have a prediction made right in scripture, right? We said it writes that in the generation of Peleg, the people dispersed and went across the world. Well, that can be tested now. So what happened is Dr. Jensen said, what is the common ancestor mutation of the person that was the common ancestor of all of the haplogroups that formed rapidly? Well, guess what? If you count from Noah and you go to Shem and then um, uh, Abram or Elam, and then you go to Canaan, uh, Salah, Eber, Joktan, which is the sixth generation over, you get to Peleg's generation, Joktan and Peleg. And then we have the the uh, uh the history of the world in written in scripture right here that's exactly what happens when you get to that generation when we read all the haplogroups form so what are the odds of that we literally have the evidence like what dr jensen said that 
is the Rosetta Stone of human history because we don't have to just prove that we can go all the way back to Noah. He's gone a step further and shown that we can actually count from Noah forward and also get predictions correct on that as well. So that makes creation another awesome, powerful tool to prove the biblical model of ancestry that shows we're much more recent and that there is not, again, another line of lots of male ancestors going into the past hidden somewhere in our genetics and DNA. That doesn't show up anywhere. Right. And when you compare the Y chromosome to, let's say, a chimpanzee, it's horrendously different. It doesn't match at all. Matter of fact, it's so different that it actually matches more of a gorilla than it actually does a human, a human being. <laughs> so it's the exact opposite of what they would expect when you're trying to use it in evolution, let alone human ancestry. It doesn't even work with evolutionary history because we see that the study of the Y chromosome that developed unusual structures that make them very unique to humans. So if you wanted to learn more on that one, there is a local global flood video that exists specifically on that. Also a book as well, but the videos are a little more entertaining sometimes. And then that brings us to the next one, which is females. Now, this takes us into the mitochondria, which gives us the same thing. What did evolution predict? Well, they predicted very few mutations, right? And so um, creation, we predicted a lot of them. So evolution came along and they didn't have any observable data yet. So what did they do? They said, well, we assume that a split happens six to seven million years ago. So we're going to calculate that in. And then we're going to use and build this molecular data and calibrate it to the fossil record. We're not going to use observable data because we just don't really have any yet. We're just going to assume evolution is true first and then go from there. So they started building their phylogenetic charts around this and started getting random dates. And the dates go all the way from 1991. That was the earliest I could find all the way up until current times. The ranges go from 72,000 to over 300,000 years. But they predicted that we would find, based on this, to turn, you know, a common ancestor, one substitution every 300 to 600 generations. But what we did find is the exact opposite. We found one mutation substitution, not mutation, one substitution occurring every 33 generations. Now, substitution is a mutation that takes course, uh, takes its place in a population, which means it's more accurate than just judging by a regular mutation rate. But Regardless, it was 20 times higher than was expected for evolution to be true and only takes us back to around 6,000 to 12,000 years. The exact opposite of what evolution needed to be true and not even close to what they could even push back by using the slowest studies that they've ever found. Instead, they got what they needed to change later, which was the observable rate that takes us back to a mitochondrial eve around 6,500 years ago. And that's because there's two different clocks. There's the phylogenetic rate, which I told you they invented, and the one that we actually see and observe and what actually we can make predictions on as opposed to what we can't make predictions on because it's based on a lie. So therefore, do they, do they still do this today? Well, here's an eons evolutionary video of them admitting, yes, they do do that very thing. By using the molecular clock method. This method combines what we know, or at least what we think, about how often genetic mutations occur, and then applies that to DNA samples to plot the evolutionary history of various species. But to be accurate, this molecular clock needs to be calibrated. It needs to be calibrated. The molecular clock, the clock needs to be calibrated. <laughs> the clock needs to be calibrated. This molecular clock needs to be calibrated. The latest molecular clock calibrations. So yes, they don't even feel embarrassed about saying that it needs to be calibrated. They just say, yeah, we calibrate the clock. It's no big deal. What do you mean it's no big deal? You're assuming evolution is true. The clocks that are observable will say it's not true. So you calibrate the clocks to say that it is true. Get out of here. That is ridiculous. That is so nonsensical. It is, re it is foolish. And they know that the observable one is trustable because guess what? They use, the FBI uses the rate. They use it to convict murderers. You can't say that the clock's not true when there's people being convicted of crimes today because of it. So <laughs> it has to be true or else they're going to be letting a lot of people out of prison. So uh, we know it's true because you're they're literally getting a mutation somewhere in the germline and then it's passed on to the next generation. So let's say that I decide to go kill my neighbor and then um, I stab him in the neck and he dies and they come over and they rest me and I go, I didn't do it. My dad did. 
That's why, and then they go and they go, oh, the DNA evidence is, is showing that, yeah, one of them did it. We just don't know which one. They have similar uh, DNA. So what they do is they look in the blood and they go, uh oh, there's a mutation in that that the dad doesn't have. It could not have been his dad. It had to have been him that killed him. So that's how important it is to know that mutation rates are important and they are used by um, in science and they are used by the FBI. That's because they matter. So when people say, oh, who cares about these? Nobody cares. Nobody uses them. Yes, they do. They have to be used. And the, yes, they are accurate. They're not using the evolutionary one. Why? Because it's not true. That's why. What we do know is what we see. And look at all the studies that go back in time and show us. Look at this range. It goes from 4,178 years ago to 10,000 years ago. That's what the observable data shows. And here's all the studies that show that the observable rate can explain the genetic diversity of people in a young Earth creation timeline using the mitochondria. The evidence is in and people and then then we get critics that are like, oh, well, Dr. Jensen, when he used his, he didn't use the co coalescence calculations. Oh, look at that. He did. Oh, it looks like somebody didn't do the research, did they? What a shocker. So when we're making predictions like Dr. Nathaniel Jensen did, he said, hmm, I wonder what the mutation rate would be. And the differences that we would see inside of the mitochondria when we look at differences based on the mutation rate and how many mutation differences we should find. If evolution's true, they would find 681 or even more. Again, he does them favors by lowballing all the numbers. And what we actually found lines up yet again. So the question is, which one of these is correct? I'm going to go with the observable one. How about that? How about what actual science does? You know, the repeatable, testable, scientific version of science, not some made up woo woo cycle psychopath, uh, you know, pseudoscience version. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But let's see, how far back do people actually go? Huh? Can you trace your grandparents back to actual human beings? Are, are you tracing them back to animals? Are you tracing them back to anything other than human? I think the answer is pretty obvious. And yes, pedigree rate studies have been done on animals. The same results occur. Pedigree rates much faster than phylogenetic assumption rates. We look at um, not a lot of things obviously have been tested um, because they don't like the results. So they just stick to their made up phylogenetic version. But every single time the results come back with creation, they don't they don't show evolution any way, shape, or form, no matter what they do. Yeah, they have rescue devices like, well, maybe mutation rates were faster in the past. And, oh, maybe uh, selection was stronger or maybe this, maybe that, maybe that. Yep, again, more, more rescue devices. Nothing in science can, can confirm or uh, what they're saying. None of it. So it's actually evolution versus science, not creation versus evolution. There's a big difference. So always remember that. Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. That's right. Without evolution, atheists have no grounding to stand on. That's why they need it to be true. They have an obligation for it to be true. They have to have it. So we don't care. Like I said, there is no reason that young earth creation has to be true for salvation purposes. There's plenty of Christians that don't believe in young earth creation, and it doesn't even matter for salvation. So why in the world would we believe it? How about because the evidence always points to it? So how about molecular clocks? Do they actually tick at different rates? Evolution says no. We say absolutely. Not only do they tick at different rates, they actually tick at different rates within the same species, even within different human beings. That's why when we look at charts like this, which is the Y chromosome and the mitochondria, they have different stars like this that, that shoot out and the, uh, different people groups have different mutations because they mutate at different rates. That's why these charts exist. So that's what comes to another prediction. Nathaniel Jensen said, I predict that most African groups will be found to mutate in their muta uh, DNA almost, almost two times faster than reported with, the, what, with what we see in other people groups today. So um, that's why we can trace them back to Noah's three daughter-in-laws, but there's different webs that shoot out from them that look like different periods of time. So is there any evidence? Because, you know, a lot of people go, well, you know, it's hypothetical because we always say, you know, like, well, recombination rates, you know, they're higher in Africans. So that's probably why we got evidence from that one. Here's a couple studies that show that there's different hot spots and that African populations have more recombination hot spots, And that given that recombination rates vary between species and even individuals, it is, uh, it is a 
it is possible that hotspots could also differ among ethnically different populations, including Africans. Indeed, the identification of haplogroups and genes associated with recombination rates could occur at different frequencies in HapMat populations, which raises the possibility that populations specific genetic variants may in, uh, influence recombination rates. So yeah, we got evidence from there. We also have evidence that there's overall point mutations are faster in Africans. So then we obviously have the fixation rate would be higher because of smaller populations. And then we, we don't just have that evidence. We literally have evidence in pedigree studies that show, guess what? people do mutate at different rates. This was goes all the way back to two different studies back in Parsons in 1997 and 1998, who actually showed that the Amish people mutate at a slower rate than the rest of other people. And he took a bunch of different Amish families from um, around America and tested them and found that they mutate 14% slower than other people that were tested in the same study. So you go, hmm, if they can mutate slower, then obviously Jensen is making a prediction that they could mutate faster. And then, but that's not it. This study was also, another study was also done looking at a particular family in a region that was, uh, that showed a bunch of different families of the same descent in one isolated region, and they mutated 7% slower than the other Europeans that were around them. So yes, if even different people groups can mutate at different rates. And this is one of the reasons that they have different phylogenetic charts, because think about it. If you throw a bunch of cats together and we say all cats go back to a single common ancestor, then how can these cats all have different phylogenetic trees? How come some look older than other ones? We answer that easily through generation times because some have high generation times, others have low generation times. So it builds a different phylogenetic chart because they believe that everything mutates at the same rate. There's a study that uh, Donnie and I did uh, on that particular subject, and you guys can find it by taping in the invalidation of the molecular clock neutral theory. But we have traced animals all the way back. Wolves go back to a single common ancestor. So we know that they're all related. We can do the same thing with humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutan. Guess what? They're, they would be constructed a phylogenetic chart like this. But we know this chart isn't true because there's no way it actually could be true because we all came out of a bottleneck. And if a bottleneck is true, which we know it is, and they admit now today that it is true, then there is no possible way that they could ever build this chart based on what we know in the mitochondria or the Y chromosome because a bottleneck resets genetic diversity. So they can never actually prove genetic relation. So why does one look older than the next? Again, it comes down to the orangutan or the pongo only having a generation time of 11 years. So a gorilla and a chimp is going to look twice as young as they are because they have had half the generation time living and then a human, an extra 10 years on top of it. So humans going to look the youngest in any phylogenetic chart because they have the highest amount of generation time, which means there hasn't been that many generations alive to pass on that many mutations. So therefore, we would have the least amount of mutations. So therefore, it's always going to be constructed different on each different person, on different groups of people. And it's all dependent on situation, not time. It's like how, where did they live? Was there, were they hyper mutating? Were they, were they isolated in smaller groups? Were they expanding in groups? Did they live in cold regions? Did they live in warm regions? And knowing this makes it really important because when we're looking at, let's say, flightless birds, these are all Southern hemisphere birds, which means they all live down South. So when they got off the ark, none of them went North. We would expect that in our model because it's freezing, cold. Everything that is, that's is going to do really good and try to survive is going to go south in Australia, in Africa, where they could try to stay warm. Humans didn't do it because they were inherited lands that they couldn't go to, right? Ham inherited the south, so other people weren't allowed to go in Africa. So they, they went into other regions, but animals didn't know any better. They just went where they could survive. So in this, uh, we get um, a phylogenetic chart that's built off of the assumption of evolution being true, then flightless birds would match the nearest landmass to them because they would have walked from the landmass onto an island and then been isolated. So that's their assumption based on evolution being true. We would say that no, animals lose the ability to flight. There's also land bridges. So these two examples are going to build, refute the phylogenetic chart. Guess what? In fact, that is exactly what happened. They built the phylogenetic chart based on common ancestry being true and that the local land mass animal is going to be the one that's the closest on the island. And look at that. It was a real surprise that the elephant bird was more closely related to kiwis. It was a completely unexpected. They're com they're, no matter which animal you look at on that chart, 
it is completely contradictory to the chart that they made. None of those birds actually match that phylogenetic chart of ancestry. Matter of fact, the exact opposite is true. You look at what they related and you put at the end of the tips of those branches and the exact opposite is true. And that brings us to our next prediction, which is a novel prediction uh, by us here at Teen Standing for Truth. Donnie and I were looking here at the phenotypic diversity of people in the world. Now, remember, uh, we would say that there was a equal distance between all people because all people are the same age, meaning all people group formed from that group of people that dispersed from the Tower of Babel not very long ago. Evolution would predict, no, people, Africans were alive in Africa, stuck there for hundreds of uh, thousands of years or 150,000 years at least. And then they later, Europeans came and then Asians branched off. So that would make a hierarchy with um, Europeans and Asians being more similar and more distant to Africans with a hierarchical pattern of Africans looking far more similar than either of them. So phenotypic diversity, our phenotypes are the observable measurements and characteristics. You can measure the, the, the face and, and uh, any characteristic that we want and then compare them to something. So that's what a phenotype is, just so you guys know, because we're about to get into this pretty deep right now. So we would say that Ham, Shim, and Japheth uh, broke off from each other, and they started diversifying in phenotypic diversity at equal times. So if we were to look at something phenotypically, we would see uh, um, no hierarchical patterns. We would see a genetic similarity in phenotypic diversity, about the same. Evolution wouldn't do that, right? Evolutionary model would predict that humans arose out of Africa and they have a problem with this, right? Because they assume that because Africans have the highest amount of genetic diversity, they're the oldest. Therefore, they would have the highest amount of phenotypic diversity to match this genetic diversity. However, this isn't the case. So they wrote, it is the key challenge of human genetics to figure out this paradox. So when we looked and we compared the different people groups and we split them down the middle and we start comparing, we find equal phenotypic diversity between everyone. Now, that's very unique and very unexpected for the evolutionary thing. That's why it's a it's a it's a uh, paradox. It's a confusing thing that they're having to go. What can we do about this? There are differences between every what they would like to call race of people. All right. There's but this is where the fixation index comes in. You can take the most diverse group of people and they have the phenotypic uh, diversity that's exactly the same in wild animals today. And they also are very similar looking. So that brings us to like, wait a minute, if these animals lived over great vast amounts of time, how come they are so close to phenotypic diversity? What's going on there? And we're going to get into that. But first, let's compare human beings, okay? So I want you to look at the human gorilla, chimpanzee, pongo, and then the human, right? So um, look at the phenotypic diversity. So uh, you can see the humans are very, very different, very high amounts of phenotypic diversity in human beings, but not in the animal kingdom. So what's going on here? These species are all related to one another, right? So supposedly these, these have existed for millions of years longer than human beings, but yet they have less phenotypic diversity. That's not expected. So again, look at humans in comparison. We have the lowest amount of genetic diversity out of all these animals, but yet the highest amount of phenotypic diversity. This tells us that we're not related to them at all. The common ancestor between humans and chimps would have carried the genetic diversity capable of giving them both chimps and humans high phenotypic diversity capabilities. Yet they want us to believe that humans inherited it, but the chimpanzees didn't inherit that same phenotypic diversity. Why not? That makes no sense at all. They We literally split. We would share the same amount of genetics that would allow diversity. So we can see that, that the phenotypic diversity is the same between all of these different species, including humans, right? So what does that tell us? It tells us many important things. One, that all human groups must be the same age as their phenotypic diversity is the same between all people groups. Two, it tells us that phenotypic diversity between animal species is also the same, meaning that we all went through a recent bottlenecks and animals species formed soon after that and not in the deep past, right? Because deep time obviously would be letting us know that a lot of um, phenotypic diversity would occur over millions of years. It also tells us that humans have the same phenotypic diversities between Asians, Caucasians, Africans, 
And this is what we would expect with the uh, biblical account of creation, uh, um, uh, biblical flood, I'm sorry. And if hundreds of thousands of years had actually passed, life would be far more phenotypically diverse in some species, but not in others that they're related to, right? There is no phenotypic hierarchy either, right? So we look at these, we go, look, tigers, all of them can interbreed, all are related, very low phenotypic diversity. You would look at one and be like, I can't even tell the difference between a Bengal tiger and a Siberian tiger. If I was in the wild, it would take a specialist. It would take a, uh, somebody that knows the species to identify that. And same with the orangutan. But uh, humans, very, very different, very diverse. We line up the animals. We can actually see the same thing. And then we go, uh, but look at just Africans. Look at how different, right? We can see that the diversity within Africans is still really, really diverse. It's the same thing no matter where we look in different people groups today. And these are people groups from all around the world. We can see massive phenotypic differences looking at the skulls. Very, very unique, very different than the animal kingdom. And again, more Africans. That was supposed to be showed earlier. Phenotypic diversity off the charts, but yet the same between every single one of us. So keep in mind, those images do not even include people groups that have died out in the past, like Denisovan, Neanderthal, Erectus, Heidelbergensis, which also show even more phenotypic diversity, which would be expected in the past, right? We get closer to Noah, higher amounts of genetic diversity, more diversity will be seen as time goes on, get lost, right? So yet, and this is what we see. I showed this because it looks pretty funny. Look at all the diversity we have from dog breeds today. Okay. Why is this? What's going on here? Dog breeds are something that hide the genetic diversity within them. Okay. We know that. So we're going to get into that in just a minute. But first, this is what we would see if, if evolution was true. We would find the highest genetic phenotypic diversity in African people today. And that phenotypic diversity would be hugely uncorrelated. And then we get into the Europeans, which would be uh, more close to the Asians, right? That's, that's what we would see in phenotypic diversity. So instead, what do we see? We see the exact equal proportions between all groups of people, exactly what we would expect in a biblical model. But an evolutionary model has us going bottleneck to bottleneck to bottleneck to bottleneck. Each one of these bottlenecks would be lowering genetic diversity every single time we go into one because you only get a handful of people surviving each one. So we would, if we looked into the fossil record in the past, we should see massive phenotypic differences between all these supposed human ancestors. And the phenotype, because if we see that with people groups today, which would be at the end of the spectrum, we would find that they, the phenotypic differences would be minimal in what people would be able to produce today. But instead, we see the opposite. We see massive amounts of phenotypic differences looking at the populations. And we do look over at people groups in the past, and we don't we don't see that in the fossil record. We go, oh, man, there's not really much going on there. Why? If they live for hundreds of thousands of years and why, where are the horses? Where are the bodies? Where are all the uh, the differences? I think our model makes far more sense with what we see when it comes to this phenotypic difference. So again, when we're looking over here at this one, we see that if all three major groups of people formed soon after the flood, sometime after Babel, then all of these uh, all of this finally makes sense, and they have this hierarchical pattern that should be there. And this is where the paradox came from and why they really came with like, well, people look so different. Let's compare them to the closest looking animal. That must have been what happened. Asians, you know, that's where the uh, Pongo live. They're an over there in Asia. So they must have come from that that ancestral group of primates. And then what do we know? Well, we know from genotypic studies now, race is a made up thing. There's there's the genetic similarity between all people is extremely close. We're not related to these animals whatsoever. And then comes the storytelling from them. It's like, well, you know, what happened is we got this, these chimps, right? And these primate ancestors and they had full body fur. The chimpanzees kept theirs and we started to lose their ours. Kind of like there's chimps that lost their fur today. And eventually what's going to happen is they're going to evolve melanin and then they're going to evolve this subcutaneous layer of fat that's going to surround their body. And then there's they're going to get goose bumps because it'll help keep them warm. They'll evolve all eyebrows and then they'll evolve the ability to grow long hair on the tops of their heads. And then they'll grow a really evolve a thick epidermis skin and then thermal regulating genes all of these requirements are needed also so that we can start wearing fur again like our ancient ancestors because that makes total sense right and yeah these things are all true only humans have these these features about them if you want the list it's right there 
And just remember, guys, that you, there's not a lot of time because the amount of time it takes only two mutations to reach fixation, beneficial mutations is 200 million years. So they have to account for all of these things literally to evolve in the time it took to split, which is 6 million years. But it, only two mutations takes that long. So where is the time for evolution to evolve all of those things? We're not even going to get into the uh, how long a sexual organ uh, would take to evolve. That's going to be far more than two mutations. So <laughs> it gets more ridiculous the more the story you look at it. So another way we can validate that deep time is not true using this uh, phenotypic diversity is by looking at man made current animals and breeds, right? Let's use modern created dog breeds as an example. They are far outside the phenotypic diversity compared to the wild counterparts, right? Look at their faces, either completely fat, uh, smashed flat, really long. Some of them can't even breathe. They have all kinds of diversity within that group because we've we've manipulated their genetics. So we can see how much we can change their genetics around. Breeding has shown that it has a hidden reservoir inside this genetic uh, capability, but wild animals don't show much diversity. If if deep time was really, really true, wouldn't we see the story that they that they admit to? Because if we look, they say that the wolf has lived almost one million years. Well, wait a minute. That story reminds me of something. It reminds me of the story of where they said the Pachycetus evolved into an aquatic species in the same amount of time. Wait a minute. That's a huge amount of phenotypic differences. But yet they want us to believe that the wolf had that same amount of time diverse and spread around the world. And yet almost no phenotypic differences whatsoever. Wait a minute. The story doesn't match what the science is telling us. Why? Because the, the story they're telling us is a lie. It's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Adam Segwood said the reason why evolution, uh, uh, the theory of evolution was created from the first to the last is the uh, dish of rank materialism cleverly cooked up. And why it is, why is it done? For no other reason, I am sure, except for the independent of a creator. People know that they invented this. They know that if you push evolution, naturalism, that you there is no need for a god. That's the reason they have to push this nonsense because it's, it just goes against Occam, Occam's razor, right? In science, the authority of a thousand opinions is not uh, worth as much as one tiny spark of reason in an individual man. So don't ever let people tell you, well, the majority believe it. Are they all wrong? Who cares what they think? Think for yourself. Question everything. That's what science is about. Stop just accepting what everyone is like. Oh, well, well, they, you know, you're the, the scientist told me it's true. Well, I'm just going to believe them. That's what they told me in school. Okay, well, you know, they're going to tell you a lot of things. You know, if you lived a thousand years ago, you'd believe the earth is flat too. So consistent, consistent, um, <laughs> uh, consensus then as well. Are you going to go with that same argument? Doesn't make much sense. How about evolution? They say linear line going up through time. We say, wait a minute, mutations are breaking us down. We see the exact opposite. We say created genetic diversity. We see creation in animal species, right? But again, beneficial mutations have to override negative mutations for it to be true. So when we're looking at uh, our model, which would say genetic entropy, we're looking at damage in the genome, right? Kimura came along and he was like, hmm, and see what's going on, how much selection would actually be needed for going on. And what we see is that Kimura only assumed that beneficial mutations could completely override things through simulations. He didn't actually know. So what we actually found out later is um, most of the mutations that are building up are actually taking place within this distribution area where they can't be selected for. So this is uh, another one I think uh, I was going to cover going through genetic ent entropy for a minute. Um, it might take too long, so I'll just skim through it because you guys kind of know a little bit about it. But as you guys know, we have uh, multiple mutations building up that are non-selectable, non-seeable, but yet we haven't reached mutation saturation. We see that um, problems are rising, diseases are increasing. Uh, we don't see what they expected to see. 
And when we look for these beneficial mutations, they, they just infer that some could happen, but there's not enough guys. There just really isn't the great majority of them. 99% are harmful in some way, shape or form. And when we look at things like in Africa, we go, Ooh, look at that. There's malaria. Malaria is taking place. And this isn't, isn't good. I mean, 300,000 babies are born with sickle Sarah and 50 to 90% will die before their fifth birthday. So yeah, it's true. They don't get malaria, but they're dying from this mutation anyway. So it's, it's helping, but it's like, you know, hurting yourself just so it could happen. It just so it can help a little bit. It's like evolution is just trying to make you survive basically, but <laughs> that's all that's happening is barely any survival. So we see a buildup of these new mutations every single generation and it's based on the age of the father. And now we're starting to really learn that, wait a minute, most of these silent mutations are harmful. They're not neutral. And that is unexpected at a point of where they say that 75% of synonymous, which they always thought synonymous mutations don't have any effect on, on, uh, on something at all, are actually harmful. That was really, really surprising. And what we know now is that these random mutations, they even admit that they're not leading to the type of evolution that they need it to. In the, in the in the textbooks because remember they can say evolution can do anything it can go left it can go right it can go up it can go down well that's not what the textbooks show the textbooks show a linear form of evolution so that's what they have to prove don't ever let them tell you otherwise because it's just absolutely ridiculous and uh too long to go over some of these <laughs> and most of the things that they actually thought were beneficial mutations are more epigenetically regulated than anything else and epigenetics doesn't even change the gene and mutations are what change the gene and uh, if it doesn't change the gene, there's no evolution. So uh, epigenetics is a really good subject. It's a it's a fun one. It really shows the limit for what we what we thought evolution really have. Then we have the waiting time problem where um, I get another huge subject where there's just not enough time for evolution to be true. When we go through the simulation of DNA changes required based on uh, mutations, beneficial mutations, rising and reaching fixation. It's just not there. So we show that the waiting time problem is uh, very severe when one or more mutations is required to establish any new function. And evolution needs new function everywhere you look. If you're going to turn something into the ability to fly in multiple different organisms in every single different environment, you're going to need massive amounts of new functions to get there. So we're able to actually predict that there's the loss of function and that loss of function, we're able to say, mm, if we're losing chromosomes over time from chromosome fusions, we can make testable predictions on that. And therefore we can actually trace back lineages based on where animals migrated to, how that farm, how much farther they got away from the arc, and then trace those back to more of a chromosome count and therefore we it, it it performs in the function of showing us that the biblical model of ancestry is more true and giving us a indicator of what animals were probably on the ark rather than their counterpart species that later came about and we can do that by tracing uh, uh chromosome fusions that's uh in the younger creation model and then um dr john sanford came out and said that he hypothesized that the humans will go extinct after 350 generations and as you know from the y chromosome we're about had 150 right now so that puts a time limit on humans and pretty much all life in general but that doesn't uh, uh tell us anything except for more testable predictions and again mendel's accountant is the simulator that was run for this. And a lot of people don't like Mendel's accountant that are atheists because it completely destroys their paradigm of evolution being true. And they say, who cares about Mendel's accountant? Well, I'll tell you who cares about it. The National Institute of Health, the NIH, the largest health organization on earth. They don't use the evolutionary model. They use the young earth creation model because it is the true model. It doesn't care about the fight that we're having between creation and evolution. It only cares about what works. And if evolution worked, they would be using an evolutionary model of, of prediction and and it doesn't. It uses ours because ours is what's true. It's what we see. It's what we can test. It's what we observe. And, and it's the one we're making testable predictions on. So why are they choosing the Young Earth creation model if it's wrong? If they say, oh, it's garbage. Oh, really? Oh, it's garbage. Is it? They're using it with success and they don't care about the, the debate going on. So that's destructive. And the final conclusions is beneficial mutations can't keep up with the deleterious ones. They're not strong enough to override it. And if they are strong enough to override it, it actually makes things worse because it speeds up the, the, uh, the negative ones, which I forgot to show you the slide on. 
Uh, but it's okay. Everyone, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, <laughs> the books after that. And as a reminder, we are going to be having the special creation handbook, uh, being, it's being worked on right now and it got updated again this morning, but it will be ready in like literally probably two days. So be ready for that one. If you want more information on genetic entropy and what we just talked about, and that book will be ready to go. If you bought it today, so be it. The interior is ready. But if you wait two days, you'll get the newest up-to-date model with the new cover and everything ready to go. That brings us to the next one. Hmm. Genome studies confirm creation or do the genome uh, studies force evolution into early retirement, right? Are they a retro retrofitting type of thing? Because uh, do we have genetic boundaries or are these genetic relations that they're talking about by looking at particular uh, areas of the genome and protein coding region genes? Is that, is that showing us? Well, that's what the Rockefeller University study of 2019 actually showed us, is that it showed us that there were clear genetic boundaries and that you can trace these things back to a bottleneck and there's no species in between them at all. That was exactly the opposite of what they expected. They expected a hierarchical pattern going back to a universal common ancestor. Instead, they found uh, linear lines of, of a separate ancestry coming out of a bottleneck. Humans, fish, chimpanzees, gorillas, all of them at the same time coming out of the same bottleneck. All of the things that they said, no, 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 we converge, we converge, we converge. No evidence for any of it. And the evidence they said was so conclusive uh, was so surprising that they fought against it. That's right. They had to, they had to tell themselves like, Whoa, what's going on here? So again, all animals, are the same age. That's right. They were the same age. 90% of all life, genetically speaking is the same age. And that means 10% of all life that was in the past went into a bottleneck and boom, 90%. Now that we all have came from that 10% that was on the arc. Guess what evolution did not predict exactly that. And yes, that's right. The population included anchovies too. That's right. Fish went through the bottleneck. So they can't say, ah, oh, the bottleneck was just some, you know, random thing that was uh, for land life, or maybe it was just a volcano that wiped out some things. Oh no, global, completely global. And this debunked what they know about evolution of species. That's right. So they've tried to say they had to go back and write on the top of that study. No, this doesn't debunk evolution. It confirms it. But guess what? It doesn't do that at all. It completely destroys their theory. And if you want even more on that, make sure to watch the video called Genetic Boundaries on this channel. Go back. I recommend it. It's very, very powerful because what we see are living species going back in a single line of ancestor to exactly the same species of the family, <laughs> right? And then a branching out from that, exactly what the biblical model predicted. That's why phylogeny has to use cladistics as play words and games. And all they use is assumptions, right? They have to use cladistics as their word salad game to prove relation now. Because that's the only way they can do it, right? They've, they've lost everything. So now they have to use semantics. They have to go, well, well you know, uh, we're related to apes because we are apes. We named ourselves that. We, so now we can say that we are apes. Oh, okay. So here's the assumptions that are based on cladistics. They require assumptions based on it. Carl Linnaeus, he based groupings on similarities of traits, right? But Darwin classified these based on the assumptions of ancestry. That's the difference. The animals stayed the same, but the lenses they used to interpret it, or interpret it have changed because of the classification systems and the assumption of evolution being true. What do we see? Carl Linnaeus was in many ways, um, none of the least of which was how he classified humans. He named humans Homo sapiens and placed them in the genus Homo. Although Linnaeus believed that humans were especially designed God's creation, he plotted them like he would any other animal. So Linnaeus did not recognize humans alongside of apes with any idea of evolutionary link at all. He did this. Uh, he did this with the same reasoning he used to categorize all life, which is similarities that he identified with species. That is it. It doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean that evolution is true. It's just like, oh, you have a hand and an arm that can do this. You have a face that's forward. You don't have a tail. You're an ape. Close enough. So therefore, people go, oh, I guess I'm an ape. Oh, I'm going to classify that way. I might as well be an ape, right? Here is the definition of a human. It's a it's a human being distinguished from an animal. I'm sorry to tell you guys. That's just the way that it's going to have to be for you. A succession of even very similar forms doesn't demand common descent. It could, in this case it does, instead point to a common designer. These guys, the engineers at Chevy. Intelligent agents are free to reuse things however they want. Just like I use the same password, Fluffy Bunny 123 for everything I do online. So the question remains open, is homology due to common design or common descent? 
Because the argument was so central to Darwin's case, his followers eliminated the question by simply redefining the word from simple similarity to meaning similarity due to common ancestry. They baked Darwinism into the definition of the word. Homology now typically means similarity due to common ancestry. It's a clever way to end an argument if you can get away with it, but for anybody paying attention, it's a baldly circular one. Common ancestry because common ancestry. We got a flag on the play, circular reasoning, illegal use of logic, five yard penalty, repeat the fourth grade. Oh, come on, no serious biologist could possibly make that mistake. Nobody defines homology that way and then uses it as evidence for evolution. Come on, people couldn't possibly be that. No. The circular argumentation is still regularly used in high school, even college level textbooks, and many a YouTube video. The surprising thing is that many otherwise very smart people didn't realize this. However, more and more people are seeing the problem for what it is. That brings us to our next one, which is, of course, the evolutionary bottleneck versus creation bottleneck, right? We would have to say that um, evolution tells us that there have been multiple bottlenecks through uh, many eons of time and that these small breeding uh, inbreeding populations have existed. The young earth creation model says, no, God told us be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, which one of these is true? Because people love to mock us. They go, ah, you guys are so ridiculous. You believe that all the animals were inbreeding and then all of a sudden they could populate the world. That's stupid. It, it's un, it's unseen. Humans can't inbreed without genetic problems. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yes, that is true today. But what? who really has the problem here? Is the problem really a small group of people filling up the uh, earth from a small population really quickly in one generation? Or is this hypothetical scenario of, of populations going into a bottleneck and then living in small populations over long periods of time, which one makes more sense? You can't be inbreeding in small populations without massive amounts of health problems. Ours doesn't have that because you get an extensive growth of populations where mutations aren't going to be a problem because eventually there's going to be cousins and then cousins and then third cousins and it's not going to be a big issue. It's when you're in these smaller populations that evolution says you, they existed in, over tens of thousands of years. That's the actual inbreeding problem. So I find it ironic that they say we have an inbreeding problem when they have the biggest inbreeding problem that there is. We have mutations building up from a perfect genome over a couple thousand years, a bottleneck, and then an explosion of people yet again. What happens in the animal kingdom? Can we prove that this scenario where they're mocking us again is true? Absolutely. How about when they dropped off wild mouflon sheep and they, on an island and they left them there? There were only um, a, a single pair of them. They can only inbreed. What happened? Uh-oh. Exactly the opposite of what evolution predicted could happen from two animals getting off the ark and filling up the world. They did just fine. They actually got to a population of 600 and there was no problem at all. The same thing with deer. They dropped off deer, five, five white tail. I think only two of them, um, only, oh no, there was only a single male. Boom, they filled up. No problem with inbreeding at all. They filled up the entire area. How about the, um, in Catalina, when they dropped off a buffalo, they dropped off like um, a handful of buffalo, like 14 of them or something on this island. For a movie, yeah, they dropped off 14 of them, and uh, they exploded to 600 of them. They were like, oh, my gosh, they lowered them down to 150 because they were like, oh, man, this <laughs> that that's can maintainable. We can't maintain 600 of them. They actually had to try to slow down the population growth. There is no problem with the creation model at all of putting in genetic diversity and then allowing animals to get off the ark and populate the world. There isn't. It's same thing with human beings. Matter of fact, we know what Eve's sequence is. And you can read this by Dr. John Sanford um, when he, uh, uh, Andrew Snelling published this with him. And you can go and read that Eve sequence has already been done. We already know what her genome looked like. And because we base everything on function, it's much easier to say. And then we have the creation, which makes more sense. We have the story of evolution, which doesn't make genetic sense. Uh, it doesn't make inbreeding sense. It's, it doesn't make any sense, really. Um, uh, everything should be different uh, if evolution was true, but I digress. We we see what's what creation sees, and we know that they're not objective when it comes to this because they have a prior commitment of materialism. They cannot allow a divine foot in the door in science because the second they start allowing this thing, this type of thing to be taught, evolution is through, and they they don't want that. They have another thing. How about Darwin? Let's go back to him real quick. He predicted based on evolution being true that Darwinian finches would produce one new species every 3,000 years based on deep time, based on what he knew. 
Well, guess what? The exact opposite happened. They found that in two generations, literally a new species can form. That is exactly the opposite of what he of what he thought would ever be found to be true. That's way too fast. So literally in 3.3 years, there's a new species of finch. So when we go over it, evolution says slow, creation says fast. What do we see? We see animals evolving way faster than they ever thought, ever predicted. And more, and this, this is observable data. This isn't anything we just don't know. We can go down the list of different things that we know. New species are evolving in two generations. That is way too quick for evolution, but it explains why we have so many different species alive today. If speciation can happen in just two generations, it's no big deal at all, right? How about, uh, how about people go, oh, we lost wisdom teeth. That's proving that uh, evolution is true, right? I mean, uh, it's, 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 it shows that we're evolving to the next stage. It's like, wait a minute, we're losing information. The jaws of people are actually shrinking. And we know that they're shrinking because uh, the, the people in the wild today are uh, easily testable. And we can take them and we can say, look at the Australian aboriginals. Let's see what happens when we take them. We put them on a modern diet. The very next generation are showing that their teeth don't fit in their mouth and they are no longer having wisdom teeth. That is not deep time evolution. That is the genome protecting the body because it's designed to know how to do so. It knows if it grows wisdom teeth with already a shrinking mouth with teeth that don't fit, you're going to have horrible problems. We see this exact same thing in elephants today. Because if we look at the Moa Zimbabwe um, civil war that arose, elephants were being mass slaughtered for their tusks. And remember, elephants have a generation time like humans, very high, one of the slowest reproducing mammals on earth. And within just two generations, 98% of all female elephants never develop tusks. How? How do they know how to do this? Or are they like thinking, wait a minute, if I don't grow my tusks, maybe they'll stop killing me. No, the design network kicked in that was like, you're being killed for this reason. It's almost like it was designed, wasn't it? To like protect the animal from being killed. And you're like, well, that's really good. That proves evolution. That's a very good mutation. Oh, really? Because it's lethal when the mutation gets into males and males are dying left and right because when they get the mutation, they die. So only females can exist with the benefit. The males die immediately. So when we look at aboriginals, people, guess what? They lived, when they migrated into Australia, it was extremely hot there, right? And so it was so hot that their body adapted to this heat extremely fast. The central Australian Aborigines actually have the ability to withstand massive amounts of temperature. Their body stays 50% cooler than you and me, naturally, all because of a gene variant that they got that isn't in other even Aboriginals that don't live there. And that happened very, very quickly. But yet they want to tell us the Aboriginals have been there for 65,000 years. Well, if that was the case, then guess what? Humans would be a different species, wouldn't they? Because if you, if animals are evolving into different species within literally a couple generations, how can you isolate a group of humans in an area for 65,000 years and then come along later and then reproduce with them? It would be physically impossible because of all the gene conversions and all the other uh, problems that would arise from isolation from that amount of time. The only way to explain the ability to assimilate and to breed with aboriginals is the young earth creation timeline. So. That is it. How about um, uh, the Dairy Queen? This is showing us that when we look at Vikings in the past, we know how tall they were because we know when they lived and when they were buried and who they were. And literally 1,000 years ago, they were a different height. They weren't very tall people. But yet, when we look at Denmark, Norway, Sweden, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Netherlands, all of them have the same gene variant for height, which makes them extremely tall. That means that gene variant rose within... I'm sorry, arose within literally like a hundred generations <laughs> and spread through all the people. How about snakes? They're losing their white, white stripes. Why? Because when pollution gets into their environment, melanin absorbs toxins. So when, um, when, it, when it, a toxin dumps into the ocean, literally in the lifespan of that snake, they start losing their stripes so that the melanin can, can absorb the toxins and their, and their offspring are born without stripes and they never get the stripes back again. So again, we see loss of information. We see um, something that was already there being lost. And then we go over to islands and we see that um, beetles uh, are losing their ability to fly because what happens is when they, when they come on, on a, like let's say debris brings them to an ocean, and then they get off and they are out on a new island. The wind picks them off and blows them back into the ocean and they end up dying. So what happens is natural selection goes, hmm, 
what's going on here? Why these things are dying? So it's again, they're not saying like they're not choosing to not fly. They're just using that ability if they have it. So what happens is the olfactory sensors in their nose now don't allow them to smell flowers far away. So they don't want to fly. So now they just walk around everywhere. And after just a few generations, they are now not able to fly at all because there was no need for it because they lost that ability to smell. Think about that. That is insane, right? So we're talking about built-in design, right? You guys might like that uh, slide, but I got to move on because I'm running out of time. Plants, same thing. Rapid. 10 to 100 years, they're adapting very, very fast to environments. Um, mutations are not random. They, it seems like they're they're piling up exactly where they were, they were supposed to be to help the species like they were built in design. It took 100 years for the insects to adopt to eating it again. This is the cherry plum tree. Um, uh, let's play it real quick. This is the black cherry, an American tree species that has spread invasively in Western Europe over the past century. And for a long time, people thought that this was because it doesn't have any native natural enemies. But when you look at herbarium records over the past century, you see that more and more insects have started feeding on the black cherry and actually nowadays we found that there are more different species of insects eating from this tree than from the native bird cherry we also found that some specialized insects have evolved have changed genetically to adapt to this new food source and we think that over time this may help to control the invasive character of the black cherry you can read all about this research in our latest publication in the journal PRJ. So what's going on? Again, we have a, a, a tree species that never existed in a place being uh, moved in. And now all of a sudden it's growing and the insects are adapting to eating it. Really good, right? Well, guess what? When they removed the trees, the insects weren't able to adapt to living back at the environment that they once lived in and able to eat from. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? The very own food source that was their main one is now... Uh, they're unable to eat it because they lost that genetic information. Very similar to the E. coli experiment with Linsky, right? They moved into a special environment, they adapted to it, and then when they tried to move them back to the original, they couldn't live there anymore. They lost genetic information, exactly what our model says. We say the same thing in um, uh, butterflies, and uh, we see the same thing in deer. We see the same thing in toads. We see the same thing in animals. We look everywhere, Gupper, guppies, lizards, mosquitoes, mice. Evolution is happening extremely fast, you see? But this adaptation, they've stolen the word adaptation or any change to mean evolution, right? So therefore, if anything changes, oh, it's proof of evolution. No, it's not. Every one of these examples is literally contrary to what they thought and predicted, right? So what do we see? The genetic variance, uh, fitness, uh, indicates rapid uh, contemporary adaptive radiation uh, of evolution in wild animals. Are there are any of these examples proof, though, that any of these other organisms are related in the past? So does that prove now that that um, these uh, you know flightless insects now were related to something else? How about fish? Right, freshwater fish are genetically adapted from ocean dwelling. That's weird, right? In just 120 years? Oh, man. Yeah, even faster than that if you actually read the data. How about mm, birds evolved virtually overnight to keep up with invasive prey? Wait a minute, that's too fast. How about the qu uh, cliff swallows? Everyone's been driving down the freeway probably at some point and seeing these birds living in freeways. And yet, that they've only started doing this recently. And as they've done this, they have actually shortened their wingspan because larger wingspans actually are required for them to... Um, uh, glide at a different rate. They uh, a smaller wing uh, is more aerodynamic and allows them to turn quicker. But within just a few generations, what do we see? These birds have adapted to living under freeway overpasses really just that quickly. That's way too fast for evolution to be true. And how many bird families are there? Two hundred forty-nine. That would so to me, that's how many would have been on the ark. And then uh, the amount of species today. How about cat breeds? Wild cats, there's not very many of, but in breeds, there's tons of them. So we see the genetic diversity going on inside of wild anim uh, wild animals, and we, we see the limit to what evolution would be able to produce, and it's not that much, guys. So how about rapid evolution in kinds?
Camels and llamas, so different and living on different continents, yet able to breed together and produce young. Examples abound of species that can be bred together. Zebras with horses. Tigers with lions. Potatoes with hot peppers and so on. This amazes biologists. Based on modern rates of change, new species should quickly lose their ability to interbreed with other species. So modern species that interbreed must have formed recently and rapidly. It's amazing that camels and llamas, though separated by oceans and thousands of miles, came from the same parents in relatively recent times. Then we could understand how a single pair of cats could produce all known cats. Today, crossbreeding between domestic cats and wild cats, between cougars and leopards, between lions and tigers, indicate that all modern cat species are the same created kind. The original cat kind carried all the information necessary to build the variety of cats we see today. So how could such major changes have arisen so rapidly? This is a mystery to biologists. Squids are shrinking. Birds are migrating. Lizards are getting blown away by hurricanes. The signs are everywhere. Animals are changing, but few people expected it to happen so fast. About 2,500 miles away, a series of marine heat waves swept through the Gulf of California, warming the surface temperature of the water and impacting various species, including the Humboldt squid. Humboldt squid are also known as jumbo squid because they grow so large. They can be three, four, five, even six feet in length. Fishers in the Gulf of California were the first people to notice that something had changed when they stopped catching the Humboldt squid. When the scientists arrived to study this situation, they found that in fact the Humboldt squid were still there and in some places more plentiful than before. What had changed was their lifestyle and their body. These were not immature or juvenile squid. They were Humboldt squid at full size, reproducing and carrying out their lives in half the time they used to. Dr. William Gilly and his team measured the squid they caught and found a reduction of 50% or more in their body size in response to the stress of the higher water temperatures. This adaptation is known as plasticity. Plasticity is already built into the genome of a species. It's already there. From the warm waters of Mexico, we travel to the frigid north to study another example of plasticity, behavioral plasticity, in the feeding patterns of this Arctic bird. I think we're all familiar with that iconic climate change image of the polar bear stranded on a shrinking iceberg. But if you could look beyond the bear to the edge of the ice, you might catch a glimpse of a tiny seabird called the little auk or dovekey. Dovekeys feed along the edge of the ice flows where there are, are a lot of plankton. And that has been their strategy for thousands of years. It worked just fine until the ice flows began to shrink and retreat farther and farther from the islands where the dovekeys breed. And you can imagine, as that ice gets farther and farther away, the dovekeys have longer and longer to travel to reach a place where they can get food for their offspring. And they have long been predicted to be an early casualty of climate change. French scientist David Grimley and his team placed transmitters on the birds and wondered how long they would need to fly to their usual plankton meal, which was now far away at the edge of the retreating ice. So when they gathered around to collect the first batch of data from their transmitters, they were astounded because instead of flying an hour, the dove keys had been in the air for less than four minutes. David and his team realized that the dove keys had found a new food source right on their very doorstep at the mouth of the fjord, where the milky blue meltwater from island glaciers was slamming into the dark, cold currents of the Arctic Ocean and creating this place of plenty for the dovekeys to feed upon the stunned plankton. The dovekeys continue to thrive by being flexible enough as a species to switch up their traditional feeding patterns and adapt quickly to a changing environment. 
plants and animals all over the world, adapting their behaviors, sometimes changing their bodies, sometimes even evolving in response to climate change. We can take inspiration from plants and animals in terms of our own response to the crisis. After all, if a tiny lizard can evolve in response to climate change, then it stands to reason we can change some of the behaviors that are bringing it about. Just so many examples, time and time again, of this rapid adaptation that was never predicted by evolution. And so we've run out of time, I guess. So I've, I've ha I'm going to have to skip uh, junk DNA, mutation, saturation, uh, longevity, uh, genetic potential, uh, vestigial organs, leftover remnants. We're going to have to stop on chromosome two fusion, uh, races. Um, but one thing that I do want to finish up is predictions. And we have three novel predictions that are going to be made right now tonight that are I'm going to break down real quick. We are going to say that ancient mummified Egyptians, uh, animals and people are going to have fewer mutations than people alive today, going back and uh, making predictive power based on the young earth creation timeline. Meaning if evolution is true, they wouldn't really have very many mutations different than us today because obviously, uh, you know, they only lived a few thousand years ago. So not a lot of mutations will be there. But in our model, it was near this is almost 4,000 years ago, right? So we're, they're going to have a lot of mutation differences from us. Another one is ERV knockout prediction, the more beneficial than not, and fewer orphan genes in Africans and the Khoisan people. And the reason why is because if we're going to make predictions based on these things, if we see uh, going backwards, uh, we're, uh, ERVs, are, we're going to say, have function. And these functions are going to be more beneficial than the detriment that they actually bring. And as far as orphan genes, we know that uh, on a study that was done with flies where we forced them into uh, reproductive isolation and we took younger species, uh, our, fl our flies, and we forced them to breed and produce offspring, they eventually lost their orphan genes. So that would mean then if uh, Nathaniel Jensen is 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 right, then what we would do is, is Africans are actually reproducing at younger rates, then therefore they should have less orphan genes within them as a human population. It only makes sense, right? Uh, the only uh, caveat with that would, would be is that the fruit fly study was done on flies that were very adolescent. Uh, I'm not sure uh, around puberty age, so I'll have to check that one out. But regardless, what that would mean is that if Africans have less orphan genes, it'll show that human beings didn't come from Africans. It would mean that we branched off with them. So it would clarify multiple things of our model. So Again, if we're wrapping this all up, we explain genetic diversity better. We explain genetic similarity better. We explain mutation rates better. We explain human origins better. We explain phenotypic diversity better, the fossil record better, bottlenecks, human migration, inbreeding, population growth, history, junk DNA, disease better, vestigial organs. We make better testable predictions. The, so when when I see clowns like you know other people, atheists over here just saying, I don't see any evidence at all. I don't see anything. They're just looking through the lens of, of, of oh, I don't know what I'm doing there. It's not playing. They're just looking through the lens of what they want to already believe to be true. I recommend people reading Replacing Darwin and Traced. They're advanced books but they're a good reflection of what the Young Earth Creation model is. I wanted to thank Discovery Science for the videos that I popped up and used, those little cartoon ones, which were fun. And now we can get into questions. <laughs> you know, Two hours ago, brother, you took one big breath and then whew, just two hours straight, nonstop. Very impressive, brother. Uh, I told you, coffee does the trick, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I never have caffeine, so it's good. I needed it. I needed it. Great endurance, brother. Um, I know how it feels. A couple of weeks ago, I did an ERV presentation for just two plus hours straight, one breath. One coffee, and it's like a workout. It's a marathon. So I only uh, got through half. <laughs> right. I know. We're going to have to do a part two, guys. Uh, sometime after the conference, what we will do is a uh, Genesis Genetics part two. Um, because this was epic. Carmine says, Matt Man is a top five presenter. Amen. I Ooh, agree. Thanks. Um, very engaging presentation, the passion, the energy, not one moment of, uh, of bore. 
of being boring. Uh, so much great irrefutable evidence. Matt, I know we're putting all this together in a book. Um, you also mentioned the special creation book. Um, so yes, to the audience, that is, I would say a few days away from being uh, ready for release. It's close to 300 pages. And there we go. The expanded and updated edition. So I've got our uh, book designer, Benjamin. He does fantastic work. He does all these uh, original designs for us. Uh, he did the... Uh, where is it? He did the endogenous retrovirus handbook design, which, I mean, we love it. So he's doing a custom back cover because this book is... Um, I mean, it's over double the size of the old version, pretty much a brand new book. Um, and with some novel answers in it as well to some of these challenges. And so the second Benjamin is done with the back cover, we are going to send it in for publishing and hopefully we'll be done soon. Um, so Karen, why says it's amazing how much info <laughs> gets out on his present. Amen. Amen. The key is to just talk as fast, but as clear and concise as possible. So there's, <laughs> there's no way to top that performance, brother. Great job. I told uh, the audience, you know, this conference would be comprehensive. And so far, uh, in just the three sessions we've done so far, we're looking at over six hours and we're just getting started. You know, the fun is just getting started, Matt. This is only day two, session three. Um, so God bless. This was a, a great stuff, brother. You know, and, and I love how well-rounded it, it, it was. You know, you touched on so many different topics. Um, you know, some topics that I'm going to touch on as well in my presentation tomorrow night pertaining to, of course, ERVs, chromosome two fusion, so on and so forth. I love when you pointed out how, um, you know, the, these evolutions, the critics, they're so unsophisticated. They're so sloppy in, in their responses, right? So weak in their responses. They'll typically just say, because they, they know deep down inside, they don't have a sophisticated rebuttal or counter to what's being said here. So they'll say, well, I'm just going to go with the majority, right? The majority opinion argument or the consensus yeah. argument. I love how you just said, listen, Okay, think for yourself, who cares what the majority says? Okay, the majority has always been wrong for the most part. I mean, look at the majority at the time of Noah. There was eight people on the ark, Noah and his family. The majority were wrong, <laughs> okay? So, um, you know, I, I love how you just call them out for that. Because guys, it's 2022. It's a great time to be a biblical creationist. And to the critics, it's time to start advancing better arguments. If you think that you can provide a superior model, then do so. You know, that, that that's what we're waiting for. So this was two hours. And like you said, Matt, you know, you're just getting started and we're definitely going to have to do a part two. So what we'll do uh, in order to make sure we wrap it up at the two and a half hour mark is we'll do a uh, power round here of audience questions. And we got some good ones. Uh, Dan from Bible Research Tools. Thank you so much. God bless you. He says, great presentation, Matt. Um, Thanks. Okay, so let's start right at the beginning. And we'll have a power round here. This should be fun. Reminder to everybody, um, we're doing two shows a day for this uh, conference week. And so after this, um, we'll probably take a break for about an hour and a half. We're going to have CJ Cox for a presentation on countering compromise. Okay. So Ken Rock asks, I have a question. If God can do everything automatically, wouldn't anything he do be efficient? As far as creation? Um, I don't, I mean, yeah, he would have created efficiency in everything. That's why adaptation is so good, but you got to remember there was a fall many generations of past there was a bottleneck where lots of things died right so we we lose we lose some things as well so there's people that blame god one of the main reasons that people don't believe in christianity or fall away is because of the, it's called the problem of evil like i don't understand why my kid had to die why did god do this to me and it's not the case we live in a world that's fallen genetic entropy is real we disease and death and decay even plants and animals have turned on each other 
That's the world we live in. So yes, design was perfect. Everything was great in Eden. We messed it up. The Bible says, because of you, the earth is cursed. He didn't do it. We did. It's our consequence. Great answer. Born again, RN. Uh, good to have your brother. He's got a question for you. A couple of good questions. This is a good one, actually, uh, in, uh, I think, the introductory chapter of the new special creation book coming out. <clears throat> I touch on this because this is a great line of evidence for young earth creation. So great stuff. So he asks, based on the age of the earth, Matt, according to evolutionists, shouldn't the population of the earth be much larger? Absolutely. The population growth cr uh, curve shows that humans populated a very, very fast rate. The reasons uh, Neanderthal could not is because, again, they migrated up north and they lived in a, a time when there was the Ice Age. And you just can't don't have much food, right? You're limited to your resources. So a population can't grow if you're hunting literally only one food source, which for them was the mammoth. And then in Spain, they had to live on some plants. So again, a population can grow, but it needs good resources. So um with eons of time, with lots of populations and lots of people living over vast amounts of time, there should have been some population that succeeded in growing really good. And so the fact that we just don't see that in the history means it's very, something was peculiar with this, what they tell us versus what we see. Right. Yeah. Right. And if I could add one little thing, um, you and I uh, constantly talk about genetics, levels of diversity. And so this goes with you know population growth the fact that if evolution were true and we've been evolving for millions of years from you know australopithecine like ancestors up to homo habilis up to homo erectus who lives on the planet for you know a million plus years and then eventually from homo erectus you get um all the different human variants including homo sapiens right well we would then expect high levels of genetic diversity. That's millions of years of mutations accumulating, mutations adding genetic diversity. But yeah, what do we find today, Matt? Humans have incredibly low genetic diversity. Well, wait a minute, what's up with that? If deep time evolution is true, why are we so uniform? Why are we all 99.99999% similar? Well, from the biblical starting point, God creates two people, Adam and Eve. Right off the bat, that restricts genetic diversity. And so what do we expect today? Low genetic variation in humans. And that's exactly what we find fits perfectly. So um, again, great time to be a biblical creationist. So, all right, here we go. Doki Doki Bible Club, the man with the plan. Thank you so much, brother. And uh, I know it's a busy week with the conference. So I do want to thank all of our uh, awesome mods in the chat. Uh, also reminder, the Standing for Truth official podcast, um, we, uh, we just added, I think, four or five more episodes to the Standing for Truth podcast. So definitely check that out. And here we go. Matt, did man really live? This is one of your favorite topics, brother. 900 years, like Genesis says. Absolutely. When we look at what uh, scripture was saying versus what evolution says, like uh, they say that humans only live half as long as we do today. Maximum, like what, like 20 years, 15 years. That's not very long, right? But we say the exact opposite. They live for hundreds of years. So we would say that genetics plays a factor in this, right? So when they first started doing genetic studies, they said, ah, it only makes about 10% of your lifespan. And then pretty soon it was 20% then 25%. Now it's 35%. They're realizing that genetics plays a huge factor in how long we live. And now we know that, check this out, when we use CRISPR, which is a gene editing software, things live 25% longer when we alter even a single gene. That's right, one gene in... A mouse allows it to live 25% longer. But wait a minute, that's going back in time to a more pure genome, exactly what we said, right? So they said, well, soon humans will be level to live for a thousand years. What model makes that prediction? What model says that? That's why it's a, it's a paradox in the evolutionary model, why we age, like what's going on? Um, for more on that one, I recommend people watch the video, Evidence for Man to Live to 900. That's uh, highly detailed and... Uh, Got an entire book on it, even. It's dirt, <laughs> dirt, dirt cheap, 453. <laughs> so, yes, people lived a very long time. Genetics shows that the potential is within us still to this day. So, I mean, what else can you say? You can't deny it when people are literally admitting that it is true. The geneticists want us to live longer. They're called transhumanists. They're like, we can fix the genome. We can live like we used to. We can go back in time to the pure genome. What is that? That's the exact opposite of evolution. They're saying we didn't live long. 
So if you remove the mutations, should we literally be living half as long? Come on. Good question. So what happens when the evolutionist says, but Matt, man is living longer than he, than, than we have ever lived in, in the history of mankind. So, you know, what are you talking about? Let's, let, let's pretend I'm the evolutionist. How would you respond? Yeah. Lifespan and genetic potential are different things. We live in a world today that's very easy. We can uh, we can improvise. We can come over and put people in a hospital and keep them alive and going. The genetic potential was always in people, but life was so hard. The disease was everywhere. People were dying at young age. They were going off to war. It was it's it's not that the genetics wasn't there. It was that life was bad. It was hard. Right, and um, because of medicine. And, you know, taking care of each other, the average lifespan may have increased the average, but the, um, you know, ultimate lifespan, how long man can live has not um, increased at all. Um, so what that means is, right, Matt, quality of life, just because the average lifespan has increased. Well, a lot of times, you know, the, the quality of life is not so good, right, because of um, you know, how older people may be um, living longer in the first place, while compared to the biblical model, as you're pointing out, especially with gen with genetics. Can you touch on the, uh, is it the antioxidant called um, superoxide dismutase? And I'm not sure if that's the one that, that relates to lobsters and how they have more of this specific antioxidant that allows them to actually live to a thousand. Can you touch on that? Yeah. Yeah. We have three metabolic enzymes inside of us that are um, not functioning as much as they should be because of, again, genetic uh, entropy. We have um, less methylation factors, MTFR. So what happens is if we look at the metabolic production of something like superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, glutathione reductase, and catalase, these metabolic enzymes break down or catalyze the most damaging thing inside of our body, which are free radicals, oxidation. They break them down in segments based on how strong the liver is and how well it's functioning and extract it. So if we lived in a world that was cleaner, more pure, eating better and had better genetics and had a more functioning metabolic system, we would live longer. For example, lobsters. Lobsters still have a highly functioning superoxide dismutase, which is a metabolic enzyme in their liver. And they per they break down things in a different rate. They're per therefore, they live much longer, like 250 years. They never stopped growing. So they found one that was huge. They killed it and they ate it, of course. But one of the things that made them do is like, wow, that's, uh, why are they... Why are they living so long? So they kill young ones and they realize, wow, they produce much more of this metabolic enzyme. So when we look into the past and we see humans did the same thing, what does that tell us? It only tells us one thing. Humans had the ability to live longer genetically, biologically, and metabolically. That's it. Amen. Well said. Well said. You know, and we've had uh, lectures from you on this topic, you've had several debates on this topic. You know, did man live to 900? It's funny because the evolutionists they want to scoff at that concept. But every time you've done a debate on this topic, biblical longevity, they have not been able to uh, refute your points, they have not been able to counter the science. And we've been doing in 2022 an evolution debate challenge series where, as a team, right, we all have our different expertise, and you have been taking up. Uh, those that are willing to debate that topic of, of biblical, biblical longevity, but not many evolutionists have actually stepped up to debate you on that. So um, it's funny because you told me a long time ago that a James from modern day debate couldn't even find a creationist to talk right. on the subject. And that now look, now they won't even take it. <laughs> it, it right. It, it's, it's one of our most powerful and irrefutable uh, positions that yeah, they I'm just sure. can't counter the data. It's funny because they were so bold and going, why can't nobody defend this? Come on, bring it on. And then I step in there and now no one wants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Karen Weiss says, I want some lobster now. Yeah, ah, so exactly. <laughs> don't, don't bother. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. Don't, don't buy superoxide dismutase online and start taking it. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make a difference. Your, liver, your uh, hydrochloric acid of the stomach breaks it down. If you want to actually right. produce more, take an herb. These antioxidants, the potential in our genomes with a lot of these broken longevity genes going back in time, less mutation accumulation. So this whole argument that says, you know, man's living longer than they ever have, uh, you know, 
in the history of mankind. No, the average has gone up, yes, but the maximum possible lifespan has not gone up. Okay, take this point of most accumulating genetic damage back to a point of least accumulating, uh, you know, mutational load. That'd be a point of perfection a point of, of increased lifespan. So it's pretty basic, but unfortunately, a lot of the evolutionists are willingly ignorant. So, okay, let me get the uh, next question up here. Uh, this one comes in from Michael Hu. Question for Matt. Has there been any similar observations for plant genetics? Are they capable of telling us specifics like our genetics? Plant genomes are actually much larger than ours. Huge, huge. And that's because they're rooted into the ground. They can't get up and move like us, right? So they have to be much more diversified or else they die. So the genetics of plants are very unique and kind of more specific just to them. And they don't really roll over into human beings very good. So no, that's why we mostly test worms and, and mice because their genetic makeup is much more similar to what would happen inside of us. And um, they've tried to roll it over into plants, but just doesn't really work. Awesome. Appreciate that. Okay. Next question that comes in. Um, let me see here. Here's another one from born again, RN. Lots of good questions. Question for Matt. How do evolutionists explain male and female sexual organs evolving simultaneously for two people to reproduce since it allegedly uh, takes millions of years? That's a question for them because that's one of their problems. That's a paradox right. for them that they have to account for literally multiple organisms. Look at um, sexual reproduction versus asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is much more efficient and it's in much many more things. So how in the world did it evolve male and female dr drastically everywhere across all these different organisms? That's They're going to have to invent, again, co-evolution down the line for all of them at the same time. That's that's their problem, not not ours. Well, why did some precursor organisms evolve sexual reproduction in the first place? I mean, to produce asexually, I mean, less mouths to feed, less work to do, you know, so it doesn't make any sense. Evolutionary speaking, if selection and mutations are all about survival of the fittest, survive to the next generation. Yeah. Right. Selection is not worried about, you know, that which is long term. So it's or just bread with yeah. itself, like hermaphrodites. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, here's uh, the, the pale Galilean, obviously not understanding 99% uh, of what you're saying because he had more of a comment, a rhetoric. I thought I'd give you the opportunity to respond. So he says, so basically incest is okay. What an argument. And he gives you a couple uh, round of applauses. So Matt, he's coming at you. How do you respond, brother? Well, it's banned in the Bible for a reason, but it wasn't banned at first. And that's because God created us and he knew it was okay to do at first. And besides, what do you mean? It's okay. It's okay in the evolutionary model. <laughs> So, right. so it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay for you, but not okay for us. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> it's like when you start with two people, Adam and Eve, then for a few generations or after, you know, the, the world's not all puppies and rainbows. Yeah, for, for a few generations after, you know, the special creation event, well, what? You know, the, the, there's really no other, um, it, anything else you can do at that point. But as you've pointed out, the genetics, right? The genetics would have been more superior. Okay, inbreeding is a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species. Deleterious recessive mutations come to the forefront and they degenerate, they lead to disease, they lead to problems. But Adam and Eve created genetically heterozygous, as you've been talking about, Matt, with this pre-existing uh, beneficial diversity. Yeah, go ahead, brother. He's at my door. Okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, with this pre-existing beneficial diversity, you wouldn't have any deleterious mutations, disease-causing mutations in recessive form to come to the forefront. OK, but as time goes on, deleterious mutations accumulate in populations over time. So we have Moses in Leviticus, OK, showing once again, holy men speak as they're moved by the Holy Ghost, that the Bible is the word of God because it's accurate in all things, including science. OK, it's not a science textbook, but when it speaks on uh, scientific topics, guess what? It's always right. And so we see um, at the time of Moses and the law, um, Moses basically, as Matt pointed out, uh, banned ancestral relationships. 
And from a genetic standpoint, from a health standpoint, that makes sense because by that time, so many deleterious mutations would have accumulated that it would lead to what we see today. Disease, genetic degeneration, okay, inbreeding is, is not good. But with the evolutionary model, that's all they have is inbreeding. You go back to the, uh, and I'll just keep talking until Matt comes back. You go back to the out of Africa population bottleneck. Matt and I were talking earlier about how humans have low genetic diversity. Okay, that's consistent with our model. Thousands of years ago, God creates two people, Adam and Eve, and automatically that's going to restrict, uh, restrict genetic diversity. In the evolutionary model, you have a lot of genes floating around, okay? And uh, Matt, I just told him I'll keep talking until you come back, so I'll wrap up my point here. In order to explain the low genetic diversity in humans today, evolutionists look to what? a near extinction event in their out of Africa scenario where you have what? Severe inbreeding, incest, which shows us that this isn't even scientifically reasonable or plausible or logical because the evolutionary community explains all genetic diversity as being the result of mutations. So now contrary, okay, in, in difference to the creation model, you have all of these deleterious mutations that are just sitting there in recessive form, ready to be manifested to come to the forefront leading to rapid uh, genetic degeneration no it is the evolutionists that have an inbreeding problem so to the pale galilean you need to study your own you know story or fairy tale that that you claim to believe in and that's the problem matt with a lot of the evolutionists is they want to present challenges to the biblical creation model while not um while not understanding their own model or story. So here's a super chat comes in from Lou, $5. Appreciate it. He asks, how did the evolution community react to water being older than the sun? Like Genesis 1-1 explained. Oh my gosh. I can't sit down with some, some, someone ringing the doorbell. What's in the world's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it might be an atheist coming after you, Matt, after this uh, irrefutable pr presentation. <laughs> It's just ridiculous. I had nobody ever stops by. I it's just ridiculous. Yeah, that new research is pretty crazy. Um, I haven't heard a rescue device for it yet, but um, I do have a slide for that. Where are you? Ah, um, yeah, I don't know what they're gonna say because it doesn't make sense logically. But you, you see, what happens is they date, they base everything about their history on radiometric dating, right? So if we're if they're finding uranium that dates older than they anything, then they're they're gonna have to assume that oh, well, I guess water is older than the actual universe itself, which can't be true. It can't be there. Remember, one of the predictions that the uh, the universe coming from nothing. The states that, well, it did come from something. It came from magnetism. Magnetism was there, but nobody would ever say that there was water. You can't condense water that small. Water can't come from something that small. So just absolutely another, another ridiculous thing. Ah, someone's knocking, man. I got to go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll keep the audience occupied until... Uh, until they come back. So again, everybody, thank you so much for the questions, the engagement. Uh, you know, this is a comprehensive week defending Genesis uh, tomorrow. Okay. We will be back here for a couple more epic shows. I'm excited at five o'clock. We're going to have a two-parter all in one. So we're going to have John Mackay, the creation guy and Joseph Hubbard, two of my all-time favorite uh, young earth creationists. Uh, you know, the, these brothers are a blessing and um, they're, they're just so great at addressing uh, the challenges put forth by the evolutionary community. So we're going to have a two-parter. Joe Hubbard, he'll be uh, talking about dinosaurs in the Bible, um, everybody's favorite topic. And then we're going to be having uh, Doki Doki Bible Club says, the pizza delivery guy will not quit. Yeah, you know, if, if I wasn't uh, over here in Canada with Matt in uh, California, I would definitely uh, stop by for a couple slices. So uh, then we're going to have John Mackay, the creation guy, and he's going to be giving a presentation on the G illogic column. So he's going to be, uh, he's going to be refuting uh, deep time, and a lot of these arguments um, that are uh, anti-global flood, then I'm going to be giving a presentation uh, titled, you know, debunking the best ev uh, evidence for evolution. 
and I'll be focusing on um, pseudo genes, chromosome two fusion, nested hierarchies, endogenous retroviruses, ALU sequences, the fossil record, so on and so forth. So that should be fun. And then on Thursday, we have uh, two more presentations, one from Dr. Jerry Bergman. So he'll be here uh, giving a presentation on Darwin's blunders. And then we're going to be having our very own uh, flood researchers, Professor David McQueen, and also um, George Bond giving a presentation on amazing evidence for the worldwide flood. So hopefully Matt is okay. There was a, a knock at the door or his, uh, his doorbell went off. And I'm a little concerned because he did just give an irrefutable uh, presentation for over two hours that I am sure um, it was guaranteed to offend or trigger some of the atheists and evolutionists. So they may have uh, tracked him down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the R and Ra's of the world might not be too happy. So let's uh, keep our uh, fingers crossed that uh, Matt is okay and he'll be back with us shortly. So Born Again RN says uh, Matt got raptured. Yes, could be the case. Um, the scary thing about that is we've all been left behind. So unfortunately, we're not doing uh, something right. <laughs>There's a reason intelligent design isn't taught in our learning institutions. The legal staff of Freedom From Religion Foundation, a church-state watchdog group, has had remarkable success in convincing many institutions, such as school boards and town councils, that they are breaking constitutional law when they sponsor sectarian activities. That includes intelligent design. When the authorities can't be convinced, Freedom From Religion Foundation sues and it wins more often than not. Hey everyone, this is Mattman from Team Standing for Truth. I would like to welcome you to the channel and want to remind everyone to browse through all of the material that we have, going back for years. Are you looking for something in particular and can't seem to find it? Check the playlist section first. Lots of similar themed content is there still can't find it, click on the description box in this video and go to the official Standing for Truth website. There you can find a search box and type in anything you want and not only find the videos regarding the topic but our other content as well. We not only have books and videos and articles but even radio podcasts. We hope you enjoy our material and want everyone to be able to access our content easily. And if you have any recommendations, make sure to leave your comments below. And until next time, Matt Man is out.
And uh, Matt is back. Matt, we were worried that uh, some of the atheists tracked you down after this uh, epic presentation and uh, would force you to take it down so uh, <laughs> nobody else could watch it and get converted. So, <laughs> well, they wouldn't be doing too good right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong well, person to pick on in the community. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, okay. Actually, that's a good question, Cool Jesus. Uh, you know, there's several debates that I've always wanted to see happen. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to say, praise the Lord, I made them happen on this channel. A couple of those debates, well, the, the creation versus evolution debates in general, any of them are fun. So every single debate that we've done in the uh, evolution debate challenge series is just a dream debate because I have so much fun with those debates. Theology wise, I've always wanted to see for years, I've wanted to see uh, Matt Slick. Dr. Shabir Ali debate. We made that happen last year. That was epic. In the world of soteriology, I've always wanted to see, uh, you know, Bob Wilkin and Robertson Genis debate. We made that happen. And uh, we got an epic debate coming up between um, actually uh, Steve Christie, who's in the chat, Born Again RN. He'll be debating Robertson Genis on uh, the Marian doctrines. So we've hosted now about 220 debates on all sorts of topics, but we've never had a debate specifically on um the roman catholic doctrine of of you know the veneration of mary so that's coming up and that's going to be that's going to be pretty epic um and, and a couple of years ago as you know matt we had dr kevin anderson and jackson weed that was a technical debate that was a ton of fun okay so with that being said matt you're all uh, you're all recovered and we'll um we'll, we'll do a speed round here getting to the last final questions okay cool jesus asks and cool Jesus always has fantastic questions. So appreciate you being here in the live chat. And I know you'll be here tomorrow with uh, John Mackay and Joseph Hubbard. So cool Jesus asks, does Matt see a relationship between DNA and kinds? I don't understand how we can have so many kinds with one species like aardvark, red panda, African palm civet, dassy rat, etc. You would want to look and determine whether or not the same kind by looking at orphan genes. Orphan genes are a dead giveaway because they're taxonomically restrictive genes that are always mm. within the same family. So if you're ever in doubt and want to know like, hmm, are, are these, uh, are orphan genes, um, uh, over here? Do we see these? What is, uh, are they, are they, uh, are they definitely within this group? Are they, are they outside of it? That'll pretty much tell you because they're very, very uh, localized and they are based on function. They do a lot of transcription and they're very small genes. They're very short, so they should be easy to find. So that's one good way. And, but you always want to follow the lineages of autosomal. And then after that, you want to look to mtDNA and then best case scenario, the Y chromosome. Those will always trace lineages. All of the things outside of that are assumption based. So when you see these uh, things based on protein coding genes, they're always going to build a different phylogenetic chart. And we, that that's not how they're built. That, that, that's all made up. So don't even look at them like they're some type of hierarchy. It's not true. They're based on function. That's why there is genetic similarity. So like I said earlier, you know, if the hand grows a particular way, it's going to show a genetic sequence for that. That's why there is more similarity based on something having a very similar type of hand, but also how that hand is even formed. Okay. Yeah, th th that's a good answer. That's why we, um, I've made several predictions in this book <clears throat> and, and you've made several predictions as well, Matt. Um, it, it's the evolutionary community that assumes all DNA differences are the result of mutations over time, right? That's why they've erroneously concluded in the past. Now they have egg on their face that uh, DNA units like pseudogenes are you know shared genetic mistakes and now we know that they're necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell but uh you know these so-called you know quote unquote mutations that cross kind boundaries that form hierarchical patterns it's the evolutionists that assume those really are mutations and this is where um my predictions come into play in in my endogenous retrovirus handbook map and you've made some fantastic points and predictions on this as well that uh, where the evolutionists assume is, is a mutation that is shared, let's say in primates that, that forms a hierarchy, we're saying, no, this is not necessarily a mutation. If it's fixed for one, 
right? So where they say it's a shared mutation in an endogenous retroviral-like sequence between humans and chimpanzees, that means that it's fixed, okay? So we're saying, no, this is not necessarily a mutation. This could reflect design diversity. This could reflect the functional requirements of the respective organism. And that's where you've pointed out, Matt, if you could speak on this briefly. Um, if you were to subject these uh, DNA differences, let's say, or these specific um, DNA positions to mutations artificially, if they result in disease, right? If a disease manifests, what does that say about that, that specific, uh, let's say, DNA element? That would mean that it's uh, attached to probably some type of a function. Right. So a matter of fact, you know, if you're going to get a, a single nucleotide variance in a particular region and it, it causes a, a mutation that affects your liver, you go, oh, man, this this must do something in the liver that we don't know yet. It must have some beneficial function there because when it mutates, it affects your liver. Kind of like when we get a mutation in the Pax 6 gene and it affects your eyes. Before we would have ever known what the Pax 6 gene did, we would know that it has something to do with the eyes. Right, exactly. And one last thing I want to add, I'm going to be touching on this tomorrow. Matt, you constantly hear the evolution say, well, you know what, if there's, if God created distinct kinds, okay, what are the limits? What are the limits in this change? And as we point out, Matt, if God created original created archetypes, and then the arc archetypes, and they were heterozygous rather than homozygous, well, that means we get adaptive episodes, we get changes over time through what? shifts in heterozygosity, which is a state of more genetic diversity, to homozygosity, which is a state of lesser genetic diversity. So over time, the more shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity that occur, species hit walls because there's less allelic variability, okay, to be called upon for change. Doesn't that make that's genetic limits that God has front loaded into the original created kinds because there's all there's only so many shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity a creature can take isn't that right matt exactly and that's what we keep seeing we we watch a species form and every time that that species is formed there's less information that's there they can right. say oh well it'll roll back well it would only be able to roll back if it breeded with something else that was heterozygous again. But if it keeps losing and keeps getting more homozygous, that's why we run into the cheetahs today that are almost right. extinct. That's why conservationists exist in the world. How can you get how many? How come so many species are going extinct and conservationists keep trying to save them and without without much success? It's because if it was able to save them, we could. But they're losing them. We're losing them left and right genetically. That shouldn't be true if evolution's real. Right. The cheetahs have a lot of homozygous loci. Conservationists are worried about them. Their sperm is degenerate. They're down to like 7,000. Um, so cool. Jesus says, I understand what Matt was saying. My point of, uh, of tension is some kinds have lots of genetic diversity in brackets. There's more species within what we would say is the same kind. Let's yeah. say the felid kind, right? You've got what? Jaguars, tigers, lions, house cats. Uh, that we would say originated from a more heterozygous um, cat archetype where, where from those pre-existing DNA uh, differences, you get all the felid variations today. Same with the uh, canid. Uh, but some have little diversity, one species only. Maybe um, the platypus would be an example of that, perhaps. What are your thoughts on that, brother? Uh, yeah, I could... Um... There might be a limit based on what was on the arc. For example, we have cats and cats are very, very similar looking um, no matter where they are. The, you, if you get the bone structure of a cat, you can't even tell what species it is. You, there's almost no way. Even a specialist can't tell the difference. But we look at deer, our equids, and now they're very, very different. But yet they, they almost fill in the same ecological niches as cats. So it seems as though the deer may be because they were a clean animal and there were seven of them on the ark, maybe there was already more diversity on the ark is where a cat is an unclean. So only two of them were even on the ark. So they would have less genetic diversity as where an equid or a deer species, there's seven kinds on the ark. So there's already more genetic diversity in them. So when they fill up the earth, there's different phenotypic diversity. And you're like, wow, that's a deer. It looks like a little dog, right? It's because there was much more variety in them. So we would answer that by looking at the Noah story. And isn't it also going to be based on um, which kinds were taken in sevens versus, let's say, just two, right? 
but also um, history, population history, environment. Let's use Neanderthals as an, ex as an example. <clears throat> and I touch on this in great detail, Matt. You and I did a lot of brainstorming for the chapter on it in, in the special creation book. You have uh, possibly as small as two, like siblings that break off from a greater population that are basically the uh, ancestors of Neanderthals. So let's say you have a family of even four that break off and then they become isolated and they become inbred and they become very homozygous. Well, the population history and the environmental conditions that Neanderthals, a variant of humans, were subjected to would be different than other humans especially us as modern humans that originated from a subset of humans off of, off of, uh, out of Babel, right? Okay. So, so we have more variation within us. We have also, um, you know, managed to disperse in all parts of the globe where you have this isolated, unfortunately, group of, of Neanderthals that were subjected to harsh conditions. They became highly inbred. Their rungs of homozygosity are massive. So the point is that variant of human hit a wall basically and what they were subjected to may have resulted in in their extinction so wouldn't that be the same with a lot of these arc archetypes these arc kinds you know some of them go into more ideal environments they have uh more of a what you could say a, a healthy <laughs> uh, population history where other arc kinds unfortunately um may have uh gone into harsher environments that did not allow for the manifestation of that uh, pre-existing ability to, to diversify. Um, can you speak on that? Does that make sense? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we're going to have uh, species of all different kinds. Um, it's, and humans are no different. So always remember that we don't know exactly the amount of genetic diversity that was in Noah, but if he was only 10 generations after Adam, that's not a lot of time. And so massive amounts of genetic diversity would be in humans. And that is kind of what we see. Um, we, 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 when we even look in the fossil record, look, look at that massive genetic phenotypic differences, even in the skulls that we find. Right. And we're saying that, yeah, there are people, right. And wow, it's a lot of diversity. We have massive diversity even today. So our model best explains these differences. They explain why we're all so similar and yet uh, massive amounts of differences. And it explains the animals that we see. So I, that's why I really like the phenotypic diversity in comparison with the genetic differences, because the genetic differences are are uh, subjective based on time and environment and population size and where people live. There's a lot of variance, but phenotypic differences really kind of explain the discrepancies of evolution, especially when it comes to deep time. Because if you can turn a dog into a whale <laughs> in 1 million years, then what about all the other species that are identical that they've said live longer than a million years? Why, why is stasis everywhere? That's that, that should be the main question. Stasis millions of years in multiple species everywhere we look all in all the different animal uh, kinds and yet we see rapid change today right where species are a little bit different than the ancestor but very similar to the de degree right we find a crocodile it's a little bit different than the one in the ancient past yeah. but not that different not to the point where it's like oh that's totally different no there's stasis well and, and you know i think it's going to come down to as well a lot of your uh, arc archetypes moving into the new world, did they experience rapid and exponential population growth like humans, right? So some are kinds that experience rapid and exponential population growth. They would have had uh, more of their hidden reservoir of, of pre-existing heterozygosity basically being manifested in change. But other populations that went into, uh, you know, different environments that unfortunately, um, did not experience rapid and exponential population growth, they could lose very quickly the original uh, genetic diversity, right? Rather than other, other populations, I think. Um, uh, it's, definitely, it's, it's definitely a good question though and a lot to consider. So, okay, let, let me start wrapping it up with a couple more questions here. Michael Hu asks, has there been any similar observations for plant genetics? Are they capable of telling us specifics like, oh, no, no, we, we already did that one. Uh, right here, Alan. Has there been DNA found from Nephilim? Um, 
and I guess this is going to depend on one's position on, on what the film are. And if so, is it still found in, in uh, people today? That would be um, an argument based on uh, are the Nephilim uh, fallen angels or are they a different ge genetic line of human beings that were considered uh, a, a, a seed or yeah. uh, a remnant of a different people group? So if they were a genetic group of people, then it would be very hard to determine which, you know, which one it is. But yeah, they would be, there would be a haplo group. Now, remember, um, uh, there was ways to identify Nephilim in the scripture, right? There was six fingers. Well, that's a form of inbreeding called polydactyly and that we can see. Um, so we would need to find, you know, a lineage of people that all share that very similar thing and then find out what mutation was in them for that haplogroup. And that would identify exactly what they are. If they're angels, then that would probably set them apart from humans and they would definitely stand out. Now there's enough people out there watching ancient aliens and looking for that type of material that I, that would probably stand out as well by now. I, I don't keep up with that one, <laughs> but, right. uh, for right now, all we know is that when we trace the Y chromosome in humans and the mitochondria in humans, we just land on humans. We don't get an outward angelic source that seems to arise in one people and then vanishes. The only really strange thing in humans is RH negative blood, where the blood of the, usually people with red hair, white skin, they, they have a tendency where their blood will attack their own infant and kill them. That's a weird blood type that doesn't like what good sense is that. So it's a mutation that makes their blood very weird and unique. That's a good answer. Um, appreciate the question there, <clears throat> Alan. Yeah. So if one holds to the position, right, Matt, that basically, um, you know, the, the, the line of Seth and the daughters of men intermingling, you know, producing still humans and not um, some hybrid angel human offspring, then basically the DNA would, would just be human DNA. It's, it's not like we're really looking for some kind of angelic um, giant DNA, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, there'd yeah. be some, there would be one a lineage that we would find. We'd be like, you know, we'd test them and be like, wow, look at that. That's outside of the human range. Right. <laughs> Um, okay, let, let's do one last question because we just hit the two, uh, three hour mark and we got another show coming up quickly. So uh, Doki Doki Bible Club asks, Matt, have you heard of Aaron Ra's phylogeny challenge? If the answer is yes, you want to briefly talk about it and why the challenge has already been solved and answered. And then we're going to wrap it up. We're wrapping it up with this solid question. Yeah, his phylogeny challenge was something that existed for quite a while. And he challenged a creationist to name anything that God created. The problem with that is we can go back to Noah's flood and we can trace animals back to there. And we're still left with like, I think this is what was on Noah's Ark because we can't even be definitive on that. Meaning that let's say that a cave bear was on Noah's Ark. Well, a cave bear only lived for a few generations, maybe a thousand years and then died and went extinct. But we know it had offspring and we know that other bears existed exist. So we can't be certain if it was a black bear or a brown bear or the cave bear because that species that might have been on the ark could have gone extinct. So we can extrapolate based on mutation accumulation, which one it could have been. But and that's the best we can do. You know, I trace chromosome count and mutations. Those are the best, in my opinion. But if that animal, if that particular species of that animal family went extinct, we can't know exactly what was on the ark. Now, if we can just assume what was on the ark, we can't even guarantee that is the species that God made because you got to remember things were happening before the flood like they are now. So we just know that God sent Noah the animals that he chose. So did he choose a animal that would survive in the, today's world? Clearly. I mean, if the goal of Noah's Ark was for animals to diversify and fill the earth for mankind, it's, it's happened. It's everywhere we look. I mean, it, it, it worked. Noah's Ark survived it, but the, its purpose was served. Now to go past back past that. Well, we have to know that sure. Multiple bird families existed which ex exact one that's probably a lot easier to answer than what bear species see arn raw wants the fallacious exactly what species was it that's inference right that's going to the fossil record donnie and i like the fossil record to some degree but not much because it's so subjective we want to give you guys direct answers and it's very hard to directly answer exactly what species god made we could just say he made birds okay well that's useless you know what species of bird what species of bear did god make well right. we can guess but there's a lot of fossils 
that existed of bear species. So we would have to pick which one and just guess. We couldn't prove it genetically. We want to prove for you exactly. So you're up. All right. Great stuff, Matt. Great job. We just hit the three hour mark now. So we're going to wrap it up. Great endurance. Fantastic presentation, Matt. I really appreciate all the work uh, and study you put into uh, tonight's show. Uh, session three of our Defending Genesis Conference 2022. Uh, to everybody in the chat, thank you so much for all of your questions and uh, just for being so lively and engaged in the chat on this uh, important topic. There's nothing more important than uh, the origins debate and where you're going to spend uh, eternity. So just remember, it's a great time to be a young earth creationist and please share this around. Uh, the truth is important and critical thinking is also so uh, incredibly important. Matt, any last words, thoughts, brother? <laughs> no, I was just reading chat. There are funny comments coming. Through. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Always funny when an atheist shows up. They keep me entertained. They keep me entertained. So uh, again, lots of kind words. Thanks, Matt and Donnie. Excellent. Thank you, guys. You're the, you're, you're the life of the, and blood of this channel. You are what uh, makes these conferences that we do so, so much fun, edifying, and it makes us want to do more. So Carmine says three more hours. So Matt, you and I, we're going to go uh, refill our coffee. And apparently this was just an appetizer. Three more hours for you guys. We love you. So anyways, yeah, after the conference, Matt, you and I will get together and uh, we'll we'll do a part two of this for sure. We can consider this a sneak peek. Anyways, Matt, thank you so much, brother. All right. Looks like we are live again today. And I do want to uh, welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie B and I am your host. For tonight's Defending Genesis Conference session. This is day two, session four of our conference. I've got CJ Cox with me for an important presentation titled Countering Compromise. CJ Cox is a seasoned debater who has done a ton of study into this important topic. We've, uh, we've recently, CJ and myself, uh, finished a roughly four-hour series refuting the uninspiring compromiser, also known as inspiring philosophy. CJ is definitely well qualified to discuss this topic. He has had some major debates with many of them here on this channel on multiple topics. He's a very well, very well-rounded Christian apologist. He's a blessing, and uh, many of his debates have been specifically on the origins issue from scripture. For example, uh, debating old earth creation, theistic evolution, um, and so on and so forth. For example, CJ's debated um, Dr. Kenny Rhodes, Tyler Vela, you know, Robert uh, Rowe from Sentinel Apologetics, and of course, many more. So uh, with that, CJ Cox, how are you tonight? Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here and thanks for being willing to participate in our uh, Defending Genesis conference, brother. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm doing well. Thank you. And shalom to everybody in the live chat. Again, my name is CJ Cox. Um, run the YouTube channel, The Synagogue. Um, I appreciate all y'all being here because this is one of the more important topics I think that is not addressed. Um, you know, obviously those who are not on our side here, OECs and theistic evolutionists aren't unsaved because of their position. But this is one of those positions that if you start to actually examine it, if you get down to the nitty gritty, um, it does call the gospel into question. So it's important that we get this right. It's important that we get our understanding of scripture right. Uh, and it's important that we understand that we do have a, not just the ability to, but actually a mandate, a command to understand scripture prima facie or at a face value. Amen. Well said, uh, CJ. Uh, it, it's a privilege to have you a, a part of this Defending Genesis conference. Reminder to the audience, uh, it's it's a full week, five days, Monday to Friday, two shows a day uh, between 10 and 11 speakers. We started it all off yesterday at five in the afternoon with Sal Jardina. We uh, spent two and a half hours roughly on the relevance of Genesis and going over just amazing evidence for the worldwide flood. But then we had T-Rock here, who's done a ton of study into isochron dating and other dating duds. 
So he gave a fantastic presentation followed by a uh, discussion between uh, T-Rock and myself. And of course, we did three plus hours with Matt Naylor here from Standing for Truth Ministries, our very own Matt, um, on Genesis Genetics. Very, very thorough, tons of topics. Uh, we took some audience questions. And uh, so far, we're up to uh, seven plus hours in just a day and a half of this Defending Genesis conference, of course. Currently, we have CJ Cox here, who's going to be giving a very uh, a very comprehensive presentation on countering compromise. And uh, tomorrow, we will be back here at uh, 5 o'clock for a two-parter in one. So two in one, John Mackay, the creation guy, Joseph Hubbard. And uh, the first half is going to be dinosaurs in the Bible. Defending Genesis Conference isn't complete until you get some dinosaurs in there. And then uh, John Mackay is going to be giving a talk uh, on the G illogic column. And so I'm looking forward to that. We're going to make sure that one's interactive as well. There's a ton of information for uh, my brother CJ Cox to get through tonight. So this specific session is going to be mainly the presentation because this is such an important topic and CJ's got an awesome presentation ready to go for us. Uh, we'll probably do um, a speed round Q&A at the end. If anybody has questions, feel, uh, you know, feel free to tag me. And uh, we're just going to get right into it. We're going to get right into the fun. Again, uh, uh, this session's titled Countering Compromise. CJ Cox, my man, going to hand it over to you, brother. This is your show. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So let me give you guys a brief little bit of context as to how we're going to do this. So for, for forced, that's funny. First, I'm going to present you guys uh, a new slide, a new uh, PowerPoint here that I've made, putting forward the positive case that the Bible does actually teach uh, the different things associated with young earth creation, such as literal six days, 6,000 year history, all that kind of stuff. We'll even address the uh, flood a little bit. And then after that, what I'll do is we'll move on to a couple slides that some of you may have already seen in my countering inspiring philosophy videos that I did here with our brother Donnie, um, where we will actually take on what you would call the negative arguments, or in other words, go against the OEC and theistic evolution arguments that we see here. So it might end up being a while. I apologize for you guys if this keeps you up too late, but I think this is going to be very fun and have a lot of good information. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, let's get the screen shared here. So countering compromise, the Bible teaches young earth creation. Um, I thought I was being clever here. So I had a picture of a boxer who was doing a counter punch to another boxer. If you don't find that clever, that's perfectly fine. I'm not offended. But at any rate, this is what we are titling the presentation for today. Let's be absolutely clear here. This is compromising the scriptures. Now, I am not going to make any sort of a case today that the theistic evolutionist or the old earth creationist or even somebody like Tyler Vela, who's a non-concordist, um, is unsaved, unchristian, or in some way speaking damnable heresy, right? I am, however, here to tell you that, number one, this does, if you take it to its logical conclusions, bring the very gospel message itself into question. And number two, these texts or these uh, positions, excuse me, these positions on the text only exist because people want to compromise scripture with modern theories of science. And as a result, we can truly call this countering compromise. Uh, with all that, I want to just go ahead and jump into the position. I'll be basically reading word for word what I have here just to try and make it a little bit quicker. But obviously, sometimes we're going to jump off and talk about, you know, other little side trails and stuff like that for the purposes of your edification. But at any rate, let's just get right into this. So introduction, what are we doing here? What's the purpose of you watching this video? Well, OECs and theistic evolution proponents, before they can get to their scientific arguments, have to make the case that the Bible is compatible with these options, namely OEC or theistic evolution. In this presentation, I will be making the argument that these are in fact not compatible with the scriptures and that Genesis and the rest of these scriptures absolutely teach young earth creation, a global deluge, that is to say flood, and separate ancestry of species. We will start with the positive arguments for my position, then we'll move on to arguments against the old earth positions, uh, old earth positions, right? So not just old earth creation. Uh, we will only be considering biblical arguments for this presentation. So scientific arguments will not be presented, nor will they be responded to. 
For these arguments, I recommend you guys stay tuned for the rest of this wonderful Defending Genesis conference, and I greatly appreciate my brother Donnie for putting this on. So, in the beginning, what does Genesis teach? In this presentation, we will be attempting to demonstrate that the Bible teaches the following. Number one, six literal days of creation with humanity being created on day six. Number two, a literal Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. Number three, a literal chronology of around 1,950 years between Adam and Abraham. Number four, creation of separate unrelated kinds who produce only after their own likeness. Number five, a lack of any death before the fall. Number six, a lack of any carnivory before the flood. And number seven, a literal global flood. Before all this, we're going to start by reading the first chapter of Genesis. We are going to read it in its entirety, and it is not going to be the only text we read in its entirety today. So I hope you guys are ready for some scripture readings. Let me go ahead and actually, uh, and maybe I should have a way to do this a little bit quicker, but let me go ahead and get the text of Genesis 1 up here for you guys so that we can read that. So Genesis 1 here. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version, but you guys can follow along in most of your Bibles. I assume most people here are reading the King James, and we are going to have uh, the same text in this regard uh, throughout. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let, they be, let them, excuse me, be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the earth from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great creatures, excuse me, great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the seas, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you, excuse me, to you it shall be for food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. 
Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Keep everything we've read here in mind because it's going to be vital for the rest of our discussion here today. But obviously we wanted to read that in its entirety so we can get you guys the context of what's actually being said. And now let's go ahead and return back to the slides. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. We just saw plainly in Genesis 1, that Genesis 1, excuse me, reads as a literal six-day span of creation. It speaks of an evening-morning cycle, starting with evening because the Jewish day is rendered from sundown the previous day to sundown the next. It places the days in a numbered and sequential order, something that is only done in Scripture. Yes, only done, no exceptions, when the use of the word day is literal and not metaphorical in any way. And it gives us no obvious indication of a metaphorical or poetic use of the language. This becomes more obvious when one examines the beginning of Genesis 2 and the seventh day, which I have quoted here in yellow, if you guys can see that. Quote, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he had rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. What we find here is the rationale beha- excuse me, behind God's fourth commandment, the requirement to keep the Sabbath day holy. We see that God sanctifies and makes holy the seventh day because, quote, in it, meaning in the seventh day, he rested from all his work which he had made. We see this repeated in other passages of Scripture, and we'll see the next slide for that. First one being Exodus 20, verses 9 through 11, which reads thus. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice He blessed the literal seventh day, the literal Saturday in the week, because in it, meaning that Sabbath day, he rested from all his work, which he had made, implying that the creation week was, in fact, a literal week that actually ended on the seventh day. Next verse, Exodus 31, 16 through 17. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed, end quote. Notice again, God rests on a literal seventh day. It is in it, the it in this context is the seventh day of the week that God rested and ceased from all of his work. The only way to understand these things contextually is for us to understand that this Sabbath day is the literal seventh day of the week. He even refers to it as the nonspecific it, because the rest of the context has designated what exactly we're talking about, right? In other words, this can't be a seventh age. This can't be a seventh month or a seventh year or a seventh decade or a seventh millennium. This very clearly has to be a seventh day because according to the rest of the text, Genesis, Exodus, and even elsewhere, this is the very reason why the Sabbath day is considered to be holy. So we say here again, notice again that God rested the seventh day and, quote, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Why is the seventh day blessed? Because God rested on that particular day. Not a seventh age, not a seventh millennium, but the seventh literal day of the week. The entire purpose of observing a seventh day Sabbath is the fact that the seventh day of the week is the week, or is the day, excuse me, that the Lord rested. This informs us that the usage of the word day, which is yom in the Hebrew, in Genesis 1, is no doubt literal and intended to reflect six calendar days and not ages or anything else. We also see that Jesus saw these six days as, quote, the beginning. Mark 10, 6, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. We see here that according to Jesus, God created humans male and female, quote, from the beginning of creation. Now, this is a very important point because a lot of people will say, no, what he's actually referring to is the beginning of marriage or what he's actually referring to is the beginning of humankind. But notice that's not actually what the text of Mark says. It says, but from the beginning of the creation. Well, what's the creation? Well, it's the things that God created, of course. So from the beginning of the things which God created, God created human beings, male and female. 
This is not millions or billions of years later. This implies that our Lord understood the days to be literal and not metaphorical or poetic. To give you guys a sort of analogy, if I said that January 6th was the beginning of the year, nobody would question me. The sixth day of the year is close enough to the beginning that I am obviously using these words in a proper manner. But if I said May the 25th was the beginning of the year, or even worse, if we take the theistic evolution view, if I said December 21st was the beginning of the year, y'all would probably think I was abusing the language, right? Well, if you're going to add millions or even billions of years before this sixth day, that's exactly what you have to do. There's just no sense in which this sixth day is actually the beginning of creation. It's the beginning of the creation here, not because it's the literal first day, but because it's close enough to the beginning that in comparison, it's like the first 1% of the timeline, you know, as far as history has been concerned thus far. So to understand this in a metaphorical or poetic or otherwise non-literal way makes complete mincemeat, makes a pig's breakfast out of this text and renders it impossible to understand, at least in any meaningful fashion. We can move on after this then to Genesis 5 and 11, which we will end up reading in their entirety. The Bible tells us that six literal days took place around, that these six literal days took place around 6,000 literal years ago, or about 1,950 years before Abraham. Now, to give you guys a brief amount of context as to why Abraham is the anchor point here, um, obviously chronologies are a little bit self-referential. So for example, today is, uh, it's what is it, August... No, not August, September 6th, my apologies, Uh, 2022, right? 2022 means 2022 years after the birth of Jesus. Technically, he was born probably around 5 to 3 BC. So it's a little bit off, but you still get the anchor point there. It's supposed to be the birth of Christ, right? If you don't know that anchor point, then you don't know what it's 2022 years from. And in that way, you can see that our uh, calendar here is self-referential. If you have a different calendar, for example, the Assyrian calendar or the biblical calendar or something like that, what you have to do is anchor those calendars together by way of some kind of synchronism, right? So in the case of the Hebrew calendar, the synchronism we find is 586 BC. In 586 BC, the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, either 586 or 587, but those are obviously within a year of each other. Uh, And we're going to go with 586 BC just for simplicity's sake. Um, And at that point, you see a synchronism between the Babylonian calendar and the Hebrew calendar because that's when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. The Babylonian calendar synchronizes with the Greek calendar, which synchronizes with the Roman, which synchronizes with our own because the Roman calendar, otherwise known as the Julian calendar, is that which uh, directly predates the Gregorian calendar set up in 1582. And as a result, we get a nice, clean slate all the way back to 586. From 586, 586 BC, you can count backwards, taking into account certain chronological um, uh, what would you call that? Quirks, I guess. Um, the different kings of Israel until you eventually get to Solomon, who's going to reign around 966 BC. Solomon is said to, or he actually starts his reign about 970 BC. Solomon, Solomon is said to start the construction of the temple in the fourth year of his reign, 480 years after the Exodus, which puts the Exodus about 1446 BC. And the Exodus is said to be 430 years after the Abrahamic covenant when Abraham was 75. You find that in Genesis 12. And that puts the Abrahamic covenant in about 1876 BC. So now we have an anchor point of Abraham, roughly 1876 BC. And the Bible is going to count for us the other direction. It's going to take us from Adam all the way to Abraham. And now we have an idea of where Abraham is in our own calendar, right? So to demonstrate this, we're going to read the chapters 5 and 11 of Genesis. Not 5 through 11, 5 and 11. Which give a chronology of the lives of Adam through Abraham. We are also going to examine a nice, concise chart, which shows us the numbers in a more digestible format. Uh, And you guys have probably actually seen the chart before, but nonetheless, we will be examining it again. Let me go ahead and leave the screen share here, jump back to the Bible verses. I appreciate you guys for uh, for dealing with the jumping around here a little bit. Let's see, Genesis 5. And again, we are going to read this in its entirety. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. By the way, that word mankind is Adam in the Hebrew. Keep that in your little filing cabinet in your brain because it's going to be important later. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. 
So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years and begat Enosh. After he begat Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begat Canaan. By the way, that's not the same word as Canaan, the land of Israel, but that's a, another story. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalaleel. After he begot Mahalaleel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalaleel lived 60 and 5 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalaleel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalaleel were 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. And after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. Enoch lived 60 and five years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 185 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Fun fact for you guys, that is the longest recorded lifespan in scripture, 969 years. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. By the way, very brief language lesson for you guys, but the word Noah is actually Noah in Hebrew, and Noah means rest. So that's why he says, he called his name Noah, meaning rest, saying this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Back to the point. After he begat Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old and begot, no, uh, excuse me, and begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. My apologies. Let's go ahead and now jump to chapter 11. So we've seen these different numbers. If you're not following the numbers, that's fine. We're going to present them in a nice, concise chart here, but we want to demonstrate that the text actually says what we're claiming it says, which is why we're reading through these verses. Genesis 11 is then going to pick up on the groups that we just left up on, uh, left off on, excuse me, specifically with Shem, one of Noah's sons. This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. After begat Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and begat sons and daughters. Arphaxad lived 35 years and begot Salah. After he begot Salah, Arphaxad lived 403 years, begot sons and daughters. Salah lived 30 years and begot Eber. And after he begot Eber, Salah lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Another fun fact for you, Eber is where we get the term Hebrew. It is Ibri in the Hebrew. Uh, Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. After he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived after, uh, excuse me, Peleg lived 30 years and begot Ru, or Reu, excuse me. And after he begot Reu, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Reu lived 32 years and begot Serug. And after he begot Sarug, Reu lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters. Sarug lived 30 years and begot Nahor. And after he begot Nahor, Sarug lived 200 years and begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Nahor, uh, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And it's not necessary that we read the rest of this verse. You guys get the idea there. So now let's go back to the text and we'll have a nice concise chart that'll put all those numbers together for each other so that you guys know exactly what was being said. CJ, um, yeah. everything is going great. There is a couple people in the chat. I've noticed it, but I just figured maybe there's nothing we can do about it. But unless it is something that, that you're cognizant of, there's a little bit of popping noise going on when you speak. Um, it's pretty, it started off just being once in a while, but now it's, it's pretty consistent. Um, but I mean, we can still hear what you're saying, but just in case I wanted to at least bring that to your attention, maybe let's do an audio test right now, brother. Let's check it out. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, here, I'm going to put this a little bit closer because that's obviously what this is supposed to avoid. Uh, testing, testing, sounding good at all? Um, yeah, I mean, you can still kind of hear the popping, but I'm thinking it might just be something we're going to have to uh, deal with because you do have your external mic. Everything looks set up correctly. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what the issue is. We could still hear you, but... Um, yeah, let's have you continue, and then we'll see if it improves. Um, and let me see if your echo cancellation is on. Um, okay, let me try. I'll click your automatically adjust mic volume. Okay. And okay, let's let's try it out. We'll get back to your presentation, um, and we'll see. Hopefully, that improved it. All right, I appreciate that, and I appreciate any of you guys who are dealing with this regardless because um, I know that can be annoying sometimes. Um, so definitely want to give you guys your appreciations there. So let's pull this up here. You're All right, good. so we just... For sure. Sorry about that. Uh, so we just read Genesis 5 and 11 and went through the 1,950 years that separate Adam from Abraham. This is a nice, concise little chart that actually shows you those side by side so that you don't have to sit there and do all the math for yourself, right? 130 years, then you get Seth. 105 years, then you get Enos. 90, then you get Canaan, so on and so forth until you continue. To CJ, I'm so sorry, brother. I just wanted to let you know, it sounds like it improved. It sounds really good. So whatever we did, you put it close to your mouth, uh, closer to your mouth too. So everything's sounding great, brother. Okay. Uh, so go ahead. You're good. Awesome. Fantastic. I appreciate that. Um, so, so with the chart here, we see that this is obviously the point of creation, or we might call it zero, right? And from the point of creation to the flood, you have 1,656 years. That was the first portion we looked at in Genesis five. And then the remaining years there, which is, uh, I think it's going to come out to 294, uh, roughly 900 or 1,950 years to separate creation from Abraham. Now, remember, we just went back. And I, I was telling you guys how we actually get to know Abraham's 75th year, which would be roughly 1876. So you can go ahead and subtract now 75 years, to put you at 1951 BC for his birth date. Put a circa on that, which is that little lowercase c, um, so that you know that this is general, right? We're not being super dogmatic about it being 1951 and not 1953, right? But you get the general idea. It's 1,950 years from this point. In fact, we'll just round down to 1,950 uh, BC and then add our 950 there. That puts our creation uh, port, uh, period here at roughly, give or take, about 3900 BC. Uh, different chronologies will render this a little bit different because there are certain chronological slips that you have to deal with, one of which is actually called generational slip. You can potentially lose a year for each generation you're speaking of. Uh, there's also different co regencies in the reigns that you have to worry about. There is 100 years on seven different patriarchs. Uh, before the flood in the Septuagint version. So the long and short of it is you can get anywhere from about 3,900 BC for your creation period here to around 5,000 BC for your creation period here as well. But notice that both of those give us a very short window of time. And according to the counting that we just did, it would actually be close to the 3,900 BC. You've probably seen the year 4,004 BC used. That was originally published by a man by the name of James Usher, who was doing basically the same thing we're doing now, taking the numbers literally, counting backwards from a fixed date, and eventually arriving at the position that we've gotten at. So what that means then is the creation moment is roughly this short amount of time from, like I said, 1950 BC, and it puts us around 3,900, 4,000 BC for a creation. So we see the scripture very clearly teaches us a literal six days. We also see that it very plainly teaches us a literal 6,000 years of history. You take your 4,000 or 3,900, whatever you choose, uh, and then add the 2,000 years that we currently have since the birth of Christ. That obviously gets you to around 6,000 years of planet Earth. And that's just strictly taking the text. We haven't gotten any sort of outside sources, no radiometric dating or anything like that, right? If you just take the text for what it says, the six literal days took place roughly 6,000 years ago. And we've seen that very plainly through these scriptures. We also see that the scriptures discuss creation after his kind, it says, right? In other words, the Bible does teach separate ancestry. 
the way I put it here, the Bible plainly teaches that creatures were created separately and are not part of one continuous evolutionary lineage. Here we have a couple of quotes that we've actually already read, but we're going to go ahead and read them again. Genesis 1, 11 through 12 reads, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields fruit according, or excuse me, the fruit that yields, sorry, the tree that yields fruit, my apologies, and the tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the herb, earth brought forth uh, grass. Messed myself up when I messed up earlier. Uh, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Again, that's Genesis 1, 11 through 12. Notice here that the plants are created and they have seed within themselves that produces after their own kind. Now in a separate creation event that's within the creation week, we get the creation of animals. Actually two separate creations. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heaven. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. That's Genesis 1, verses 20 through 21. Next we see, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good, Genesis 1, 24 and 25. Notice these. God does not form one kind into another. For example, he doesn't take the reptiles and from them shape a bird, which is actually one of the different things that the evolutionists try to teach us, right? They try to say that, well, the T-Rex or whatever uh, dinosaurs is, is the main point, evolves into what we today call birds. They even call predatory birds raptors, right? And the idea is supposed to be that these birds are actually now like a subclade of reptiles rather than being their own separate clade. But notice God does not actually form one kind into another. Notice also that each kind is said to produce after his kind and not produce an ever evolving seed. To put it pithily, dogs produce dogs, produce dogs and never foxes. Some people might say that foxes and dogs are the same original kind, but as of right now, we, we classify them as separate genus of vulpus and canis. So dogs produce dogs, produce dogs, never foxes. If they turn out to be the same kind, just replace it with cats or jaguars or chimpanzees or something. You get the idea, right? The point is God creates each kind one at a time, right? So he creates the plants. He then creates the uh, sea creatures and the, and the birds. He then creates the land creatures, which, by the way, that in and of itself is going to directly contradict what we have in our modern evolutionary theory, because reptiles are land creatures and they are coming after the birds. Also, it is said that birds come after the land creatures, which themselves evolve from the sea creatures, but the birds are actually created in the Bible the same day as the sea creatures, right? So this is not compatible with the, cert with the uh, current chron uh, chronology that modern day scientists try to put forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moving forward to the next slide here. We also see that the Bible teaches a literal creation of two first human beings. Here we have the first Adam. Scripture plainly teaches that Adam was the first man, that his wife, whose name is Eve, was the first woman. 1 Corinthians 15.45 reads, So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam a living, a life-giving spirit. Excuse me. Two verses later, we see the first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. And this is both of these texts are calling upon Genesis 2, 7, which reads thusly. And the Lord God formed man, which is in Hebrew, Adam, again, of the dust of the ground. Uh, by the way, the word dust is Adama, which is where you get that word Adam, but nonetheless. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Again, that's Genesis 2, 7. So we see here that the first man is identified as Adam, the very same Adam who lived 1,950 years before Abraham, per the chart that we just consulted. We also see that his being the first man is incredibly important to Paul's greater theological point here, stated more clearly a few verses earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. This is very important. No first Adam means no second Adam. Anybody who knows how to count above a third grade level, or in, in fact, even above a preschool level, is going to know that two comes after one. 
I don't say this to be insulting. I say this because this is an incredibly important point. If one was not actually literally the first Adam, then the two is not actually the second Adam, right? In other words, the entire theological point that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 15 falls apart if Adam is not actually the first man. And we're going to see that amplified much stronger when we start to talk about death before the fall. This directly compromises the gospel. Our sin debt is canceled out by our kinsman redeemer, who is Jesus Christ, who has to be our kinsman because the sin debt was added by Adam. If Adam did not actually add the sin debt, if he's not really the first man, if he's not really the first to die, well, if death doesn't enter in through him, I guess Abel would have died first, but you get the part, you get the idea, then we have no reason to believe that the gospel has an efficacious message. We just simply don't. And this is per Paul's own argument. Remember, Paul is an apostle and a prophet of our Lord. Moving on to the next slide here. Genesis 3.20 reads, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Here we see that Eve is said to be the mother of all living, and that this is the very reason for her name. In the Hebrew, the word is Chava, and its meaning is literally rendered as life, right? Oh, excuse me. I got an itch here on my nose. Um, this name makes little to no sense if G Genesis 3.20 is meant to, is not meant, I have a typo there, is not meant to be read literally. The same can be said of Adam's own name. The Hebrew word Adam is translated as man or human being, meaning we as a species, as far as the Hebrews are concerned, are named after this figure who is shown to us in Genesis. For comparison, Arabs are referred to, biblically speaking, as Ishmaelites, because Ishmael is said to be the first Arab. Would it make sense to refer to Ishmaelites as Ishmaelites if, say, Terah, Abraham's father, was in fact the first of the Arabs? Of course, it would not. The very reason for the name Ishmaelites is that Ishmael is the first Arab. Likewise, the very reason for Adamim, the plural of Adam, is that Adam is the first human. We are named after him. Quite literally, if you speak Hebrew, then a human being is referred to as an Adam, right? Not a man, by the way. The gendered term is Ish. That's how you would refer to an adult male, right? Uh, you could also say Zakar for male, which is just generally male. It's not uh, male or female as far, or excuse me, it's not um, adult or child, uh, which is separated by the terms Ish and Yeled. But nonetheless, he uses the word Adam here, and Adam is then therefore used as the word for all of humankind. So it's almost as if the first human's name was human. And since his name was human, we are all called human. Obviously, this is in the Hebrew, so his name is Adam, but you get the idea. This name makes absolutely no sense if he's not actually the first human in the same way that the name Ishmaelites makes no sense if Ishmael is not actually the first Arab or that uh, Levites makes no sense if Levi is not actually the first Levite or the Davidic kingdom is not uh, the Davidic line, you should say is uh, something that makes no sense if David is not actually the first king in the Davidic line, so on and so forth. There's a reason why we're called these things. There's a reason why in the scripture they are called these things. And it applies not only to Adam's own name, but also to Eve's name as well. Our species is called Adamim or humans because Adam is the first human. Likewise, Eve is called Hava because she is the mother of all living. She is the one who is given all Chaim or life, right? not in the sense of God, obviously, but in the sense of a mother. You guys get the idea. These names are complete and total gibberish if this text is not actually speaking literally. Moving on to the next slide. I hope I'm not rushing too fast for you guys, but I still have a lot to get through, especially since we're going to be jumping off to another slide and even a few more scripture readings. Next, we see in Adam all die. Was there death before Adam? The Bible plainly says no. In Genesis 3, we read thus, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, notice, because you have heeded the voice for your wife. In other words, what's following is a result of you heeding the voice of your wife. What did he do in heeding the voice of his wife? He partook of the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So you could shorten this by saying, Because you partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the following is going to happen. Have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, meaning it wasn't cursed before then. Remember, because you have done this, these are the results. If these are the results, it follows that these did not happen before you had done the thing. 
right? That's the basic rule of cause and effect. If I hit a baseball and because I hit the baseball, it went out of the park, then obviously my hitting the baseball precedes the baseball going out of the park. The baseball would not have been out of the park if I had not first hit the baseball. See what I'm saying? It's basic rules of cause and effect. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you shall return. You notice I've highlighted that phrase. For dust you are and unto dust you shall return. That's because for the purposes of what we're trying to explain here, we could shorten this verse to include the first highlighted portion and the second highlighted portion. There's actually three verses, 17 through 19, but nonetheless, we could say for the purposes of making the point, because you have heeded the voice of your wife for dust, you are and to dust, you shall return. In other words, because you have partaken of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, you're going to die, right? This is the very plain meaning that we see here in Genesis 3, and it is repeated elsewhere in the scriptures, most especially by Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. The same chapter, by the way, that we were just referencing earlier, where Paul is making this argument as to why our Redeemer is a kinsman Redeemer and not just simply a Redeemer. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. I want to pause here before we go to the other verse, verses. Number one, by man came death. Which man? Obviously, Adam. We just read, because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, these things shall happen. And one of those things is returning to the dust from whence we came. So in Adam, all die. But notice, because Adam is a man, and because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is also a man, hypostatic union, fully God, fully man, because of these things, by man came death, but also by man comes the resurrection of the dead. Now, here's the problem. If by man death does not come, then Paul's argument that by man the resurrection comes doesn't follow. You see what I'm saying? And this is why this is such an important thing for us to harp on. People don't like the fact that we refer to them as compromisers, but in fact, there's nothing else we can refer to them as. I mean, no disrespect to my old earth friends, to my theistic evolution friends. Some of them are some of the people I admire most. Dr. Hugh Ross is a brilliant astrophysicist. And I think some of his works, for example, on aliens and stuff like that is fantastic. Rob Rowe, personal friend of mine. Love the guy very much. Plenty of other examples we could give. Tyler Vela, I think, is one of the wisest philosophers online. But they're all wrong. And they're all compromising the gospel, even if they don't realize that they're compromising the gospel, even if they don't accept and go down the logical pathways and as a result fall into heresy, they are still compromising the gospel. Paul's entire argument in 1 Corinthians 15 is that because death came through this fall, because death came through man, our first priest, our last priest, also a man, negates all that and gives us resurrection of the dead. Moving on to Romans 5, 12, also Paul reading, or Paul writing, excuse me. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Notice again, he says, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. There was no sin before Adam. There was no death before sin. If Adam comes before sin and sin comes before death, then it follows that Adam comes before death. And again, this is fundamental to the point Paul is trying to make, such that if you deny this, you do compromise the scriptures. And by the way, a lot of the old earthers know this. You notice a lot of old earthers got incredibly angry a couple of years ago when William Lane Craig denied that literal that a literal Adam was actually a fundamental part of understanding scripture. Well, the reason they did this isn't because they hate William Lane Craig. The reason they did this is because they recognized William Lane Craig is fundamentally undermining the gospel, whether he realizes it or not. Likewise, they also are fundamentally denying and undermining what the gospel is putting forward. Paul lays it out plainly in his very own arguments here. He says it again in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Wages of, go go to your work work, you get your wages. Your wages are therefore a result of your work. So the result of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we see here in Genesis and in two different books that Paul wrote himself, 
that death enters into the world by way of sin through Adam. That means there is no death before Adam. And again, this is a fundamentally important piece to our understanding of scripture, to our understanding of the gospel message. I have another slide here that is titled, This is Very Important. Again, we find this is crucial to Paul's Paul's arguments on redemption. If through Adam all die, then through Jesus all live. And if in Adam death is not brought to bear through the fall, then there's no reason to suspect all in Christ will live on. Our redemption is needed because Adam has fallen, and this is not an issue we can compromise on. Again, it doesn't mean that your old earth brother or sister is not a Christian. It doesn't mean they're damned. It does mean that they're kind of adopting what we might call heresy light. I'm going to take a brief detour to explain what I mean by that. So the guy who started the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, believed a doctrine known as consubstantiation. To make a really long story short, he believed that the wafer, and Lutherans to this day believe that the wafer is literally the flesh of Christ and that the the wine is literally the blood of Christ when you go to take your communion. The standard argument against this from Protestants has been that you are essentially uh, crucifying Christ afresh and that you are effectively turning each individual communion into a new sacrifice of Jesus, thus negating the statement once and for all sacrifice, right? Now, Martin Luther would not have made those jumps. And as a result, we can say that Martin Luther was not adopting damnable heresy, even though what he believed implied damnable heresy. This is what we could refer to as heresy light. Heresy light would be when you believe something that if taken to its logical conclusion does in fact negate the gospel message, but because you don't take it to its logical conclusion, you yourself can be said to not be a heretic and not be outside of the faith. The old earth creationists and theistic evolutionists are in the same boat as those who would believe consubstantiation in this regard. If they take their beliefs to their logical conclusions, then we do not actually have a kinsman redeemer who died on the cross. The thing is, most of them don't. And because most of them don't, which I believe is the grace of the Holy Spirit on their lives, we can still have fellowship with them even if we are not able to compromise even an inch on this particular point. Had to make that brief aside because a lot of people wonder why is it that we can be so strong on this and say we refuse to compromise but also welcome these people as brothers and that is why it's that heresy light kind of idea. Moving on. The flood. Was it global? Ignore what we have posted right here for a moment because we're going to read the entirety of Genesis 7 before we read what you have in front of you. The Bible plainly tells of a flood that is global. To demonstrate this, we will read Genesis 7 and then read of the Noahic Covenant, which is what you have posted below. Let me go ahead and pull up Genesis 7 for you now. CJ, got to say, fantastic work so far, brother. Tons of great points, very informative, and uh, this presentation will give the Bible compromisers nightmares till the rapture. So good job, brother. (laughs) I appreciate that tremendously, my friend. Um, And the rest of you guys as well, I appreciate if you're enjoying this. The entire purpose of this is edification to the body and the glorifying of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if I am not successfully doing that, or if I am successfully doing that, regardless of which, I covet your criticisms, please do let me know. Um, And and the the same, of course, goes for you, Brother Donnie. I greatly appreciate you uh, letting me know this is, in fact, edifying for you guys. So let's jump real quick to Genesis 7. We are going to read this entire chapter. Um, If you guys want to follow along, of course, certainly do so. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two of each, uh, uh, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. By the way, one thing I kind of noticed about this. So a lot of people, when they do the numbers for the ark, um, they'll do seven pairs of animals, which would have actually be 14 animals to fit them onto the ark. Right. I actually don't think that's necessary. This is a brief aside, but I just want to point out, if I'm reading this correctly, it's seven individual animals, which would be three pairs and an extra. And the reason I think that's the case is because it says, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal and then two each of animals that are unclean. Well, those two are male and female. They're not two pairs. So those seven, when they'd logically, I think, be three males, 
three females and one extra, either male or female, whatever it happens to be. Brief aside, but I think that helps us when it comes to trying to fit these numbers in. Like how many? How is it that all these creatures could fit on the ark? Well, you've already doubled the amount of clean animals if you're counting 14 rather than seven. But I digress. Also, seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. That is actually a mistranslation. The word is seed. That's important because the Bible recognizes that birds carry seed and thus the birds being on the earth in greater numbers than everything else actually does help the plant life to grow after the global flood. But at any rate, let's keep moving on. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. Notice here, all living things that I have made, not all living things that live in the Mesopotamian region. Not all living things that live in the Middle East. Not even all living things that live in the Old World, which would include all of Africa, all of Asia, and all of Europe. No, all living things that I have made. Question, are penguins a living thing that God has made? Are dingoes a living thing that God has made? Are kangaroos a living thing that God has made? Koalas and those little blue frogs that live in Brazil. Yes, 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 and yes. But moving on. And Noah did according to all the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark of Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep were broken open and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two of all flesh in which is the breath of life. Notice, of all flesh of all flesh in which is the breath of life. Do penguins breathe? Yes, they do. Do kangaroos breathe? Yes, they do. What's the purpose here? This is not saying all the creatures that live in the Mesopotamian region. It is clearly saying all the creatures which live, period. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those that entered male and female of all flesh, all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Now, a lot of people would like to read that as all the high hills under the portion of the sky that actually covers the Mesopotamian region. But of course, that doesn't make any sense at all, because that's just not what the text says. It says all of the high hills under the whole heaven. Is Hawaii under the whole heaven, friends? Of course it is. Now, whether or not Hawaii was actually there before the flood or whether it split off as a result of the flood, I'm not here to discuss that again. This is not the scientific arguments. The point is just to say, though, Hawaii, Australia, Antarctica, all these places are under the whole heaven, meaning the sky. The, the Hebrew word is shamayim, the sky, space, and the place you go when you die can all be referred to as shamayim or heaven. But nonetheless, under the whole sky is what this would read as. Well, that would be the entire earth. The sky covers the entire earth, right? The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered. That's another very important, important point because what he is essentially saying here is that 15 cubits, which if I understand correctly is 45 feet, I think a cubit is roughly the same as a yard. I uh, could be wrong about that, but regardless, uh, at least this 15 cubit portion, the mountains are actually submerged by that much. Now, man, I wish I actually brought an example for you guys. Uh, if you were to take a pool, right? And you have, or maybe even a fish tank would be better because you have stuff in the fish tank. You know, you got your little boat there. You got your little uh, coral reef design plastic thing for your fish and all that kind of stuff, right? And you pour the water in 
Well, in order for everything there to be covered, the water has to be leveled at some point, right? It's just the nature of water. In other words, it doesn't see the mountain here and then cover that up and then kind of flow down like a, like a hill or something like that, right? No, it actually all stays level. That's the very nature of water. So in order for these mountains to be completely covered, then what we need is for a level surface of the water across the face of the entire planet. Otherwise, the high hills are not going to be covered by 15 cubits. It's just simply not the way that water works, right? Another way you could try this is just by putting water in your bowl. Once it gets to that edge, it's going to start pouring out, right? And then it's going to continue to pour out up until it finds, again, a level, uh, a, a, a um, level of height where it can actually be leveled out and flattened, right? Flattened. Don't take that too literally, flat earthers. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. Notice, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. All that was on dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth, excuse me, 150 days. So this text is as clear as any text could possibly be. All flesh died. All men died. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. 15 cubits over, uh, upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. It could not possibly be clearer if it tried. And in fact, this is one of those portions where you could actually ask the question to your old earth friend, how could God have communicated a global flood if he wanted to, if he didn't in fact communicate a global flood in Genesis 7? There is no possible way to understand this if you're not understanding it to be a global flood. But nonetheless, let's go ahead and get back to the, uh, excuse me, the PowerPoint here. This will actually be the last slide of this PowerPoint before we move on to the next portion of the uh, PowerPoint. Go ahead and do that. All right. So next we're going to read about the Noahic Covenant. And it reads thus, and starting at verse number 8 of Genesis 9, and it's right here in front of you in the, in the gold here. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. We'll return to that. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. I want you to understand this language again. It, it is being so exhaustive that it's impossible to understand it another way. All living creatures of every kind on the earth. I don't know how you could possibly get more straightforward and clear than that. Again, I would ask our old earth friends, how could God have communicated that this was meant to be every creature in existence if he did not in fact communicate in Genesis 9 that this was every creature in existence? So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Now, I told you we were going to return here to this portion, right? He says, never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Now, if we're a young earth creationist who believes in the global flood, this is fairly easy to understand. He wiped out all the creatures, save for those that were on the ark, and he's not going to do that ever again, at least not by way of water, right? If you're an old earth creationist or a theistic evolutionist, this becomes a lot more difficult for you to understand. Why? Well, because he's not actually saying all human life. And one of the primary responses you're going to get from the old earth or the theistic evolutionist is something along the lines of, well, what he means is he won't destroy all of humanity again. And this argument does have a couple of steps before you get here. But basically, the idea is 
The theistic evolutionists, the old earth creationists will concede that humanity was only in a, a limited amount of areas. They hadn't colonized the entire world, in other words, uh, or settled in the entire world, I guess. It technically wouldn't be. Oh, CJ, I think you uh, froze on me, brother. Um, if that's the case, maybe uh, let me know in the audience if that's just myself. No, it looks like he's frozen, which is fine. We'll wait for him to uh, come back in. Uh, Matt N., uh, Young Earth Creation in the chat. Good to see you, brother. Fantastic presentation earlier. So, um as we wait for CJ to restore his connection, uh, let me, uh, I just got a notification from him. His computer shut down and he will be back in just a second. So uh, consider this a break time. This has been a heavy presentation with lots of information uh, refuting biblical compromise and upholding the uh, truth of origins as given to us in in the scriptures, in the Bible. So earlier in this uh, Defend Defending Genesis conference, we had uh, Matt N. from Saying for Truth Ministries here, my fellow partner in crime. We love uh, genetics, the best way to answer this question of ancestry. He gave a fantastic presentation, highly informative comprehensive. And um, that was about three hours. So today is day two. We're currently in session four. Uh, yesterday we had T-Rock give an important presentation on the isochron method. Um, a lot of your more militant critics of young earth creation and defenders of deep time evolution, they've looked to the isochron dating method as, you know, in their minds, irrefutable proof of um, an old earth. And uh, T-Rock did an amazing job tackling that argument. And of course, uh, Sal Giardina, uh, he's very knowledgeable. He's a professional geologist, well-trained, well-educated. He uh, kicked us off this week with a, a an important presentation, a must-watch presentation, the relevance of Genesis. And just in time, the superstar, the man of the night is here, uh, CJ. Uh, we consider that a little break, but uh, glad to have you back, brother. And uh, let's just kind of get right back into it, man. Good job so far. Thank you. And uh, sorry about that, friends. I um I forgot to make sure my computer was plugged in, so it actually just died momentarily. But we're all good. Everything's back up. <laughs> awesome. No worries. Awesome. No worries. So... To get back to where we had left off, we were talking about this little portion here. Uh, Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Now, typically what the old earth or the, uh, the uh, theistic evolutionists will argue at this point is that uh, all humanity was confined to a certain geographical location. And so all of humanity was wiped out by this flood, sans Noah and his family. And so that's what he means by never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. The problem with this is he doesn't say all human life, and the context does dictate to us that he's talking about all creatures. How do we know? Well, let's read that context again. Every living creature on earth is who he makes the covenant with. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. So, in order for us to take the theistic evolution perspective, in order for us to take the old earth creation perspective, we must uh, uh, make the argument, which in my opinion is mind-boggling, that all life was confine confined to a small geographic location that is within the Mesopotamian region. Which, they always like to say, well, how did penguins make it to Australia? Well, I have a different question. What are penguins doing in Mesopotamia on your model? Right? That's not where penguins are from. Now, again, I'm not here to, to comment on how the geography was set up before or after the flood. Uh, those are conversations for other people who are worrying about the scientific aspect of this uh, countering or of this defending Genesis conference, right? Of which there are plenty of absolutely phenomenal speakers. I recommend you guys continue to watch this. But the point is just to say this covenant is very plainly between God 
and every living creature saying he will not do what he had done in Genesis 6 through 8. So if what he had done is only a localized flood, well, I'm sorry, friends, God is a liar. And every time you see the rainbow, you actually have evidence that we can't trust him, right? Now, I don't believe that, of course. Uh, nobody here in, in the Defending Genesis Conference is going to believe that. That's why we're defending Genesis, right? But that's what the old earth creationists would have to concede, even if they don't ever make the mental ascent to that concession there, right? It says, this is the covenant between me, you, and every living creature on the earth, I will no longer destroy all life as I have done. That means he is never going to wipe out not only all human life, but also all animal life. The covenant is with them also in the manner that he has done, namely this flood. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been tons of localized floods that have just absolutely decimated regions. Some of these localized floods have even brought animals to near extinction. You can think of the many Yellow River floods in China where thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions, if reports can be believed, have passed away and perished, right? You can think of the Ohio River flood that happened here in the United States just in the 1930s or 40s. I can't remember exactly the year, but a devastating flood uh, that just wiped out a whole swath of the American population, thousands of people dying, right? Uh, you can think of the great tsunami of 2005. How devastating was that? Hundreds of thousands of people in India and in Indonesia and in Africa and in Indochina, otherwise known as Southeast Asia, being removed from this planet. Massive floods, right? Well, according to the old earth understanding of this covenant, those shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't have God doing what he did previously, namely having incredibly devastating localized floods, right? Some floods that, like I said, have even brought animals to uh, extinction or near extinction. If you take the young earth creationist perspective, no harm, no foul. God said he would never wipe all of them out with a flood again. He gave us the rainbow to demonstrate that. And he never has wiped all of them out by way of a flood. In other words, God has kept his word. And again, this is another one of those spots where it's kind of dicey. Yes, the old earth creationist can be said to be a Christian. Yes, the theistic evolutionist can be said to be a Christian. But whether they recognize it or not, they are playing with blue fire. Those of you guys know the old cliche, the blue fire is hottest. These guys are not playing with the red stuff, hot as that may be. They're playing with the blue stuff. Calling God a liar, saying that the that the first Adam isn't literal or that death doesn't enter in through sin. This is the hot fire. In fact, this might even be the white fire to make the analogy a little bit hotter, pun totally intended. Now, we're going to leave this for just a second. Now we're going to make some of the, quote, negative arguments, that is to say, arguments against the view the old earth creationist or theistic evolutionist will present. So now I'm going to share you guys a different screen or a different uh, PowerPoint, excuse me. Some of you guys have already seen this PowerPoint, but we're not going through this entire PowerPoint. We're just going to go through some of the main arguments. Uh, but this is the same PowerPoint I used in our uh, IP's Top 10 Biblical Reasons Debunked. Right. And CJ, just to let the audience know, I do have that entire series, nearly four hour series in the description box of this video. So anybody uh, new to this channel, anybody uh, new to this content, please do uh, check that out because it is a must watch series. So uh, anyway, CJ, back to you, brother. Thank you. And but and I not to toot my own horn. It's all to the glory of God, but I, I did very much like that. So I would certainly recommend those as well. Um, in, in my own personal opinion, that was amongst the most comprehensive work I've ever had the great privilege to do. Um, so there are a couple different objections the old earther and the theistic evolutionists will bring up, and we're going to go ahead and examine a couple of those, a couple of those here today, right? Um, so first one, let me go ahead and Click here. Let's see. Um, this here. Genesis 3.22 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. And the claim is that the verse implies that humanity was not created immortal. Rather, we were made immortal by eating the fruit from the tree of life. Now, the objections to this are numerous, and some of it is going to involve stuff that we've already read. But nonetheless, 
we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible here. First off, the claim does nothing to dissuade from the idea that the Earth is young, or that evolution is false, or that humans were immortal before the fall. It simply claims to explain the how of humanity's immortality. This would be roughly analogous to arguing rain does not fall from the sky because clouds contain water from which we get rain. In the self-same way, the above claim does not argue against the idea that humanity was immortal, but simply attempts to explain how humanity was immortal. Those are very different things. However, was there death before the fall? Well, these are the same three verses I just quoted for you guys, but let's go ahead and read them again. The other issue at play here is that the Bible elsewhere suggests that all death, and not merely human death, was in present in the original creation, meaning not present. I actually made up that word, so if you guys are annoyed by that, I'm sorry. And that it entered into the creation by way of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, again, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Since by man came death, death therefore not before man. Pretty simple, right? Again, the cause logically precedes the effect. Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Again, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin. Man, sin, death. Obviously, that means man before death, right? It's kind of like one, two, three. That means that one comes before three. Not directly before three, obviously. You have the two in between them, but you still get the idea. Romans 6, uh, 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Um, this part we already read, but I don't want to read that one here. I want to go ahead and go to the first instances of death that we see in the scripture. Uh, Genesis 3, 21 is the first recorded instance of animal death, at least possibly. Uh, I think that it's clearly implied, but some actually have argued this is not animal death. Um, I have no quarrel with them because in the end, we're you know both agreeing that death does enter in through the fall. But nonetheless, I think Genesis 3.21 gives us the first recorded example of any death whatsoever, and specifically, it's actually animal death. So it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. The tunics of skin, therefore, would, you would think, come from a dead animal, right? Leather comes from cows. Uh, wool obviously comes from sheep, although you don't have to kill the sheep to get the wool, so it's a little bit different of an example. Uh, if you ever had, you know, snake skin boots, obviously those came from a dead snake, so on and so forth. In this case, it was probably an animal that was clean and, and good for sacrifice because it appears to be the context uh, that, that God is actually um, sacrificing these animals and performing the operations of a priest, which, by the way, is an incredibly interesting thing if you consider that John 1 says, no man has seen the uh, seen God at any time. The only begotten of the Father, he has made him known, which means anytime you see God, you're actually seeing Jesus. And here you see God for the first time, and he performs the very first ever uh, priestly action in human history, meaning Jesus Christ has been the high priest of humanity all the way since the beginning, even before the crucifixion, when he had his once and for all sacrifice on the cross. Neither here nor there, but it's just a really cool fact that I wanted to share with you guys. Genesis 4.8 is the first recorded instance of human death. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. Obviously, Cain is murdering Abel. Before the death of Abel, though, you have no death of Adam, no death of Eve, no death of any other human figure. And Cain obviously goes off and eventually goes to the land of Nod and marries his wife and has all the kids that he has, like Jubal and Jabal and Tubal Cain and all that kind of stuff. Genesis 9, 2 through 3 gives us our first recorded instance of carnivory. This is post-flood. Now, remember, according to that genealogy that I was sharing with you guys earlier, that is 1,656 years into the creation. To put that in perspective for you guys, 1,656 years ago, Islam did not yet exist. Rome had not yet fallen. And, uh, well, what's another really good example, actually, that we could use there? The Aztecs and the Mayans did not yet exist be another really good example for you. In other words, this is a really long time after creation, and it's the first recorded instance we get of carnivory. So, reading here, Genesis 9, 2 through 3, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be for uh, food for you, I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. 
Notice he says, even as the green herbs. In other words, the green herbs are food. And in the same way that those are food, I have now given you the beasts. There's actually a couple other demonstrations we have of this throughout the scripture. And we're going to go ahead and read those now because carnivory is one of the big elements that we're going to have arguments over. Because people will say, oh, you think the lion was originally a herbivore or something like that? And the answer is yes, according to scripture, it was. Returning to Genesis 1, 29 through 30, and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. What did he give us for food in Genesis 1? Every herb that yields seed, and sorry, my hair is getting in my face, I need a haircut, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Notice, not flesh, not animals of any kind. In fact, we haven't even had any indication of dairy product yet at this point, right? But notice this next portion in verse 30. And, or also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. So notice what God says here plainly, as plain as he could possibly say anything. Not only have I given you guys all of the herbs and all of the fruit from the trees, but I have also given the animals the very same. And in Genesis 9, 2, and 3, uh, Genesis 9, verses 2 and 3, we see that that changes. In the same way I have given you the plants to eat, now I also give you the flesh of the beast, but you shan't eat the blood, he goes on to say. Genesis 3, 18 through 19 reads, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Notice this. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Notice, it is not, and thou shalt eat the lamb of the flock. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat beef. That's not what it says, right? It says, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And uh, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Bread comes from wheat or barley or oat, oats or corn, all of which are plants, right? The point is, he's saying, he's obviously giving us a, a little bit of a curse here. Gardening has now gone to farming, which is much more difficult and not nearly as enjoyable. Uh, also, there's the sense of toil being added to this, whereas originally it doesn't seem to have been that way. But neither of that is here nor there. The point is to say, he's saying you are going to eat these plant products in a toilsome manner, not animal meat products. <clears throat> Next, we have Genesis 6.21, which says, Also take with you, he's talking to Noah, and also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Who's the them in this instance? Well, it's the animals. Well, we already have seen Genesis 1, 29 and 30, and going back to Genesis 3 when the curse happens, that what was given to humanity, as well as to animals, was the plants and the fruits. And now here in Genesis 6, we hear God saying the same thing you're going to eat, which Genesis 1 already told us is the plants. Genesis 3 reiterated is the plants. Genesis 9 will say, like the plants, you can now eat the, eat the meat, right? So we know in Genesis 6, he has to be referring to plants. And he also says, this is going to be for the animals. In other words, it's stored up for them also. Well, who's included in that animals? Obviously, it's going to include lions. Obviously, it's going to include bears. Obviously, it's going to include tigers. Oh, my. Obviously, it's going to include Komodo dragons and all the other kind of stuff. In fact, even the old earth creationists would have to agree that it's at least going to include some carnivores because they say it's the localized animals of that region, which would include jackals, which would include lions, which would include leopards, which would include wolves, all of whom eat meat. And here, Noah's being told quite plainly, what you store up for yourself, which scripture has already told us is, is the plants, is going to be food for them also. So we see here very plainly, carnivory does not exist prior to Noah getting off of that ark. CJ? Yeah. Did you want me screen share, brother? I just stepped away to get some water and I came back and noticed your screen wasn't sharing. My apologies. I, that's probably a little bit of my fault too because I noticed it's not sitting there at the bottom. Oh, no worries. It, it probably just happened. Um, yeah, I don't think it was off share for too long so you're good brother go ahead you know what it's uh, sorry i you know what i think it is i instead of hide for that share screen thing here i think i actually press stop sharing <laughs> um, no happens to the best of us no worries <laughs> 
appreciate you, brother. All right, so the the carnivory example very clearly destroyed, right? Um, the idea that, well, humans are only immortal because they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's just simply not there. We see quite plainly that humans, animals are all said to be plant eaters, are all said to be immortal, and death is said to enter in as, res as a result of sin. Um, what is the next objection we'll want to talk about? <clears throat> this is the tohu and vohu objection. You notice I have that. Uh, uh, lovely Joseph Smith, who ran for president in 1844. Fun fact for you. No, has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I just discovered that recently. Um, you'll, you'll see why I have him in the background here in just a moment. Jeremiah 4, 23 and 26 reads, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. And the heavens, uh, they had no light. I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled. And all the hills moved lightly and beheld, and I beheld, excuse me, and lo, there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Claim. Jeremiah uses language from Genesis 1 in reverse to communicate the destruction of northern Israel. Therefore, we can conclude Genesis 1 is, or at very least may be, doing the same. God then is not creating the world in these passages. Rather, he is simply ordering that which is disordered. And specifically what they're referring to here is this phrase right here. Uh, in, in verse 23, it was without form and void or tohu avohu in the Hebrew. And we're going to get to why that argument does not work. Objections are the scripture exhausts the language to communicate God's ex nihilo creation of all things. He creates the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1. And we're not going to read the verses here because I've already read them for you. But as you can see, they are sitting here on the screen. He creates day and night, Genesis 1, 4 through 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. He creates the sky, Genesis 1, 6 through 7. He creates the lands and seas, Genesis 1, 9 through 10. Uh, he creates the plants, Genesis 1, 11. Sun, moon, and stars, Genesis 1, 14. Animals, Genesis 1, 21 and 25. And of course, mankind, Genesis 1, 27. Put simply, it is not possible that Moses means to communicate what the old earth creationist thinks he means to communicate, which is that this is somehow the recreating of an already destroyed land. He is exhausting the language to say, I have created all of these things and specifically in this creation week. To be clear, the prophet definitely does seem to be intentionally evoking pre-creation imagery in this passage. The language he uses without form and void is identical to the language Moses uses in the first chapter of Genesis. In Hebrew, it is tohu avohu. I actually have havohu here. It's wavohu. Uh, so my apologies for the um, for the uh, typo there. Ha is the de definite article. It would be the, uh, whereas wa is saying and. But nonetheless, uh, wa or va. Anyways, same word. Wa and va are the same word. I'm just getting pedantic now. To describe earth after its initial creation. So he's using the same words, tohu avohu. Um, to describe this uh, portion here in Jeremiah 4.23, as he does in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> However, it is likely not because Jeremiah believes Moses to be describing a destroyed land, a la Israel after the Assyrian conquest. Instead, it is much more likely that Jeremiah is using a poetic exaggeration to describe the destroyed Israel as uncreated, by which I mean brought to a state of non-existence as it was before it had ever been created. Think of that parental gem that is, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. Is the mother speaking these words, claiming that she will turn you into an embryo or a fetus? Obviously not. Rather, she is invoking the imagery of non-existence to compare your pre-born state with your post-mortem state. Further still, it must be noted that the earliest extent rabbis who wrote on this phrase were ubiquitous in their belief that it spoke of creation ex nihilo. See Genesis Rabbah 114 and 224, which came out roughly 300 to 500 AD, and itself is actually referencing things from the first century AD. The pre-existent matter idea is only found amongst Jewish Gnostics, as well as later Christian Gnostics, when Christianity is established. So the usage of tohu avohu in Gen uh, Jeremiah 423 does not help the old earth creationist here, because what Jeremiah is doing is using this language in a kind of reverse order to say, you are put in a state of non-existence. He's calling upon that state of non-existence that was before the creation and comparing the state of Israel to that state in order to poetically describe the sheer magnitude of the destruction that happened to the northern kingdom of Samaria or northern kingdom of Israel, if you prefer. 
Next objection we want to get here, we're going to skip over a couple of them because some of them are not necessary for us to respond to here. Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. The claim here made by the old earth creationist is God commands mankind to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. The words for subdue and dominion, Hebrew kabash, which means subdue, and rada, which means to rule or have dominion, imply violence, harshness, and even death. What are our objections as young earth creationists? Well, first, any farmer, rancher, shepherd, or dog, or dog owner can tell you the importance of a tamed animal's submission to its owner. They must understand that you, the human being in this situation, are the dominant party in the relationship. But in no way does this demand violence to the animal, let alone you actually killing the animal. This can be clearly seen in our relation to our Savior Jesus Christ, who has dominion over us, and we are subdued to him as Lord. Excuse me. Romans 1.1 1, 1 even sees Paul call himself a slave or doulos in the Greek to Christ. Paul, a servant, doulos, slave, of Jesus Christ, called to, be a, uh, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So Paul clearly believes himself to be enslaved to Christ. That's about as violent of language as you can get, right? But is Christ a brute who beats his subjects? Does he slay us to demonstrate his dominion? Certainly not. Rather, he calls himself our friend in John 15, 15. He calls himself our shepherd in John 10, 11. He adopts us as sons, see John 1, 12, amongst others. And he even declares himself servant in Matthew 20, 28, which is an amazing thing to think about. The creator of the entire universe willingly decided that he would serve us, even though we are but dust and ashes. In him, we see just how nonviolent dominion and submission can be. So let's talk about the Hebrew and also some Greek. We've clearly established that dominion and submission do not require death or violence in any way. That said, the OEC argument is not simply that the concepts imply killing, but that the original Hebrew words imply killing in a way which perhaps the English does not. And this is definitely not the case. The Hebrew word kabash, which means to subdue, is used simply to mean subdue and does not imply death to the subdued, though it does often imply some kind of force. Take, for example, 2 Chronicles 28.10a, which reads thusly. And now ye purpose to keep under, or kabash, the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. Bondwomen, bondwomen, uh, bondmen and bondwomen are slaves, by the way. Obviously, the children of Israel, or the children of Judah in this instance, are not being killed here. A dead bondman is as much used to his master as a hole of straw. This becomes even clearer when one exam examines, excuse me, the Septuagint Greek word used in place of kabash. And I'm probably going to pronounce this one worse because I'm not actually actively learning Hebrew, but katakurio. Katakurio, or to exercise authority over, overpower, or master. The same word, katakurio, is used in the Septuagint translation of Jeremiah 3.14a, which speaks of God's divine and benign rule over Israel. Return, faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband. The word there for I am your husband is katakurio. Is the Lord saying here that he is slaying Israel? Certainly not. So why does the old, earth suge old earther suggest that Genesis 1.28 would imply we are slaying the animals? Well, to be frank, it's because he's trying to read into the text or what we call eisegesis, his already existing scientific theories. Let's also talk a little bit about dominion. The Hebrew word for dominion is radah, and it simply means to rule over or to have dominion. It can be used to imply severe rulership, see Leviticus 26 and 17, but it does not as a rule imply severity. Take, for example, 1 Kings 4.24. For he had dominion, Hebrew radah, over all the region on this side of the river, from Tipsah, Tifsa, excuse me, even to Azah, over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on all sides round about him. You notice I have emboldened and he had peace on all sides round about him. The context here is explicitly peaceful in nature, but the word used to describe the dominion is rada. So does rada imply severity or not? Well, if, uh, for, if 1 Kings 4.24 is any indication here, it clearly does not imply severity. Again, the context here is explicitly peaceful. Consider also the words used in Leviticus 25, 43. 
The verse is speaking about Hebrew slaves, and it says the following. Thou shalt not rule over him, Hebrew radah, with rigor, but shall fear the Lord thy God. Question. If radah implies severity in rulership, why does Moses command Israel not to radah harshly or severely, in another word? Why not just command them not to radah? It's like commanding someone not to attack aggressively or commanding them not to kill violently. In other words, it's completely redundant. How does one... Uh, how else does one attack if not aggressively? How else does one slay if not violently? If the command to radah without sever, or if the command to radah without severity is here, then it implies that one can radah without severity. The word in and of itself does not imply severity. Again, the Septuagint Greek is going to back us up here. In the Greek version of Genesis 128, the word used in place of radah is archomai, which means to commence or rule. Though its usage in the rest of scripture is for the first of those meaning, namely to begin or commence, a look at the dictionary definition of the word shows us its secondary meaning to rule. And this is not meant to imply severity at all, but simply dominion as in the rule of a government. Here I have the definition from the NAS New Testament Greek lexicon, Archimai, number one, to be the first to do anything or to begin. That's that commence definition. Number two, to be chief, leader, or ruler. Number three, to begin or to make a beginning. So we see here that we are stuck between two potential people to trust. On one side, we have the old earth creationist who says, these words imply violence. On the other end, we literally have the dictionary. I'm going to let you guys decide which of those you'd like to trust for yourselves. Another thing I want to point out here, the greater issue, in my opinion, than just simply the fact that they're completely misunderstanding these words, is the old earther and theistic evolutionists' understanding of dominion. The greater issue is the backwards idea about rulership. According to scripture, a wife should be subdued to her husband. See Ephesians 5.22, Colossians 3.18, and 1 Peter 3.1. Do we believe that God is commanding us to do violence unto our wives? Obviously not. A citizen should be subdued to his government. See Romans 13 or 1 Peter 4 and 15. Is God commanding the governance, governments excuse me, be tyrannical and genocidal? Obviously not. A child should be subdued to his parents. See Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, Exodus 20 and 12, Colossians 3 and 20. Is God commanding parents to be abusive? Obviously not. If you answered no to any of these inquiries, then congratulations to you, golf claps people. You have a healthy understanding of authority. The old earther's understanding is not yours. To be clear, I do not believe the old earther is necessarily an hang on, <coughs> is necessarily an abuser or a closeted tyrant, but I am saying their understanding of authority is very backwards, at least as it pertains to this issue. And for the record, we know exactly how God wants us to treat the animals. A righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Proverbs 12, 10. So clearly we see here that these Hebrew words do not actually imply violence of any kind. Again, those Hebrew words are kabash and radah. The next objection we have, bara. Claim, the Hebrew bara, to form or create, is never used to denote, to denote excuse me, creation from nothing outside of Genesis. Therefore, it is possible it does not refer to material creation at all. The objections to this are about as sarcastic as I could possibly muster up, if I'm being honest with you. This is honestly a ridiculous objection. At the risk of sounding obtuse, it should be perfectly obvious to any and everyone that the word wouldn't refer to creation ex nihilo at any other time, as the creation event is the only creation ex nihilo in the history of the universe. The English create, the Hebrew bara, the Greek poeo, and any other languages equivalent, French, Spanish, Portuguese, I don't care, could only honestly refer to this event as creation ex nihilo, because no other creation event in world history was creation ex nihilo. A vase is not created ex nihilo. A bucket is not created ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means out of nothing, by the way. Nothing after God's initial creation event has ever been created ex nihilo, and barring his divine intervention, nothing else ever will be created ex nihilo. This objection at its core is thus. The word bara only refers to creation ex nihilo when referring to creation ex nihilo. 
Therefore, we cannot know it refers to creation ex nihilo when referring to creation ex nihilo. If that sounded ridiculous to you, that's because it is. And it's no different than saying the word creator only refers to an ultimate creator when it refers to an ultimate creator. Therefore, we cannot know it refers to an ultimate creator when we're referring to an uh, ultimate creator. This is obviously absolutely absurd. Now, at this portion, we could go to check out what the early church and what the early Jews believed about creation, but it's not necessary for this. We will at least look at what the rest of the Bible has to say about creation, though. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth, Psalm 33, 6. Just go, and what do you see? I don't see anything. That's because there's nothing there. Creation ex nihilo. That's again, Psalm 33, 6. Romans 4, 17 reads, as, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Paul explicitly teaching creation ex nihilo. Hebrews 2.10, for it became him, excuse me, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Again, clear demonstration of creation out of nothing. He says, by whom are all things. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord God, thy redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Notice he says, I maketh all things. Second Peter 3, 5. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Notice it said that he creates by his word. Another way you could say this is by his speech. Colossians 1.16, for by him were all things, again, all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And then we'll end with John, John 1.3 here. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Clearly, we see the Bible teaches a creation ex nihilo. Clearly, we see that the rest of the scriptural uh, uh, writers understood Moses to be talking about baraing ex nihilo. And we obviously already went through how absurd it is to say, well, bara only refers to creation ex nihilo in this instance. So therefore, we don't know that it refers to creation ex nihilo in this instance. Completely absurd argument. It doesn't even begin to pass the sniff test. Genesis 1 1, this is another objection they'll bring up, Bereshith. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The claim here is, in the beginning, is a mistranslation of the word Bereshith, and the verse is more accurately rendered when God began to create. The objections here are thus. Firstly, I am remiss if I do not address the billion-pound elephant whale in the room. IP is changing the words of the Bible to fit his agenda. I, this is originally written for IP, so I, I'm meaning to replace that with the OEC, but you guys get the point. Uh, to fit his agenda, and in this respect, is no better than the Jehovah's Witness in the treatment of John 1.1. The JW tampers with John 1.1 to tamper with the divinity of Christ. The Old Earther does so to tamper with the doctrine of God's creation, and in this case is tampering with Genesis 1.1. As a believer in the Most High, the living God, and a brother at least in confession with all these Old Earthers, I implore them to repent of this nonsense. Revelation 22.18-19 reads, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. In other words, don't mess with it. If that's what it says, you don't get to change it into something else. And by the way, it's no coincidence that this is the very last book of the Bible. God didn't just say this is only referring to Revelation. That said, there are very strong arguments for the translation we have, and our English Bibles are near universal in this translation. For example, the word itself, Bereshith, is a form of the Hebrew word Rashith, which means beginning. In this form, the word is used in four other places, all in Jeremiah, and five if a near identical form from Hosea 9.10 is considered. The verses read thus. In the beginning, Bereshith, of the reign of Je uh, Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Jeremiah 26.1, Jeremiah 27, 1, in the beginning, Bereshith, of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came the word unto Jeremiah, unto the Lord, saying. I know you guys probably think I just repeated the same verse, but those are actually 26, 1 and 27, 1. 
28.1a, and it came to pass in the same year, in the beginning, Bereshif, of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, then Jeremiah 49.34, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning, Bereshif, in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, then we have our near identical version, which is Bereshita, Hosea 9.10a, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe, Bereshita, in the fig tree in uh, at her first time. Again, that's Hosea 9.10. Clearly, in each other usage of this word form, the context is in the beginning of a certain era. And in the near identical form of Hosea 9.10, the very first of a tree's fruits or the beginning of those fruits. The same is true of Genesis 1.1. It is the beginning of the era of creation. Another example, the book of John, chapter 1, clearly parallels the language used in Genesis 1 to explain the divinity of Christ. In the Greek, John the Apostle and prophet of our Lord writes, oop, I have a little bit of a pop-up there, sorry. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Greek used in this passage is NRK, and it means in beginning. A fact made worse for the old earth position by the fact that the Septuagint uses the exact same phrase of NRK in Genesis 1. The other point is, of course, it doesn't even matter. Let's assume the old earth translation here is correct, and that the overwhelming majority of English Bibles, as well as the ancient Jews who translated the Septuagint and John the Apostle himself, all got this wrong. But the old earthers got it right. The old earth translation of the verse would read thus. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. My question to you, my audience, is very simple. Is the above statement of absolute beginning, is the above a statement, excuse me, of absolute beginning? Of course it is. It is saying when God began to create the heavens and the earth, which means he hadn't yet created the heavens and the earth before. The OEC attacks, or the theistic evolutionist, attacks the veracity of the word and doesn't even change its ultimate meaning into what he wants. He sins, and he does not even get to reap his reward. Which, of course, just means this is an absolute, uh, uh, what would you call that? A labor and uh, futility, right? And I want to go ahead and move on to one other quick point here before we move on, which I'll have to actually stop my screen share here and then go back to my other... Uh, Add for just a second, friend. We are almost done. I appreciate you guys who have been waiting here for it. It's been an hour and 48 minutes. But, um, unfortunately, we couldn't get all this in a, in a quicker fashion. Hey, listen, man, that's what this conference is all about defending Genesis, countering compromise. It's one in the morning. We still got 60 people in the chat, brother. So uh, you're bringing the numbers, you're bringing the arguments, and I appreciate all, all your work uh, put into this, CJ. And I appreciate you guys as well. You're all being absolute troopers here, especially since for me, it's actually only about 11 o'clock. So, you know, it, while this is taxing on me, it's a lot more taxing on y'all because most of us are, of course, in Central or Eastern time. So I appreciate you guys tremendously. So what is a yom? The Hebrew word yom, like the English equivalent word day, has four literal meanings. The first meaning is a period of 24 hours as a unit of time. Reckoned from one midnight to the next, or in the case of the Hebrews, one evening to the next, one sundown to the next, right? Corresponding to a rotation of the earth on its axis. The second definition is the part of a day when it is light outside. You actually saw this, the darkness he called night, the um, uh, uh, light he called day, right? In Genesis 1. Uh, the part of a day when it is light, the time between sunrise and sunset. Then there is the part of the day spent working. You see Jesus use uh, the word this way uh, when he's talking about you know, the, the 12 hours of a day. And then there's a particular period of the past or an era, such as in the day that God created the heavens and the earth, right? He's talking about the era of creation. This is copy and pasted from a dictionary, not about yom, but about day. Now, why is this important? Well, because a lot of old earthers and theistic evolutionists will try to make the argument that the word yom can't have more than one literal meaning, and therefore, we need to understand the original context or the original Hebrew or something along those lines in order to get a proper understanding of the creation week in Genesis 1. But that, my friends, is a technique which I like to refer to as mystification. What they want to do is take it from the realm of day to the realm of yom because you don't speak Hebrew. And if you don't speak Hebrew, you have to trust them because you assume they do 
speak Hebrew or at least have some knowledge of Hebrew. But when you take down that wall of mystification and you realize that the word yom has the exact same four literal meanings as the word day, it renders the entire point null and void. You don't have to know the original Hebrew because the original Hebrew has a direct equivalent to our own language and it's day, right? In other words, if you can read this in context, and the context is implying a 24-hour period, the fact that the original word is yom doesn't change anything because it's the same word as the word day. But again, what it does is it puts you in a perspective where I got to trust those guys because I don't know Hebrew. It's a mystification technique. Frankly, I find it abusive. I don't think people are willingly abusing their audience by doing this. But I think that it is abusive because it plays on the ignorances of people and not the ignorances in the sense that people are dumb, but even the honest ignorances of people. In other words, a brilliant man who speaks English doesn't speak Hebrew more than likely, right? It's not his native tongue. And so he's playing on that honest ignorance of the brilliant man by saying, oh, well, you don't know what the definition of Yom is, and I do. So let me go ahead and tell you why you're understanding Genesis 1, 1 incorrectly or Genesis 1 incorrectly, right? It doesn't work. The word yom means day. The word day means yom. They're interchangeable. They have the exact same four definitions, no greater, no lesser. And so because of that, we can completely toss this out. There's one other portion I did want to share with you guys. I didn't actually make a slide for this, but I do have it written down here because I had forgotten to make a slide and I just think it's necessary to share this with you guys. So a lot of people will claim that the numbers that we see in uh, Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 are actually, I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share here, are actually um, symbolic numbers, right? The claim is basically the ancient Hebrews use a sexagesimal uh, numbering system, which means base 60, rather than what we use today, which is a decimal numbering system or base 10, right? And the claim is if you understand that these are meant to be base 60, then you'll understand that these are all symbolic numbers. In other words, they're all going to be divisible either by 60, by a number which itself is divisible by, or which goes into 60, excuse me, like 12 or six or three, or divisible by some combinations of 60s and sevens. There's two problems with this. The first problem, which is a complete and total killer, the Hebrews did not use a sexagesimal numbering system. It is true that the Assyrians did. It is true that the Babylonians did. It is true that the Akkadians did. The Hebrews do not, okay? There is no evidence whatsoever. I want to stress this to you guys because this is a really big deal. There is no evidence whatsoever that the Hebrews ever used a sex, a sex adjustable dumbering system of base 60. None at all. And by the way, if you start to actually look at the numbers provided in Genesis, the math simply doesn't add up, friends. So for example, Enoch, Noah, Enos, Jared, and Mahalalel all do not have ages which are ultimately divisible either by 60 or a number which goes into 60 like 3, 6, or 12, right? So for example, uh, let's go ahead and pull up uh, Noah, right? I'll go ahead and uh, actually do the math for you guys here and I'll show you it on my phone, right? Again, I'm sorry I didn't have a tab for this one, but it was something that I just realized literally today after everything was made. Um, so I apologize for that. So Noah lives to be 950. We divide that by the lowest denominator they, uh, the, the lowest denominator that they actually have in the sexagesimal decimal system, which would be three. So let me show you guys this. They have zero, right? So let's do 950, Noah's age, divided by three, which by the way, if it's, if it's uh, divisible by 60, 12, or six, it will be divisible by three equals, you notice how that's not a round number? That's because 950 does not actually fit the pattern that they're telling us about. But maybe, maybe it's a system where it's a 60 plus sevens, right? Well, 60 does go into 900, right? We all know that. It's going to go into 915 times. And then 50, oh, wait a minute. That's not actually divisible by seven, nor is it divisible by three, six, 12, or 60. So in other words, we see here in Noah's age that there actually is no basis for saying this is a symbolic number that's meant to somehow be based in this base 60 system. It's not divisible by 60, nor is it divisible by 6, nor is it divisible by 12, nor is it divisible by 3, nor can you make the case that it's divisible by one of those plus a system of sevens. Just simply not there. 
What's the more likely understanding? That these ages are literal. And of course, none of that is even necessarily relevant because you can toss all of this in the trash because of the fact that they did not use a sexagesimal decimal system or a sexagesimal uh, numbering system, right? And this is not the only one, by the way. You can go ahead and look at the ages of Enoch, 365, not divisible by seven, not divisible by um, uh, 60 or anything like that, right? Uh, you can look at the ages of Enos, of Jared, 962 years, right? Of Mahalalel, none of them are divisible by 60. So there you have it. There's just simply no reason to believe that these numbers are symbolic. With that, friends, I have taken up an hour and 56 minutes of your time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pause here. I hope this was a great presentation for you guys. I hope it was edifying to you. Uh, I want to just say really briefly, Proverbs 27 says, iron sharpens iron, so another man sharpens, or so one man sharpens uh, his friends. So if you guys thought that this wasn't very good, let me know. Give me the criticisms. The very same chapter in verse 2 says, let not your own uh, let not your own praises come from your own lips. So if you guys thought it was good, and if it did edify you, then again, please let me know yourselves. And I appreciate your guys' time. Shalom. Awesome, CJ. I can tell you as host, that was very good. Again, lots of information. Clearly a lot of work put into that. So I do appreciate it. I told the audience this conference would be comprehensive. And as they can see, it's only been two days. And we are... Uh, we're at almost 10 hours worth of nonstop content on the origins issue. So CJ, fantastic job. Um, let me put you on the hot seat for a little bit with a few questions and then uh, we'll wind it down, brother, because you've already given me so much of your time. And I got to say, time has flown by two hours. You know, typically you think of a two hour movie, you're, you're sitting back with your wife and it's movie night, right? Two hour movie. And when it comes to these lectures or debates, it's like two hours just flies by. Um, and it's edifying. It's edifying, just like, um, you know, CQ here says. Very edifying. So that's the goal. Um, okay. Well, you know, you mentioned <clears throat> William Lane Craig, right, CJ? Popular yeah. apologist. Uh, he is very good at, at specific topics. Uh, but he's put out a, a new book recently. The Historical Adam, I believe, is, is the title. And uh, he's done videos and discussions um, on this issue as well. And his argument and his claim, CJ, is that when you do a sensitive genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11, okay, he claims we are not dealing with a straightforward uh, historical narrative but with a, he calls it a mytho history. So my question to you, uh, brother, is there any legitimacy or validity to uh, William Lane Craig's argument here that Genesis 1 to 11 is just a mytho history? So I'm going to throw you for a loop here because the answer is yes, but it's a deceptive yes. So the word myth, which comes from the original Greek mythos, uh, originally just means a story. And what it's used to describe in the modern day is like the origins of certain things. Like, for example, uh, in Genesis 11, you see the tables of nations, right? Or Genesis 10, excuse me, the tables of nations. So there you have the origins of all of these different nations, right? Um, so a myth is meant to describe basically the origins of a certain event that is, uh, you know, ubiquitous to human history or at least ubiquitous to the individual culture, right? And so in a very real sense, Yes, Genesis is what we would call mytho history, right? But C.S. Lewis has a famous quote where he says it's true myth. In other words, yes, the genre is mythos in the sense that it is talking about our origins, but it's not that it's incorrect, right? And one of the things that even the uh, old earth creationist here would have to concede is that we know for a fact some of these do happen elsewhere in scripture. For example, the book of Exodus. Exodus is the national myth, quote unquote, of the Hebrew people, but very little old earth creationists or theistic evolutionists would argue that Moses didn't actually exist or that the Exodus didn't actually happen. In other words, they're going to use the word myth in Genesis 1 to 11 to say, actually, you can't take it literally, but then they're going to take another clear example of the genre myth or history in Exodus and say, no, you actually can take that one to be literally correct. So it is a misuse of the word myth, but there is a slight kernel of truth about, uh, about it. The other thing that's very important here is that there is no indication whatsoever 
that there is a change in genre from 11 to 12. In other words, in the in the real sense, not the non-deceptive sense, in the real sense of mytho history, all of Genesis and indeed the entire Torah is mytho history. How do we know this? Well, we have the origins of the Abrahamic covenant later on in Genesis. We have the reasons why Israel ends up in Egypt later on in Genesis. We have the origins of the Edomite, the Ishmaelite, the Ammonite, and the Moabite later on in Genesis. Well, what's the definition we had of myth, right? It's how certain things came to be. Well, we just had how certain nations came to be in a whole bunch of different instances. And yet we're going to argue that those are actually clearly historical, but these other ones are mytho-history. The actual answer is it's all mytho-history. Mytho-history does not mean incorrect or non-factual or non-literal. It simply means it's a way to explain the origins of mankind or the origins of certain elements of our existence. And in that sense, the entire Torah, and really you could even go all the way down to the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, all these things are mytho-history if you're using the word accurately. Great response, uh, CJ. I, I always appreciate and love how thorough you are. Um, you know, it's as simple as just telling people to, um, you know, pick up the Bible, start in Genesis, and and just read it and mm -hmm. understand and believe it for what it's saying. It's clearly written as a historical narrative. And, uh, you know, if you want to get technical, one of the indications of this is what, uh, CJ, you know, the frequent use of the Vav consecutive. Mm -hmm. When we read in Genesis, you know, and this happened and that happened and this happened, um, you know, clearly indicating a sequence of events that are taking place or that have taken place. And Genesis 1 after verse 2, I believe it is, CJ, is a Vav consecutive. And as you know, brother, um, followed by a verb in, in the uh, Hebrew word order, that indicates a sequence of events. And therefore, this must be read as a historical narrative. But again, this goes back to my point. Just pick up the Bible without any preconceived ideas, any you know basic assumptions that evolution's true, the earth is old. And you're going to see that uh, Genesis is clearly talking about events that have literally have taken place. And you pointed out, you're so thorough in your presentation, CJ, that, you know, uh, symbolic interpretations don't work. And I also like how you point out that we don't believe in some kind of wooden uh, literalism. No, mm -hmm. we understand similes, imagery. We understand, um, you know, these concepts in terms of, of taking something literal where we're taking it naturally. Right. And then we can go uh, right to the genealogies, which take us back to Adam, the first Adam, from Adam to Jesus, Adam being the first Adam, Jesus being the last Adam. And this is why it's so important, because not believing in a literal Adam is an attack basically on the cross. I mean, the question is, why did Jesus Christ come to, uh, you know, die for the world, die for the sins of the world? So, you know, the. The apostles, Jesus himself took the Genesis account as literal historical narrative. And this is exactly uh, what we see in terms of the frequent use of the Vav consecutive brother. So uh, you make some fantastic points. And um, I really liked your final portion there as you uh, refuted a lot of the common talking points, you know, that we've seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of brings me to my next question. But in case you wanted to add anything to that, brother, go ahead and then I'll, I'll get to the next question here. Absolutely. Just just a very brief thing, because um, you, you bring up the Vav consecutive here, right? Um, so the, the literal definition of a chronicle is a factual written account of important or historical events in the order of their occurrence, right? Now, if that doesn't describe Genesis to a T, when you have so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so, and then this happened and that happened, I don't know what else does. And one of the things you could always ask somebody who wants to take this in an illiteral fashion, first off, bring up the C.S. Lewis true myth point where it's like, okay, I can accept it's mytho history. That doesn't mean it's not literally true and chronologically true. But even besides that, read this text and show me from the text where it goes from poetical to chronological. And you can't do that, right? Because the text is clearly all together as one. Um Without, obviously, because some of them will assume, well, it's going to be right after Genesis 11, of course. But it's like, okay, but show me in the text of Genesis 11 where it leaves one genre and moves on to another. You're simply right. not able to do so. 
that right there is is a fantastic point. And that is a challenge that I want these guys that are in the William Lane Craig or Joshua Swami Das camp to actually address. And that's a major problem that has been pointed out, uh, CJ, with uh, William Lane Craig's latest book. And so I'm just, I'm not impressed with his scriptural based arguments. Okay. I think they've been demolished as you've demonstrated here and his science based arguments, which I'm going to touch on in my presentation tomorrow. I'm not impressed with either. It actually shows, unfortunately, that he's, he's out of date on a lot of the technical literature because his uh, main argument for why he believes that humans and chimpanzees are related is uh, what's called pseudogenes. And I'm going to dismantle that tomorrow. Uh, it's just kind of a shame that he's he's using junk DNA related arguments. But uh, before I get to the question I was going to ask CJ, this one came to mind uh, based on what we're talking about. So where we read that, you know, from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female, right? Um, I've heard them say specifically, I believe, William Lake Craig, that, well, for the young earth creationists, this is difficult because they want to take Genesis as literal history, but to take this literally, we know man was created on day six and not day one, and therefore it can't really be the beginning. I don't know if you've heard that one, but if so, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I did actually touch on this a little bit, but I'll, I'm going to go ahead and touch on it a little bit further because it was just a passing reference earlier. Um, so hypothetically speaking, if I were to say the beginning of last year, we celebrated Epiphany. An epiphany takes place on January the 6th. Well, if somebody wanted to be ridiculously wooden, they could say, well, no, that wasn't January 1st. It was January 6th, right? But anybody who's being serious with the language would understand, yeah, epiphany is definitely at the beginning of the year. January 6th is definitely at the beginning of the year. Uh, and it's not in the middle or towards the end of the year, right? So when we, uh, when we use this, uh, example of the you know the sixth day being the beginning it's the, it's the same exact thing in fact it's even the same number right the six days is clearly the beginning portion of everything now let's say we took the theistic evolution perspective and human beings are created something like i i can't remember what the exact numbers are but let's just go with a million years ago and the earth is 4.5 billion years old or the universe is 4.5 billion years old uh, actually is what they would say right well just statistically speaking a million, right, is one one thousandth of a billion. So it's going to be one four hundred and uh, forty five hundredth, right, of the entire portion here. Who amongst us would say Christmas at the beginning of the year is a proper understanding of language? Obviously nobody, because that's completely absurd. But that's precisely how the old earther or the theistic evolutionist would have to understand this text. If what if when he says in the beginning, he's really referring to literal billions of years, hundreds of millions of years into human, into uh, uh, mammals exist, or excuse me, animals, my goodness, into animals existence and billions of years into creation's existence. That is just simply not a problem <laughs> to the word beginning. But if we're saying the sixth day, right. January 6th is the beginning of the year. Nobody would have issue with us using that kind of language. Um, so I, I think that's a very bad argument. And it also, it, it exposes, I think, a fundamental misrepresentation of our position. Literalism is not wooden literalism. Right. You know, a, a good example of this is when we understand the Psalms, right? Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, none of us think that the stars are going, hey, God's awesome, right? Um, that's obviously not what's going on. Rather, it's saying the heavens are showing for us the handiwork of God and just how amazing of a creator he actually is, right? And we understand that it's that way, number one, because the heavens don't talk and declare things, but also number two, it's a psalm, right? Psalms are poetry. Um, but the old earther, the theistic evolutionist, is under the impression that we're taking everything 100% dogmatically literal in a way that's just grossly unnatural. And that's not what literalism means. Literalism, another way you could put it, is prima facie. What right. does the text read like at face value? Sometimes that's metaphor, but sometimes it's literal. And when it's literal, you got to take it literally. Right, right. That's such a great point. Okay. So obviously when, uh, when we read the very words of Jesus from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, in Genesis five two, male and female created he, them and blessed them and, and called their name Adam in the day they were created. 
And um, also in Genesis 3.20, where it says, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And of course, Adam uh, being the first man that we read about in, in 1 Corinthians. So when Jesus says from the beginning of the creation, he's obviously referring back to the creation week. Okay, so day six is still uh, in that first week of creation, which can still rightly be called the uh, beginning of creation. Like, for example, when I get up in the morning, uh, and you might be the same way, you know, there, there's several things you're going to do. You brush your teeth, have breakfast, go to the washroom, whatever, take a shower. So if I say, you know, at the beginning of my day, I showered, even though maybe that wasn't the first thing I did, maybe I got up, you know, had a drink of water, uh, ate breakfast, brushed my teeth, and then showered. Well, you know what? Showering still encompasses the, the beginning of my day, but you mm -hmm. nailed it when you said, and this is the problem I have with a lot of these theistic evolutionists, is they want to subscribe to this pseudoscience, right, of evolution. But then they don't want to understand what they actually believe in. And the origin of humans, according to the evolutionary model, was about 200,000 years ago in Africa, okay, with their version of mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. Okay, wait a minute, 200,000 years <laughs> in um, a history that comprises 4.6 billion years, and you're telling me that that's the beginning? <laughs> right. billions of years into, you know, the creation of the earth alone, right? According to their uh, deep time uh, model here, old earth creation. And then you have to about 14 billion years for the origin of the universe. So yeah, th there's, there's in no, in no universe, can you consider that the beginning of anything? But according to the way we understand it, as you nailed it, yeah, day six is the beginning and it's Jesus Focusing back to, he's using divorce and marriage, obviously, as uh, you know, a lesson here, and he's using the beginning of creation to demonstrate it, where uh, Adam and Eve were created. That's still the beginning. So, uh, yeah, that, that's some great points, CJ. Yeah, and uh, just to to kind of reiterate, you know, it it is roughly like when you consider how, and I even gave him a million, right? But when you consider, I mean, two hundred thousand is just massively small fraction of the time they're saying. It's <laughs> like saying. Well, it was the beginning of last year, and really, you're talking about Christmas. Like, Christmas. Well, I mean, not <laughs> the end really. of the year, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> the beginning of the year. You know, I got X, Y, Z for Christmas. It's like, sir, that's the end of the year. <laughs> and uh, you know, sorry, uninspiring compromiser, not to be mean, but two hundred thousand years <laughs> into the history of an Earth that you believe is four billion years. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to break it to you, but that's not the beginning. Um, that's good. Okay. So next question, brother, and I know you've addressed this, but I want you to speak on it um, because uh, you've provided such a fantastic answer to it. So as we know, our best buddy, inspiring philosophy in his video titled uh, top 10 biblical problems for young earth creationism, he made several arguments, but one of them had to do with, and again, you've dealt with this thoroughly and I love it. And I just wanted you to speak on it for a little bit. Um, Genesis 17, 7, in the story of Abraham and Sarah. So IP's argument basically goes like this, CJ. You know, why is Abraham laughing at prospect of having a child at 100, right? Um, Tara allegedly fathered Abraham at 130. And but basically, how, how would you respond to that, CJ? Absolutely. Um, so I, I'll actually go ahead and, and share a little bit here because I do have a, um, a tab on the IP sure, response yeah. that directly addresses this. So this is one of actually one of the IP's top 10 reasons the Bible doesn't teach a literal young earth. Uh, it's actually the first one he lists, his number 10, right? And so Genesis 17, 17 says, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man in 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And so the claim here is, you know, he, he seems aghast at the idea that a 100-year-old man will bear a son why would he be such if his ancestors were having children well into their hundreds? In fact, Tara, his own father, has a child at 130, that child presumably being him. Uh, although, obviously, it says that Tara originally has his child, I believe, at uh, 70. So whoever ends up coming first, you know, obviously one of Abram's two brothers, but I digress. So the answer to this is a uh, couple fold. So first off, age is shown to dramatically and progressively fall after the flood. You can see the chart here, 930, 912, 905, 910. These are all incredibly long, but then the flood happens 
And it goes 950, 600, 438, 433, 434, 239, then 230, then 148. You see it's just consistently going down. By the time we get to like David, for example, I believe David dies at the age of uh, 70, which is analogous really to the, how long we live today. The average human lifespan today is about 80 years. Uh, and then, of, of course, you know, assuming that you're healthy and all that kind of stuff. I think the oldest person on record, uh, meaning in our modern records, is 123. Uh, you know, not even close, not even sniffing 930, right? So we see here that age in the scripture is dramatically shown to decrease and progressively so, uh, decrease, excuse me. Uh, and it should, should really therefore be expected that certain medical issues are going to be happening earlier on, you know, cancers, uh, joint pains, infertility, erectile dysfunction, all this other kind of stuff. And infertility and erectile dysfunction, of course, would directly, uh, uh, bear on, the ability of a man to have a child, right? This is actually explicitly acknowledged in the text of Genesis, uh, specifically Genesis 47 and 9, which says, Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of, notice this, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the day of their pilgrimage. So Jacob, all the way back in the pre-Mosaic era, is actually aware of the fact that humans are starting to live long, are, uh, shorter and shorter lives, and that as a result, certain medical complications are happening faster and faster, right? He himself goes on to be, I, I can't remember exactly, I think it's 137, maybe it's 147 actually when he passes, but I digress. The other problem here is that Abraham's objection, it's actually a misreading of the text to say Abraham's objection is primarily based in his age. The objection is actually, is actually primarily based in Sarah's age, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. So notice I, I have highlighted here, will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90, uh, the second portion of this verse, right? There's a couple reasons we know this is the main concern. One is simply scientific. This is a quote from a Dr. Larry Lipschultz, uh, who's a professor of urology at Baylor College of Medicine, which is one of the top colleges in the country. The menopausal transition most often begins between ages 45 and 55. On the flip side, it's been shown sperm counts do decline with age, but men never stop producing sperm. What that means is, if uh, let's just take the, the average age of 80. If a woman experiences, we'll even give her the high end. If a woman experiences menopause at the age of 55, she will live the next 25 years of her life not being able to produce children. A man at the age of 80, hypothetically speaking, provided the mechanics are all working, like he doesn't have ED or anything like that, can actually still have a child. And there's even uh, modern world examples of this. George Lucas, for example, had his um, only child by natural birth, natural because it is, you know, there was an artificial insemination that took place because his wife wasn't able to bear, but it's his uh, seed that created this child in his seventies, right? That's not possible for a woman. Uh, so we, that's one of the reasons we can tell here that Sarah is, is the primary uh, point that he's trying to reference here. But further, Sarah has thus far bore no children and she's 90 years old. Abraham, on the other hand, did bear a child, Ishmael, at the age of 87 when he went into under Hagar. And that's the whole point of Genesis 16 is she's realizing, hey, look, I'm past the age of menopause. I've never had any children even before I was past the age of menopause, which indicates that I was infertile. So go into Hagar. Hagar will produce a, ch a child. And then by her, I can say to be I can you know, say myself, say to myself that I am a sort of surrogate mother in a way. Right. And by the way, Abraham is, ends up having children after Isaac as well which is even, of course, older than 100. Now, how do we know? Like, How do we know that I'm not just reading this into the text? Because it does say he laughed and said to himself, will the son be born to a man 100 years old? So how do we know that I'm not reading this into the text? Well, because scripture has a recurring theme of Sarah's barrenness. Genesis 11.30, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. Genesis 16.1a, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Genesis 18, 12, therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure my Lord being old also? Genesis 21, six through seven. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, uh, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Notice who would have said to Abraham that Sarah, not Abraham, would nurse children. And obviously men don't nurse, but you get the point. It's her age that is the focus here. For I have borne him a son in his old age. 
And then lastly, we have Hebrews 11, 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. This is in, an important portion for a couple of reasons. Number one, Paul is a prophet. Um, we don't typically refer to the apostles as prophets, but if you just look at the, de the dictionary definition of prophet, those who are speaking with God, Paul and John the apostle also clearly are. Um, and Paul here says that she was past the age. Meaning not only was she barren for her 90 years of life, but she has actually gone through the menopausal stage of her life. This is an incredible miracle that she's actually able to bear children. And in fact, it even goes into Isaac's name. Isaac's name, Yitzhak in the Hebrews, means um, in the Hebrew, excuse me, means he laughs. Why? Because Sarah laughed. God has made me to laugh and all who hear will laugh with me. So the primary point here, both from a scientific perspective and a biblical perspective, is very plainly that Sarah herself is barren, not that Abraham is unable to conceive. Abraham's going to have children even after Isaac is born uh, with his wife Keturah, who he marries after Sarah passes away. Um, so it's just a complete misreading of the text. And also it doesn't take into account what we know scientifically about things like menopause and ED and stuff like that. That's another fantastic detailed response that brings to mind um, what you were saying <clears throat> where, uh, about how uh, men never really stop uh, producing sperm because you're absolutely right. Men's reproductive cells, they uh, they start dividing at puberty and then they don't stop dividing in, until they die, which means older men can actually have children later in life. And this uh, brings me to something that I've written about and, and talked about and debated thoroughly. And I think you and I, CJ, we're going to have a talk on this uh, later this month uh, on Neanderthals mm -hmm. and why they were specifically so different to us. Um, now, by so different, it's interesting because they were still 99.7% uh, similar to us. We're all 99.999% similar. But why this relates to what you're talking about is if Neanderthals were founded by an early biblical patriarch in his old age, 300, 400, 500 years old, then guess what? A ton of mutations would have been passed on to the uh, ancestors of Neanderthals and they would have automatically right off the bat started off different, right? And we understand that, that our biblical patriarchs lived a lot longer, okay? I'm talking about even before Abraham. Right. And so they're passing on more mutations, which is resulting in uh, more diversity and more distinctiveness. If you were to compare, let's say, a Neanderthal to us today. And, um, you know, that's just a little rabbit trail I wanted to go on based on what you were saying. But uh, that's a really good point, uh, CJ, and a really good answer. And for my next question, I'm going to put this up here because this is the verse that is in question. And um, this has to do with, it's a debate I highly recommend. I'm sure you've seen it. The most recent debate on, I believe, revealed apologetics between Hugh Ross and Jason Lyle. And Jason Lyle did a fantastic job on both the scriptural end and the scientific end. I think uh, Dr. Lyle really challenged uh, Hugh Ross on uh, distant starlight, even challenged him to a written debate on it, which Hugh Ross has not taken up as of yet. Um, but anyways, Hugh Ross claimed, uh, CJ, in this debate with Jason Lyle, that the word day used in Genesis 2-4 can mean long periods of time to support his old earth creation position. In your opinion, is this a good argument? And then how would you uh, specifically respond to that? Absolutely. So um, so it's I don't think it's a good argument. And my reasons are uh, a couple points, but it's not going to be as long as the last one. So the first is, this does go back to what we were talking about with yom. Uh, the word yom in the Hebrew and the word day in the English have the same literal meanings, right? The exact same four. Uh, there's the period of daylight, the working period of the day, which we would call the, the AMs usually, although technically that's not 100% accurate for most of us, right? Most of us aren't working before 12 p.m. the whole time, right? But nonetheless, uh, the working part of the day, the daylight hours, the 24-hour period of the day, and then also a long period of time, right? So for example, when somebody says back in my day, they're not talking about last Friday or any other sort of specific day, right? They're talking about back when they were younger, in, in an era where they were younger, right? So when we understand that, it immediately takes away any of this idea, well, you know that word can have multiple meanings because we already know that word can have multiple meanings. And the context is what's going to dictate for us 
which meaning we're using, right? So when I say back in my day, the context is that you guys know what that is. You know, that's an idiom. You know, basically I'm referring to a time when I was younger, right? Uh, and, and that context dictates for you the fact that that word day is being used in an illiteral fashion or is being used to describe an era or an age or something like that, right? So using that, we see the context in Genesis 1 is uh, nu numbered sequential days, right? Uh, Yom Echad and, and, and so on and so forth going on into the rest of these, right? So that only ever occurs, whether in scripture or outside of scripture, when we are talking about uh, not only literal events that are coming one after the other, but specifically literal days that are coming one after the other. And that's especially true when you couple in the evening and morning cycles, which are spoken of, right? There was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day, so on and so forth. That context is what's telling you this is what uh, why we're going to understand Yom to mean a 24-hour period rather than the work day or an age of some kind or something along those lines, right? So with that understanding of context and with understanding the word Yom and day as essentially identical, uh, we can just read the text, whether English or Hebrew, as it is, and we can see derived from the text um, th that there is, or derived from the context of the text, that there is a usage here that is very plainly that of literal days, right? Now, the flip side of this is incredibly important, right? Because the old earth of the theistic evolutionist is relying on that mystification technique of you not understanding the word yom, right? You're an English speaker. If I'm just talking general you, the, the audience, right? You're an English speaker. So you're probably not aware that the word yom has the same four translations as the word day. And so when they say, well, you realize it could mean this, your mind immediately goes to places that are not the same as when you're having day. It's this reliance on the person who's speaking, right? But when you understand that these words are directly equivalent, then you start to understand, just like the word day, the context is going to tell me how I'm to understand this word. And if you read the context there, I think it's very plain that the uh, usage of the words uh, word yom here is uh, very plainly referencing a sequential uh, series of a sequential series. That's a redundancy, uh, but but a sequential numbered uh, you know set of days that actually are are dictating um, literal day. And there's actually one other point I almost forgot which I did talk about here a little bit, <clears throat> um, which is that elsewhere in scripture in Exodus, we see that God is said to rest on the Sabbath day, right? He sanctified the seventh day because in it, what's the it in this context, the Sabbath day, the seventh day, he rested from all his work, which he had made. So the reason why you're observing as a Jew, that seventh day Sabbath is because that is the day in the week in which God rested. The only way to understand that contextually is to say that God is speaking, is using the word yom here to describe a literal 24 hour period, because that's what the Sabbath actually is. And he even refers to it with the nonspecific word it, right? Because in it, the Lord made, or the Lord rested from the work which he had made, right? That it is uh, obviously referencing what we've already been talking about, namely this seventh day, this Sabbath day. So uh, when you couple those two things together, I think that it is uh, quite plain that the usage of the word yom here is very plainly um, a, a sequential understanding of literal days, one after the other. Amen. Amen. Just a fantastic response. Love it. Um, you know, to any old earth creationists out there or theistic evolutionists, if you want to debate this man right here, he's unstoppable. <laughs> Let me know and uh, consider that a debate challenge. Uh, sorry, I'm going to keep you busy, CJ, with, with upcoming debates. So uh, you're well-rounded. Debates on all topics. But yeah, we got to get you some more debates on this topic. And uh, so we need, we need. And here's an issue. Okay, I'm talking to you, theistic evolutionists and old earth creationists. We've been doing a 2020, uh, 2022 evolution debate challenge series. And that encompasses uh, the flood and age of the earth as well which is why we have our team geologist, Professor David McQueen, in on this. He's done several debates too, but not once. <laughs> okay, maybe once. I can't think of it right now. So maybe one, maybe I'm wrong there. But 99.9% .9 of the people who are taking up this challenge are either just atheists or agnostics. So theistic evolutionists, old earth creationists, you know, it's time to step up. We got uh, brilliant men like CJ here that, that are ready and willing to debate 
uh, in, in a professional setting and uh, using sophisticated arguments. So, you know, consider that a challenge. I want to see them step up more, uh, especially because we've done 40 just this year in, in our evolution debate challenge series. Um, and so I'd like to see some more theistic evolution step up. <clears throat> um, okay. So CJ, this has been comprehensive. Here's the last question as we hit the two and a half hour mark. This was awesome, brother. I look forward to re-listening to this. Uh, <clears throat> um, so I'm going to get this one in here. Here's another one you've already addressed thoroughly, comprehensively, but the uninspiring compromiser, inspiring philosophy. He, he still uses this one. As a matter of fact, he just debated Dr. Marcus Ross and, um, I want to be objective. Okay, as somebody who's hosted and moderated over 210 debates, I'm usually a pretty good judge of debates. And um, I don't think IP did very good in this debate. I think Do Dr. Marcus Ross, um, he did a fantastic job. Answered all of IP's objections. And I feel like IP didn't really address the challenges towards him. But as you know, CJ, uh, IP still uses this argument. He used it here in this debate. He's used it in his video. Uh, titled Top 10 Biblical Problems for Young Earth Creationism. And so his argument, his claim is that there was death before the fall because, and here it is, Genesis 1.28, God says to subdue the earth and to also have dominion over all animals. And again, brother, I apologize. I know you've dealt with this thoroughly, but uh, your answer is so, so good that I, I want you to speak on it a little bit. Uh, before we wrap it up. So he'll say, to give a little more context, he'll say uh, in Hebrew, these words are extremely harsh and are used to indicate war, conquest, and enslavement. Okay. The claim is that God is telling humans, apparently, according to IP's argument here, to make a warlike conquest on the earth in order to subdue it and thus contradicting a very good creation that we hold to. Uh, under the young earth creation model uh, that has no sin and, and no death. So what are your thoughts on this argument, uh, CJ? And what do you believe is the most effective way of, of addressing it? Absolutely. Well, so the effect is going to depend on the person, certainly. Uh, one of the best ways I've found with people who are not necessarily interested in the intellectual nitty gritty is to compare other places where God says someone is subdued to so you guys see this? I'm married, right? Biblically, my wife is to be subdued to me, right? She is uh, to uh, submit to me, to accept me as leader. I'm the patriarch of the family, according to the scriptures, right? Now, that does not mean that I am in some way having a violent conquest against her. In fact, the scripture says the exact opposite, right? That I'm to love her as, as Christ has loved the church, and so we see there an example of how this idea of dominion or subduing is not in any way implying a level of violence. In fact, what, it, what is implied on the other end is a very uh, dangerous view of authority, right? And you can use other examples as well. Children are to be subdued to their husbands, uh, or not to their husbands, to their fathers, excuse me. Um, my apologies for that. Uh, to their parents is, is the point, right? Uh, citizens are obviously supposed to be subdued to their governments, according to Romans 13 and elsewhere, right? So that's one way you could certainly try to address this just by pointing out, hey, the, the biblical idea of authority is certainly not the violence that you are trying to reference, right? It's certainly not the enslavement that you, Mr. OEC, Mr. Um, theistic evolutionists are actually trying to reference here. And another really clear example, example of that, of course, is the fact that we are enslaved to Christ, Right again, call, uh, Paul calls himself a doulos of Christ, a slave of Christ. In fact, one of the prophets is Obadiah, from the word Obed that means slave, or Ebed, uh, meaning slave. Right? He's a slave of Yehovah. Um, but of course, Obadiah doesn't have violence being done to him. Paul doesn't have violence being done to him. Right? So we can see there that the the idea that dominion or subduing or anything like that is meant to be violent is just clearly wrong, and it's in fact even a very dangerous understanding of the word. Uh, are of the concepts there of dominion and of uh, uh, of uh, subduing. But there are some other things there that you can point out as well. Um, in my opinion, one of the best ones there, if you want to start to get to the real nitty gritty of the Hebrew, because this is another mystification technique, right? Where they're trying to say 
you know, dominion and the Hebrew word are not, which is kabosh, right? They're not or actually going to be Rada for dominion. Uh, they're not actually directly equivalent, but Rada is actually implying violence, right? But Leviticus says not to rada with severity. Well, what the heck does that even mean if radaing is by definition done with done with severity? Hey, don't kill in a way which takes life. As opposed to what other way, Dr. Professor Patrick? Um, you know what I mean? Like that's that's the only way you do kill is by taking life. The only way you attack somebody is by being aggressive. If their understanding of radah is true, the only way you rada is with rigor. But the scripture says, don't rada with rigor, which implies you can rada without rigor um, and just immediately eliminates, I think, the, the possibility that this word has to imply violence. Another great usage there is, is 1 Kings 4.24, where the context is explicitly peaceful. Uh, it says that that Solomon radad over all of these kingdoms this side of the river, right? And that he did so peaceably. He had peace on all sides of his kingdom. So explicitly in the context here, we have this understanding that this is all peaceful, uh, that this is a situation in which Solomon's not going to war. His name literally means peace, Shlomo, right? Or Solomon in the English. Uh, and that's the only reason he's even allowed to build the temple. Because if you guys recall, David wanted to build the temple. God tells him no, because you're a man of war. Which means if Solomon was a man of war, he wouldn't have been able to build the temple. He was able to build the temple because he's not a man of war. He's a man of peace, right? He's a man of prosperity. So we see here that he's redying over all these kingdoms and he's doing so in an explicitly peaceful manner. And the last thing I like to reference here, you know, a lot of people have this idea that being, uh, you know, animal lovers or whatever is a uh, modern concept of modern Westerners. And that's just simply not the case. Uh, we actually have verses in the scripture which sometimes indicate and sometimes directly state uh, the way that God wants us to be treating the different animals, right? So for example, Proverbs 12, 10 says, a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So according to, by the way, who wrote Proverbs 12, 10? It just so happens to be Solomon, right? So here we are back to the same guy. And what does he say? He says, no, a righteous person, a person who's good is kind to their beast. He regards the life of his beast. Your dog, right? You're kind to your dog because you're reflecting the spirit of God that has been placed on you as an image bearer or potentially even more dramatically as a regenerate Christian, right? So the righteous person is caring for their beast. The, the, the unrighteous, on the other hand, their kindnesses are wicked, right? Uh, we have other examples that are a little bit less explicit. Like, for example, if you look at all the usages of or, uh, all of the examples of hunters in the Bible, by the way, I want everybody to understand me here quickly. I am not saying that hunting is sinful, but the Bible only ever describes negative people as being hunters. Esau is a hunter. Ishmael is a hunter. Nimrod is a hunter, etc. On the flip side, Moses is a shepherd. David is a shepherd. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, right? What's the point? The point is you have a demonstration here of those who actually go out of their way to hunt, not that they're actually evil, but that the act itself is implying a level of conquest, a level of, of non-perfectness, you could say, right? And those who are actually on God's side, Moses, David, etc., these guys are shepherds. These guys actually watch over the flock. They care for the flock. They go out to find the one when the 99 are all together, right? What you have here is, is an implicit version of what Proverbs 12.10 is saying expl explicitly. Righteous men regard the life of their beasts. This, and this is clear all throughout the scripture. Another clear example of this that makes it implicit is God talks about how he numbers the feathers on a sparrow's head, right? In other words, God loves a sparrow more than the hippiest hippie that you've ever met in your entire life, right? Um, in fact, he created them. So of course he did, right? The point here is just to say, um, the Bible is a very is a very pro-animal rights book, if you choose to call them that. It's weird to say animals' rights because technically that's not a thing. But um, the, you know, the idea is, is quite plain. God is all about loving the animals, treating them well, uh, giving them good provisions, regarding their life, all this other kind of stuff. So it makes absolutely no sense that when the world was very good, that he would say, yeah, you need to go and, and you know stab these guys with pokey sticks and stuff like that. It's just, it doesn't work, especially, and this is the last part I'll add, especially when you add on the fact that they're not eating these animals. Genesis 1, 29 and 30 is very clear 
that what was given to man for food was the herbs and the fruit. Genesis 6 says this is the same thing that he's going to have. 621 says this is the same thing that we're going to have for the animals also. And Genesis 9, 2 through 3 finally gives people the ability, the right, if you will, to go and have themselves a burger, which is why it's not sinful for you to do so today. Meaning that if Adam was going out slaying animals, that he's doing so for no reason. He's just killing them. Which I don't think anybody, if anybody went to their next door neighbor and they saw their next door neighbor just putting like a, a nail gun to a dog's head and blowing his brains out, we'd all be like, dude, that is like seriously screwed up. What's your problem? Right. But that's what IP and all these other guys would like us to believe Adam was doing. And not only is it, are we not eating them, we're not even sacrificing them. How do we know that? Because sin hasn't entered in yet. So what are you sacrificing them for? The first sacrifices we're going to have explicitly is Abel. And implicitly is Genesis 3.21 when God covers the uh, the fallen couple with, with skins, right? So literally what IP and the old earth creationist is suggesting for us is that in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 pre-fall, God wants us to go out and slay the animals, not for sacrifice, not for food, but literally just because. I don't know anybody who would see somebody doing that and not think to themselves, you're kind of messed up, brother. Yeah. Oh man, that was good. Um, you know, that, that, that could be a, a clip worthy uh, moment right there because um, that was just an absolute dismantling of, of that talking point. And I think it's safe to say uh, going on three hours that compromise has been countered and it's been countered by uh, none other than CJ Cox from the synagogue YouTube channel. So Brother, fantastic job and also great job on these uh, on these questions. Um, very comprehensive. I think we left uh, no stone unturned. And uh, to the audience, thank you so much for, uh, you know, engaging in this important topic. Um, share this around. The truth is important and uh, defending the truth of biblical creation is what we do on this channel is, of course, incredibly important. So, um Real quick, I, I want to give you the floor, CJ. If there's anything, any final things you want to add, then I'm going to uh, just spend a, a couple minutes going over some reminders in terms of the conference as well. But before I do that, I want to give you the opportunity, brother. Again, thank you so much for this. This was awesome. Doesn't feel like three hours. It might for you because you've been talking nonstop. <laughs> but um, yeah, I want to give you the floor. Final points, final words, final thoughts. Go ahead, brother. No, and it has been an absolute breeze. And I and I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Um, I want people to understand as we close out here um, that not only are these arguments bad, not only are they a misunderstanding of the text, they are fundamentally compromising at levels that are bigger than just simply how old the earth is. Yeah. Right. People always want to say, look, these aren't dividing issues. And there is a sense in which that's true. An old earth creationist can be my brother in Christ. We can shake each other's hands in, in you know, the eschaton. But if you start following the following these rabbit trails down to their destination, it is fundamental denial of the authority of Scripture, of the efficacy of Scripture, of the clarity of Scripture, and most importantly, importantly, of the necessity of the gospel itself. And like I said, it's one of those things where it's kind of like heresy light, right? You haven't right. made all the jumps, so I, I'm not going to say you're not a brother. But if you did make all the jumps, you wouldn't be a brother. And, and this is a very important issue, I think, for us to make sure we're not compromising on. Because it's not as small as people say. There is a reason. There's a, a brilliant man by the name of Dr. Dino you guys might have heard of. Um, and he says, you know, there's a reason why Revelation and Genesis are the most attacked books of scripture. It's because those tell us God created it all and how he did it. And he's going to end it all at some point and how he'll do it. And it is very important that we don't compromise on those things. If we want to make sure that not just us, but our posterity are remembering the efficacy of scripture and putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Beautiful final words. You put it perfectly. It is an authority issue. And again, to deny Adam, Eve, and a literal Genesis is to literally deny the meaning of the cross. That's why uh, CJ, that's why I am so passionate about this topic, okay, because this is important. It, it, it goes directly back to the gospel message. And like you said, CJ, it's a ripple effect. 
you know, you, you start off as an old earth creationist and then eventually you, you, you begin a slippery slope down to where you're now denying a literal Adam and Eve. And you get to the point where you're like some of these theistic evolutionists that just remove any supernatural aspects from the Bible. And you're sitting there defending abiogenesis and the Big Bang. It's like, where do you fit God? You say you're a Christian, but where are you fitting God? Because you're sitting here debating abiogenesis, like even that's a possibility. So it's a slippery slope, brother. And that really is um, the perfect uh, place to kind of wrap up uh, your presentation and discussion here. Uh, to the audience, I do want to remind people that uh, this book here that I've been working on nonstop, it is... Um, close to 300 pages. It's got some novel arguments. I've had hours and hours worth of discussions with some very, uh, you know, well-informed young earth creationists on um, all of your major challenges to our model. And the answers are provided here. Uh, hopefully uh, this will be good to go in the next couple days. So I will keep you uh, posted. Um, as to when it is officially good to go, there will be a full color edition and a, um, and a black and white edition as well. There's a reason intelligent design isn't taught in our learning institutions. The legal staff of Freedom From Religion Foundation, a church state watchdog group, has had remarkable success in convincing many institutions, such as school boards and town councils, that they are breaking constitutional law when they sponsor sectarian activities. That includes intelligent design. When the authorities can't be convinced, Freedom From Religion Foundation sues, and it wins more often than not. Hey everyone, this is Matt Mann from Team Standing for Truth. I would like to welcome you to the channel and want to remind everyone to browse through all of the material that we have, going back for years. Are you looking for something in particular and can't seem to find it? Check the playlist section first. Lots of similar themed content is there. Still can't find it? Click on the description box in this video and go to the official Standing for Truth website. There you can find a search box and type in anything you want and not only find the videos regarding the topic, but our other content as well. We not only have books and videos and articles, but even radio podcasts. We hope you enjoy our material and want everyone to be able to access our content easily. And if you have any recommendations, make sure to leave your comments below. And until next time, Matt Man is out.
All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. CJ, thanks for sticking around, brother. And I think we're going to we're gonna wrap it up here. Uh, God bless everybody. We'll see you tomorrow at 5 o'clock with John Mackay and Joseph Hubbard. God bless. Thank you.